four minute live stream. Um, crazy, I know, but um, look, the reason why I want to do it for so long um, and 654 minutes is because last year um, in the provisional suicide figures, 654 Kiwis took their life. So, you know, it's easy to um, give money to things. It's easy to, um, you know, show support online and stuff. But what I really want to um, see people do is um, look at the concept of giving time. So actually, you know, there's a significant portion of today that that's about. We're giving 11 hours because we're taking the time to listen to people, to listen to different people's perspectives and to see how mental health affects them, you know? So throughout the day, we've got lots of guests that will pop in for 30 minutes at a time. Um, we've got a wide range of people um, with really interesting backgrounds. So we have, um, we have small business owners. We've got um, people who run their own community initiatives. We have people with lived experience. We have people from with lived experience on the spectrum from the, um, we've got representatives from the LBGTQIA plus community. We've got lots of people coming in today. Um, I'm really looking forward to just having some really good chats. Um, I know 11 hours with me for those that will be kind of checking in for a significant part of the day is a long time. It's a real long time. But the thing is, is that we've got the schedule in the event. So if you go to the event page, you can actually see who is talking when. And with that, you can just check in when you need to. But given that I'm here all day, you won't actually hear a lot from me. Because when we've got our guests, it will be about listening to them. They're the ones with the interesting perspective that I want people to hear. So when they're in, they're going to be doing a lot of talking. I'm just going to be throwing them some questions. If you have any questions, pop them in the um, chat and I will get on to answering those as we go. So... Um, so kia ora, everybody. Um, Nathan, Josiah, kia ora, how you doing? Um, so first of all, I'm actually just going to run through a list of people that we have. My cat Craig is coming to say hello. Hey Craig, come on, give me that. Um, cool, so you got me for the first half an hour. Then at 9.30 we have uh, Matt Brown. So Matt's actually a really, really well-known figure here in Canterbury. He is the, um, him and his wife Sarah own My Father's Barber. Um, and they also run She Is Not Your Rehab. So they've done a lot of work with um, men's groups and addressing the trauma that they've faced in their life. So I'm not going to talk too much about each person because I want them to be able to tell their own stories. But they're really about like digging into those really tough conversations and, and leaning in to support people. So really looking forward to having him involved. Then at 10 o'clock, we have uh, Rafaela Bolano. So she's going to chat to us about um, how, you know, how you deal with me your mental health and well-being as a small business owner, especially nowadays in the gig economy. Um, Raf is one of the busiest women I know. She's always doing lots of different things. Um, so she, her perspective on balancing those will be really interesting. At 10.30, we have Amanda. She's a longtime friend of mine. So She's going to discuss um, her story of lived experience and misdiagnosis. And now she's actually studying to um, be a counsellor. So actually going through that whole process will be really interesting to hear from her perspective. Then we've got Callan, who's also going to um, talk about some study that he did regarding mental health education in schools and kind of building resilience. So when we're doing that, we'll probably also touch on mana ake as well. Then we're going to have a bit of a half an hour break. We're just going to reflect on the conversations we've had so far. Um, then at 12, I'm not sure if our guest is going to pop in or not. So I'm not going to announce them. If not, you're just stuck with me for another half an hour. Um, after that, at 12.30, we have a group from the University of Canterbury uh, called Lads Without Labels. And they... Um, obviously, they work with young men at the university, but also they actually... Um, do a lot of mental health work just with university students in general. So it'll be really interesting to hear the perspective of students and how they work with things. Cool. Then we're going to have another little break. Then after that, um, Tatiana is going to drop through to talk about um, mental health for women in Aotearoa. 
Then after that, we have James Brody. So James is going to drop in. Um, James has autism, and James has uh, recently been through some mental health struggles. So um, James is going to stop by to talk about how he's killed a dip, how he manages that, and what it's like for somebody on the spectrum to also be dealing with mental health issues. Um, Craig's probably going to drop by a lot today. She's a bit like that. Then at 2.30, we have Becca Crow. Uh, so Becca works with um, elderly inpatient mental health. So she's going to be able to speak to the perspective of elderly people, especially talking about isolation and the feeling of being a bit of a burden. After Becca, we have Jono, who's actually a, the Opportunities Party board member. Um, so Jono is a GP. So it's going to be good to kind of get his perspective on... Back up a little, pal. Um, be good to get his perspective on how how the system works, you know. So especially if you present to the doctors how you get involved in um, specialist mental health services. Kia ora, Sarah. Yeah, Craig loves any interview. Anytime we um, pop up alive, Craig tries to get involved. Don't you? You might get to meet the other one, Bernie, later. Cool. After that, we're going to take another half an hour break for reflection. Kia ora, Daniel. Um, so we're going to take a half hour break. That'll be a real good chance to dig in with some questions as we go. Then after that, we have Andrew, who's uh, also another candidate for the Opportunities Party. So he's going to drop by and talk about um, his lived experience. Then after that, we've got a really, really important half an hour session. Um, and it's the parents' perspective. So a good friend of mine, Ben, um, a few years ago, his um, ex-partner and the mother of his child um, died from suicide. And... He's going to have a bit of a, a touching chat with us about, you know, how how you work around um, talking about this with your children and and how you can do that. So that'll be a really um a really tough half an hour, I'd say, for Ben. But I'm really thankful to have him on board, and I think a lot of people would really benefit from that conversation. Morning, Andrew. Kia ora, buddy. Um, after that, we have Jennifer Shields. So she is the 2IC at Qtopia, which is a uh, youth support group here in Canterbury for um, young people from the LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, my friend Alice is the executive director there. They're an um, amazing organization doing a lot supporting young people um, through, you know, sometimes due to external factors of other people's attitudes can be a real challenging time for them. Um, so I'm really, really stoked to have Jennifer on board. Um, she'll bring some really insightful information to the table, I think. Um, cool. Next up at 5.30 would be Jake Keanu Skinner. I've known Jake for well over a decade. He is an amazing, amazing guy. He's currently been working um, by running some men's groups, and he also does a lot of um, like sound meditation. So it's just, come on, Craig, you're getting a bit too involved there, pal. Um so it'll be really awesome to hear his perspective. Kia ora, Mar Marianne. <laughs> yeah, Craig loves the smooches. Um, she's a bit of a, a sucker. She'll probably be around most of the day. Come on, pal. Chill out. Um, kia ora, Naomi. Nice to see you. Um, cool. After Jake, it's 6 p.m. We have Jeff Simmons, who is the leader of the Opportunities Party. I'm sure most of you know who Jeff is. Um, he's an amazing guy. Look at all this cat fluff on me. He's an amazing guy, and um, he also runs men's groups, or works in men's groups. So he's going to actually talk about his own personal experience and um, how he keeps that at bay and how he works with that. So, all right, Craig, I thought you pop over here for a little bit. Um, so um, Jeff will be along at 6 o'clock. I'm really, there's cat here everywhere. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, after that, we've got Stu. So Stu's one of my best friends, and Stu is um, the co-founder with myself with Project 71. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, so he'll be talking about kind of listening and providing space for people to have conversations. Then our last guest speaker at 7 o'clock is my man Joel, who is our candidate in Southland. Um, Joel lost his um, mum to suicide, so he's going to drop by to have a bit of a chat about that. I'm really looking forward to um, hearing from Joel. Um, and it'll be um, 
a very touching way to kind of end of the end the day and then after that you just have 25 minutes 24 minutes left with me um, to kind of wrap up the day so thanks for coming in for all the people who have just joined this is 654 minute live stream for mental health this week is mental health awareness week today is the last day of that uh, we wanted to take time to honor the 654 people who died from suicide last year um, by doing a live stream one minute for every person and I know it's not much um, but it's given it's mental health awareness week it's really a good chance for us to kind of dig in for some good conversations and to hear the perspective of others I think a lot of the time with mental health just being able to listen to people makes all the difference as a friend as a peer as someone supporting someone who doesn't feel well we, we often need to get out of the mindset of trying to fix them, thinking that we have solutions for their problems. A lot of the time, people already have the solution. They already know what they need to do. They know sometimes the supports they have around them, but they just need someone to go, I hear you and I'm here for you. Like I'm listening to you. I, I want to hear what's going on. And to just be a good shoulder to cry on. So even if you're afraid that you don't know how to have a lot of these tough conversations with people actually just being able to listen to them is more powerful than anything so i'm going to give you a bit back a bit of a background on myself um for those that don't know me craig <laughs> she's going to be like this all day um so kia ora. my name is ben atkinson i am the opportunities party candidate for banks peninsula um, I come from a background mostly actually as a chef and a musician. I grew up in Nelson, New Zealand. I moved to Christchurch after seventh form. I had a bit of a rough seventh form. Um, I got kicked out of home. I spent some time on the street, um, specifically Miyazu Gardens. Um, it was it was a pretty crazy time. My seventh form year, I went from being like a straight A student doing really, really well to um, just escaping with a 3C pass. Um, also started using a lot of drugs and alcohol at that point. Um, after that, I moved to Christchurch. Um, I went to jazz school initially, and I did a bit of stuff at university, mostly philosophy, a little bit of uh, Japanese and Maori and music recording um, and political science. And then I, I basically worked all my 20s as a chef, and I played in metal bands for fun. Uh, when I was 29, I kind of, I hit the brick wall. I, I didn't know what my life was about, really. I was just getting smashed all the time, working really long hours, having crappy relationships. Um, everything was just not good for me. Um, and, you know, I had, I had, um, I had a pretty pretty rough time i essentially uh went up to uh to the the gun emplacements up behind sumner and the banks peninsula there and i i sat on a cliff face and i intended to take my life and i sat there for probably a good couple of hours and i i was trying to you know i was kicking the kicking the cliff under me with the heels of my boots trying to uh, make the cliff collapse under me because I was too scared to jump. Um, I was eventually collected by the police and taken to crisis. Um, that's where my life changed. I wasn't involved in in mental health services for long. I didn't um, I didn't take antidepressants because they didn't work for me. I know they're a very important process for many people, but they didn't work for me. Um, I had a little bit of counseling for a bit, um, but the thing that changed my life was actually just finding my purpose. So I ended up starting an organization called Fill Their Lunchbox, where we fed kids who went to school without lunch. The main thing was about providing kids an equal opportunity to learn. Um, so over the next few years, we actually donated 63,000 lunches to 12 schools in Canterbury. Um, and then I got involved with a few other things, working as a youth uh, capability coach for inspiring stories. I um, did a petition with the police because they were letting people get bullied on their mugshot photos and stuff. 
And then I also ran with my friend uh, Stuart Project 71. So Project 71 was a sit-in event where him and myself sat in the square for 71 hours to talk to men about their mental health. Now that was because the year prior, 71% of suicides were men. And so we thought, let's provide a space to listen to men. And I won't talk much about this because we'll talk about this with Stu later tonight, but that was really kind of what also inspired this event. The whole concept that you can be present and listen. So today's really about listening to a lots of different people's um, perspectives. Um, kia ora Joel. Um, what changed up in my seventh form year for me to take that turn? Um, well, actually, the, the primary reason was that I was kicked out of home, I think. Um, my family decided they were going to move to Christchurch, and we were in Nelson at this point. And I think, um, you know, the conversation essentially went like this. I got home, my mom said, hey, look, we're moving to Christchurch. She said, oh, that's cool. When? And she said, oh, in the next couple months. And I kind of went, oh, well, you know, that's cool, but I'm in my seventh form year at high school. I don't want to change schools. I want to go to university next year, so I want to get good grades. Um, she kicked off at me, um, and I replied with a very <laughs> solemn and, I guess, a bit pragmatic um, F up. And she, and I walked into my bedroom, and she stormed in and said, you know, what did you say to me? And I just repeated that I said F up, and um, I got kicked out of home. Um, so I grabbed my grandma school uniform, grabbed a couple of books and I took off. So I spent, um, quite a while just, uh, sleeping down in the public toilets at Miyazu Gardens. I would make like a little bed out of my, um, school books. And I also spent some time sleeping in the railway reserve. And then I started couch surfing between a bunch of my friends' houses for a while. Um, you know, the, my parents took off down to Christchurch. I ended up living with a woman um, up the top of the railway reserve. Her name was Julie. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, trigger warnings, everyone, um, regarding abuse. So when I was staying there, I was paying to live there, but not much because obviously I was still a student and I was working for $4.90 an hour. Um, and... Uh, she was just kind of making me do jobs around the house all the time. And one night she came home from the pub drunk and she tried to kiss me. Um, and I wasn't having a bar of that. So I kind of went to my room and she tried to pester me there. And so I had to get out of there. Um, I ended up getting taken in by a family that I'm still really close with today. Uh, the Steins, they are amazing people. Um, they took a renegade kid like me in and um, set me on the path to become a better person. Um, so I think that's probably the main reason things fell apart is that I was just a kid trying to balance some pretty intense situations. Um, and, you know, in those intense situations, you pretty much just get drunk or high all the time. I smoked a lot of cannabis. Um, I didn't do any other drugs at that point. Um, and yeah, and I drank a lot. And I think that really contributed to me just not really putting my all in at school. So fair question. Um, today is all about being honest. So um, don't be afraid to ask things like that. And I can, um, I can speak truth to it. Um, so the statistics for suicides in New Zealand last year were released on the 21st of August. They were um, just the provisional statistics. So they actually, um, they actually include um, suicides that may actually, that are only suspected as well. So they may not be actual suicides. We don't know yet. Um, kia ora, Joel. Thanks, mate. Um, so these these figures is the, actually the lowest figures we've had in three years. So that's that's really awesome. Um, however, you know, no numbers good. No numbers good. And 654 is when I hear 654, to me that is 654 families that lost someone and groups of friends. And and I've been in one of those groups of friends too many times and I know how difficult that is for all those people involved. So um, 654 of those are lost in three years is still um, absolutely mad. Um, so. Um, some, some really concerning things 
is that uh, our young, young kids, so between the ages of 15 and 24 um, equates to actually, well, let me add that up, almost 37% um, of suicides, which is uh, massive. That's, that's terrifying. So we're going to be addressing that a little bit later, talking about um, mental health for university students, but also um, also talking about mental health resilience in school and stuff. My cat is being a pest. <laughs> um, also, something we see um, year in and year out, which is quite um, sad, is an overrepresentation for um, our Māori and Pacifica communities smaller communities in terms of overall percentage of our population but um, they are overrepresented in in our figures so um, really sad and I'm going to actually try to have a bit of a chat with one of our guests about that a little a little bit later on cool so I hope everybody's had a good weekend and you're not too tired considering um, considering daylight savings when I planned this I totally forgot about that um, I got to sleep maybe around 12.30, so essentially 1.30. Woke up at 7, so had a little bit of a sleep. Not too bad. Um, still feeling good and powered by coffee to get through the day. Cool, so at any time, feel free to, to pop questions in. Today's about um, learning. You know, we've got lots, lots of good stuff on today. I'll also just change our background. So we're going to be popping through to things like this as well today. So you can see um, the numbers here for services that you might want to reach out to. So a lot of these um, are just general helplines. Really good to um, touch base with them when you need to. So a couple here that I might just point out which are a little bit different. Um, obviously, um, Anxiety New Zealand Trust is more specifically to do with anxiety. Um, and then Outline is for the LGBTQIA plus community, um, specifically for youths as well. So a lot of these you can call. A lot of them you can send a text. Um, there's heaps of different options there, which is really, really cool. So throughout the day, I'll just keep bouncing back to this screen. Um, you'll hear me clicking away on my computer. Um, sorry about that, but just want everybody to be able to, to access these. Cool, cool. So our first guest this morning is uh, Matt Brown from My Father's Barber. He'll probably be here within 10 minutes. Um, I'm sure for anybody in Christchurch, you're aware of who he is. Um, if not, after this morning, I'm sure you want to get in touch with him because he's a, a really, really inspiring person. Actually, um, I um, got to witness that after the terrorist attacks here in Christchurch. He and his his wife they got to they got together and were key cogs in the machine at the crisis center which was getting run out of Hagley school so they were um they were you know taking all these like family members and um people who had been at the mosque helping them out helping them with travel helping them with accommodation helping them with food doing all this stuff at this crisis center trying to help people and it was um incredibly awesome to witness i just went in to help cook for a few days um but actually just seeing how much they gave from first thing in the morning to the end of the night to help other people um was incredible just such amazing people and um really blessed to i mean i barely know them, but i'm really blessed to to be in that position where um where i get to know him and ask him along to come and share his his background and his story with people because he is a fascinating person um cool so i'm just checking this making sure i'm not missing any of your questions kia ora thanks Stu. yeah it's um i like to be honest and i like to be able to um to talk about my story where needed um it's not something that i just come out with out of the blue um it is hard for people to um, break down those barriers and open up to people um and i know that uh as a 
what did what did the newspaper say an aspiring politician um but there was actually studies that show that uh people don't trust men in positions of power um if they have had or experienced mental illness before so by don't trust i mean they don't think that we're up to the job pretty much um so all uh, all reasoning kind of says that i shouldn't be sitting here having vulnerable conversations um with people especially about my own background but i think that's rubbish and i think in my position um you know i'm not super well known or anything but in any position similar to mine you should if you feel comfortable enough you should always be open and honest about it because because it's good to to actually address these things and i hate bottling things up you know um if i if something upsets me i usually sit with it for 24 hours just to make sure i'm not going to overreact or be overly emotional and and make sure that i'm seeing things from other people's perspectives and i always sit with things for a bit and then i kind of be open about it so if someone come up to me and said hey you know tell me a story i'm probably not gonna say it but i've had time to kind of sit and and get ready for what i'm going to talk about today so yeah <laughs> you want to come and say hello again okay so yeah i'll keep dropping between between these um slides today so you can see <laughs> so you can see those numbers when you need them um this is my cat craig david she's uh, one of three um craig helped me with my mental health once she's a fantastic little cat um because she's very smoochy and makes you never feel lonely sorry i'm just trying to keep the questions open kia ora josiah Thanks, mate. It, it's it's hard for people to open up, and I don't expect everybody to. Um, but I'd hope that we can learn that as people, as members of families and friends and communities, that we can learn to make it comfortable for people to speak up, and not just men, but anybody, you know, um, women and those who don't identify with either. You know, we just need to make sure that everybody feels welcome to <sighs> cat here. <laughs> to speak their truth you know um oh, kia ora. yeah i will pop a little text banner up that's a good idea craig <laughs> oh go see go see how burning should never stop if i don't put it down cool so i'm just going to check in on the zoom so all of our guests today are coming in via zoom so they'll be in for about half an hour. Really looking forward to it. <laughs> hey, Joel. Um, Joel says, that's messed up, particularly because most of us probably have in some form or another. Um, I must say, I'm really enjoying this gritty grassroots lived experience top candidates that I'm meeting. The cat's cool too. <laughs> yeah, she's all right. Um, yeah, well, I think a lot of us candidates are like this and... It's good to be able to bring real world perspective and lived experience to to things, you know. So in my job, I actually work in mental health and addiction support for homeless people at the moment. Um, and it's really handy to have lived experience, especially, um, sorry, i got a cat hair on my face. Especially having, you know, spent time living rough means that I, I can to some degree understand where some of them are coming from and some of them will say to me you have no idea what it's like you don't know what it's like to have nowhere to go to be you know homeless on the street um and i do know but i don't say that because it's not a um it's not a you know what measuring contest it's it's about being there to support people but just knowing myself that um i do know some of those feelings and experiences is really helpful I find that helps as well when I'm meeting with constituents and stuff because it means that I can get out at the coalface and work with people and have a just a more realistic understanding, I think. Cool, so our first guest has arrived, Mr. Matt Brown. We're gonna we're gonna let him in. Let's see how this goes. Kia ora, Matt, how you doing? 
Uh, uh, just uh, one second. You are not getting saved into the stream, so I'm just gonna bump you up there. That should hopefully work. Uh, try again. No. One second. How's your morning been? Good thing, sir. Just cleaning the house. Nice, nice. Relaxed Sunday. Totally suffer. Oh, pretty yeah. good. Uh, you know, didn't have the biggest sleep, but that's all right. Now, I'm just wondering why um, this is not... Sorry, one second, everybody. Had to happen with the first one. All good. Now, uh, I think it's because it's not recognizing that. Uh, okay, well, if I can't get this to work, we might just have the audio. So we can see if Josiah's given us some words of advice. Okay. Um, this is my first time using this whole uh, thing, so. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, but... <laughs> um. Yeah, all right. Uh, you might just do right call on the source, change the window, set the crime, then change back to the zone. Um, I can't find that. Okay, so I'll just check if anyone can hear you. And if everyone can hear you, then we can just do that. So, can everybody hear Matt? If you can just uh, give me a comment, then we can go from there. Yoda, it is daylight saving, so we've gained an hour, right? <laughs> right. So the time should be what, 10 30? Yeah, I think so. Yep, everyone can hear you. Cool. So we will just go with the audio for now. So, kia ora, brother, thanks for coming in. Um, I was just talking about yeah. you just a second ago. Um, Matt's an amazing guy, um, him and his whole family. So, uh, we're just going to hear from Matt about his background, first of all, and then um, I'm probably going to just ask some questions about um, how he works um, within within the fields that he does. So kia ora, Matt. Take it away if you want to just talk about talk about your background. And what, what, you do. what part of my background? Um, <laughs> well, I grew up, uh, I was born in uh, South Auckland, but raised here in Christchurch, raised here in Ōtutahi. Um, I come from a family of nine siblings, five brothers and four girls. Um, we, grew up, we grew up in a very domestic violent family, Fano. So we witnessed our father um, abuse our mother, abuse us um, as kids, and we thought that was normal. Pretty much, pretty much our story growing up was, um, was the movie Once We Worries. Um, but for us, when that movie came out, I was 10 years old, I'm now 34. When that movie came out, we thought it was a comedy, you know, comparing it to our shit, our life, um, our story. And, yeah, we would compare Ben Hickey's hidings to our mothers. And we would, you know, comment that our mother's black eyes were bigger, um, that our father was more crazier than Jake the Mus. Um, so that was the upbringing, upbringing that I grew up in. Um and yeah, it was it was hard to the to differentiate what was love and what was normal because at home was abuse and then at school we were being educated that what we were going through or experiencing was domestic violence. Um, but yeah, it felt so normal. Um, and so now, you know, being happily married to my best friend, um, we were we were just friends for four years before uh, I committed to her. Um, and it came about because, you know, she started dating and I, a bit of jealousy happened there. And nah. and so I asked her, yeah, to, if we wanted to take this further. Um, 
she blessed me with three beautiful tamariki, three beautiful kids, um, which is the heart of what we do. Um, and I suppose, yeah, raising, having children, we wanted to raise them up in a, in an environment where there is no, no violence, violent free communities. And with our, my backstory, witnessing my mother experience heavy domestic violence, um, you know, severe trauma, um, that's where she's not your rehab boys group. Um, just want to see my mother time and time again, you know, try and rescue our father from dumb decisions that he made or, you know, dumb, um, dumb choices, uh, sleeping in different women's refuge homes in Christchurch, um, and just, yeah, experiencing my mother just with this deep sadness in her eyes that she could never, she just continued to choose to be with us, to be with my father. Um, and so, yeah, she is on your rehab. Rehab was born. Um, I got into barbering because, you know, I've always loved how rappers and all that looked on um, the music videos. You know, being a, a Samoan boy growing up in New Zealand, born in New Zealand and raised here, uh, most of the people that looked like us on TV were rugby players. Um, unfortunately for me, I wasn't the best at uh, physical contact sport, <laughs> but I loved hip hop. Um, hip hop kind of raised me. And I always loved how hip hop artists, rappers look. The, the hair was always on point, um, their flat tops, their fades. And so I got into barbering um, through my wife as well. Um, and so we opened up a business together called My Father's Barbers. And yeah, I suppose I fell in love, I fell, in, I fell more in love with barbering because the stories that men would share with me in the chair. And you know, all different walks of life, um, you know, different cultures, different backgrounds. And I soon learned that most of us are more similar, um, we're more alike than we are, than we aren't. And um, I also learned that pain and shame doesn't discriminate. Um, domestic violence doesn't discriminate. Doesn't matter what, where you sit in the, you know, the social status, um, everyone has experienced shame and pain. And so my journey with mental health, um, I suppose holding space for men in the barber chair mm -hmm. became the main focus of why, why I can't hear really. And so, yeah, barbering has just become a vehicle for us to have these conversations with men who struggle, because a lot of men in society, I believe, are struggling silently. Um, you know, if you talk about your feelings, if you talk about your emotions, your kind of lay what is lesser of a man. Um, if you're vulnerable, like vulnerability just was never, uh, was always looked at, it, always looked at as weakness in our society, you know? To be a man, you don't cry. To be a man in New Zealand, you play rugby. And that's just a whole bunch of bullshit, really. Mm -hmm. um, it's not true, you know? All boys hurt, all boys, you know, have tears. And so, yeah, giving men permission to feel all those feelings and putting language around it, you know, we're not just angry. Um, some of us are sad, some of us are still grieving um, our childhood. And so, yeah, that's in a nutshell, my backstory. Thanks, man. That's incredible. Um, I've seen a lot come from you and um, Sarah around what happens at the barbershop. So this, this, you talked about like creating a space for men to, to talk and and whatnot do you do you find there's a reason like do you find that you've managed to create a culture with your employees and that's part of that process too with them like how do you just create such a good space where people feel that they can they can take part in and talk so freely um i suppose to, to create the safe space it, it starts with me first um so i kind of show people practice vulnerability and practice, you know, courage with my, with my employees and, and tell my story and be brave, be brave to sit in the discomfort of all, you know, the emotions of all the feelings of um, my experience as a kid, you know, witnessing, you know, for me, it was the helplessness that I felt, you know, I couldn't protect my mother from my father. I couldn't, you know, no matter what we said, you know, mum, leave dad. You know, she still chose to be with him because you know, her excuse was she wanted us kids to have a father. 
Mm. And I was like, man, I'd rather have my mum with no black eyes than have a father around. Mm. Um, so sharing my story with my staff is, is number one. Um, and then also that then gives them permission to be vulnerable and share their story um, with no judgment. Mm. And so every Wednesday in our barbershop, we hold space for each other. Um, because for me, it's like, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer, you know, who are we to do this work with men who sit in our chairs if we don't do this work with each other first? Mm. And so every Wednesday we come together, have a coffee, have a cup of tea uh, for an hour in the morning before we start and we just share, share whatever's happening in the, in the week or whatever anyone's going through. Um, you know, every Wednesday someone's crying. <laughs> Um, and just allowing space, you know, it's all right to cry, it's all right to feel those feelings, you know. I've had some staff who have been suicidal, who have opened up about it. Um, barbers who have, you know, hidden that they've been sexually abused as kids and they have never shared it. And so, yeah, we open that space and then, and I suppose now we are running uh, men group therapy sessions at our barber shop. Uh, we've opened it up to the community. So pretty much doing what we do on our Wednesdays, with, uh, with my staff, but now we've opened it up for me outside of the barbershop just to come in and sit. And that's been like amazing. We sit there, we, uh, we've partnered up with Aviva, and your families who work in the domestic ones have a holistic approach to domestic ones. Um, they've gifted us two therapists, them and Aviva and Maya, which is a um, counseling therapy organization. So they've gifted us two therapists who sit in now group therapy session and men from all walks of life, you know, I've had, you know, you get guys in suits who come in, um, guys in gang pitches, you know, your normal bloke who come in off the streets and they just sit there. The barbershop was always packed and men just share whatever they, they, they need to share. Mm. And, um, and that space is created, you know, it's safe. And they ask whatever questions and the therapist just answer. And it's it's awesome. And we leave our therapist numbers on the whiteboard and, and guys can contact them and, and do one-on-one sessions because it's hard. Like I've heard that there's like a three-month waiting list to see a therapist. Mm. Um, and there's not many male therapists in Christchurch. Um, there's a massive demand out there. And so our therapists, they, they give their time for free to the men that come to these groups. That's awesome. That's incredible. Do you, do you find that... um? <laughs> Sorry, Rex, she's my daughter. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you find that when um when you've created the space for people that they then in turn go out and look to create space in their own Fano units? Yeah, most definitely. Because yeah. for us, you know, like you, you help kill the man, you help the men, you know, you help kill the man, you heal the Fano, you heal the family. And for a lot of kids, they're for me growing up, you know, walking in and out of Christchurch Men's Prison to see my father, to visit my dad. You know, I still love my dad, even though, you know, he was our childhood monster, but he was still my Superman. Mm. Um, and I still wish that someone would would help him, something, you know, I, I still wish that when he came out of prison, he was a better man, um, but there was no help for him back then, you know? Um, if anything, people always you know, judge him, like, oh, he's a criminal, he's a woman basher. Um, but no one ever held space for him to heal properly. Mm. Um, and so that's why, and that's, so that's the heart of why I will sit with the you know, people. I've often, I often get judged for, you know, people think I condone um, gang members or people who committed crime. Um, not at all. For me, it's sitting with, with the man, not the criminal, but sitting with the little boy who, who was never healed from his childhood trauma. Mm. Um, and hopefully, he doesn't pass that on to his children because our children are watching. You know, it doesn't matter what you say, our children are still looking up to these men as their supermen. Mm. Um, and so that's why my heart's always here, help heal our men. Our men need healing. Yeah, that's a really good point, man. Like, um, I often say to people, like, uh, because some mental illness can be um, hereditary and genetic, but for the most part, it's actually down to the social um, determinants in your life. So yeah, if you don't actually address those traumas, then nothing changes. Like it's about actually going back to those core issues. Um, 
have you got any tips and tricks that you've developed to kind of do that or is it just being like showing your vulnerability and being a leader um man i'm still i'm still healing from my trauma um for me i think most of us you know at the moment i'm working, I'm working with my my staff through through triggers and you know anything could trigger us um for me sometimes i mean i'm gonna this is me being vulnerable here you know sometimes i get triggered by if i'm in a room or i come across someone wearing a suit um and so for me when you get triggered triggered is um, always an invitation for you to to sit with that trigger and heal mm. and do the work to heal um so when i say triggers and suits you know guys in suits um as a kid growing up in a in, in a brown household i always seen people who wore suits as powerful or better than me or you know um the feeling i always felt inadequate um we weren't good enough and so to to wear a suit you're successful um and so if i'm around someone or a client who sits in my chair who's wearing a suit you know the little boy in me feels like oh you know what can i say to him that it's gonna you know how are we going to connect? Mm. Um, but I've obviously learned to, to get past that and heal from that. Um, this is an example. So, yeah, I, I feel like when you get triggered, it could be your partner saying something to you. A lot of guys, they then get triggered on, you know, she's controlling, but she's probably just, you know, trying to hit you up on your procrastination. Maybe you, you told her that you'll do the dishes, you didn't do the dishes, or you told her you're going to hang up the photo frames and you didn't hang them up when you said that you're going to hang them up. Um, a lot of men can feel triggered, um, but then that comes from a place where they probably it reminds them of their mother, you know, nagging to their father, mm. um, and, and we start comparing, projecting our childhood trauma onto our partner. Mm. So I think when you get triggered, sit with it, sit with the emotion, and just tell yourself it's an invitation for you to to heal. So why are you triggered? You know, that person hasn't done anything to you. Um, are you comparing your partner to your mother or to another woman, to your past partners? It's, it's often about those tough um, discussions and sometimes that discussions with yourself, like you're talking about. Um, sometimes people say to me, I really want to um, discuss how this person is feeling because I'm concerned about them, but it's a bit awkward um, and I don't know what to say what would be a good piece of advice in terms of just overcoming that internal feeling like that, whether it's about addressing how you think someone's feeling or if someone just opens up to you and, and you don't really know how to, um, how to deal with that situation. Do you have any like little hot tips? Um, yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, I, I, I've even struggled with this, you know, having difficult conversations, um, but you get better, when you do it once, you get better the second time. Mm. You, you, you keep doing it, you get better. And I think when you're trying to have lean into those uncomfortable, uncomfortable hard conversations, or you want to talk to someone and you don't know how to approach them, I think always approach them in the way you would like to be approached. So always deliver the truth, but always with love. Mm. Um, and I think you'll get the best response from there. You know, I've, I've, I've had to address, you know, staff who have stolen from me and, I thought, oh, yeah, what are you saying? You know, some of my staff have, you know, have done lifelong sentences and to address them, you know, for dipping their fingers in the till. <laughs> mm. um, you know, that, that's hard, but, you know, I, for one staff member, I, you know, I grabbed his hands and looked him in his eyes like, and I just said, you know, you know, I love you, right? And he said, yep. He couldn't look me in the eyes, but I said, he said, yep. And I said, um, I just need to ask you, you know, why have you stolen from the barbershop? But this is me while I'm holding his hands. Mm. Um, you know, I could have approached him and said, well, Mother Chuck, that waste you from me, blah, blah, blah. They wouldn't have got the result that I wanted. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think to lean into those hard conversations, approach people how you would like to be approached. Fear, fear. So, um, something I want to ask you, because what I've seen is that a lot of the people you work with are um, Māori and Pacifica, and I wanted to... Um, ask what do you think as a community we can do and it's a massive question to to start considering how we can help indigenous communities um when we're seeing them so 
um, badly represented in like mental health and suicide statistics, imprisonment, all these things happen for a reason. And obviously, it's a very, you know, starts at colonialism. Um, but you know, how can we how can we help these communities? How can we make their voice heard and and help them heal? I think first of all, get into the communities. Um, you know, you're not going to know someone until you walk into their household. People need to um, enter these communities or our indigenous communities and listen. Um, you know, there's two ways I've learned that people listen. People listen to win or people listen to understand. And I think when you listen to win, you know, oh, you, know you come in and hear our stories and then you try and give your, your feedback or or you one up someone with a better story or I know what that feels like. You don't put my mind through that. Like, that's listening to win. When you listen to understand, you sit with the person and you show real empathy. You know, you don't give an answer, you don't give feedback. You just sit and listen with them and accompany them however they need a company. Um, because that's, that's how colonization worked, why people came to our lands. Um, they listened and then they, they listened to women. They won up our people. <clears throat> so I think listening to understand is, is crucial to getting anywhere. Um, listening to our people and their stories and their experiences, you know, because people come often come into our communities and, and project their own needs onto us and, and tell us, you know, this is what this is what has worked for us, but you know, you can't do that because not everyone's experiences are the same. <clears throat> so I think, yeah, first and foremost, listen to understand. We'll, we'll get them out, yeah. Um, and you know, with, with a lot of the men that I work who are stuck in the system, the system has failed them horribly. It hasn't worked. Yeah. You know, our prisons are getting bigger. They're building bigger prisons. And you know, what do you do? With bigger prisons, empty prisons. You fill them up. So yeah. Yeah, we Definitely have one of, the, one of the highest incarceration rates in the OECD, if not the highest. Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously, there's some pretty prejudice. Um, stuff happening there and it's pretty mm. clear just looking at looking at our statistics which is um quite a shame but you're, you're absolutely right that it's all all about listening um yeah. even i mean i've done work previously um uh, at odyssey house and the amount of people that just wrote those men off because they had a drug addiction um or come out of prison they were either a criminal or a junkie and there was no no respect or space given to understand their journeys to become clean and to try to provide for their families and a lot of those guys struggle to get jobs and they struggle to actually get ahead and so they just end up back in the system because yeah. the system never gave them a chance to move forward in the first place exactly and i think when you're listening to people um listen you know, you may have a 40, 50 year old man in front of you, but listen to the little boy who's, you know, who's talking. Listen to the inner child who, who's screaming out for help or attention or, you know, to be seen. Because that little boy is always there. Mm. Um, it's just often masked up, masked, masked up or hidden. So, yeah, listen, listen to understand. Awesome. Kia ora. Thanks yeah. so much, bro, for dropping in. That's been some no awesome worries. chat. I'm just going to check to see if there's any <laughs> questions that have popped through before I let you go, because that's been a real good chat. No, thank so you for having how can, me, bro. how can people get involved with what you do? Um, well, at the moment, we are currently working on an online school um, for men to have access, because COVID obviously... Um, has put us in this position where everyone's jumping online. So we're working on an online school where men can do the work themselves. Yeah. Um, and again, again, I'm working alongside therapists, professionals who have been in the industry for more than 20 years. Mm. Um, yeah, the online school we're working on, online program for men to heal. And um, if people want to get on board, honestly, just just come. That's the you know, for me, it's not. I'm not. Get, I don't get paid to do this. Like this is. Uh, we, me and my wife, are passionate about this. This is our passion because we want our kids to grow up in the violent free communities. So come and participate. Come and accompany these men who come to these sessions and just and sit with them. You know, when more men see other men step up and help or walk alongside them, 
the more they want to heal, you know. And for me, you know, my change came because I I wanted I seen someone else um, show me a different window to life. Mm. You know, it's not always you know if you've only seen abuse your whole life, there is other places to look for inspiration or um, for healing. And a lot of the men that have said in my chair, you know, their window they they've been awesome, amazing windows for me to see another life that's possible for me. And so, yeah, the more people who have, I suppose, healed, come and do this journey with me, who come to our sessions, the more better it'll be for all our community. Mm. Awesome. Thanks so, Matt, so much, Matt, for chopping through. No worries. Uh, Matt's down at Make my father's been, barber on Rickerton Road for those in Canterbury. Um, a good way to, to check out what they're doing is to like them on on Facebook so you can see where they are, what they're doing, um, get involved. And yeah, these, these guys are incredible. So Matt, just, um, on behalf of, of everyone here, I just wanted to thank you for coming, a coming along, b um, sharing your stories and C um, being vulnerable with us. I know it, um, it's a big ask in front of a bunch of people you don't know. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. And I can't see anyone, so it's like, oh. <laughs> nah. Thank you, bro. Love your work, Ben, bro. Kia ora. Thank you, man. Take care, and we'll Thank touch you. base soon. Thanks, brother. Take care, brother. Kakite. Kakite. How cool. Matt's an amazing guy, eh? Um, really blessed to to have Matt's input for us today. Um, has done a lot to change a lot of people's lives. And like you said, not just the men he talks to, but also... The whanos, you know, heal the man, heal the whanau. So, um, it's something that we'll probably look at a lot today is how we how we approach and address that trauma that that we face. Um, you know, so um, man, great chats from Matt as always. No surprise there. Um, so yeah, as as always, guys, just pop through any questions that you might have for our speakers, um, or for myself as well. Um, next up, we've got um, my friend Raf. She's going to drop in. I'm going to bring her in in about three minutes. I'm just seeing if I can um, work out how to bring her video screen in. I am not very good at the internet, so. Um, one second. We might just have her on audio again. We'll see how we go. Kia ora, how you doing? Are we doing we video? I can do video. Yeah. We don't need to. <laughs> it looks like um, I can't bring your video into my screen, but everybody can hear you. We're live, so they should be able to hear you now. How are you doing? Hi. But you might need to turn the stream down in the background if that's going. Um, I can't bring your video into my screen. But... All right. Can okay, you hear okay. me all good? Yes, I can hear you because it was doubling up. I had like the Facebook <laughs> live on as well. Awesome. So um, we are live. Everyone can hear you, but they can't see you because um, I'm trying to learn how to use the software and I've got a mistake and I can't fix it. So I'll probably fix that when I have my wee break. Um, so kia ora. Thanks for coming in. I've known Raf for a wee while. Um, so you're going to talk to us about the perspectives of mental health and being a small business owner and especially kind of your own lived experience um so before we get into anything just thanks for coming along on behalf of everyone and also being vulnerable with us um if you want Raf, just give us a bit of a background about who you are um you know from your childhood like right through to where you are now um and then we'll go from there with some questions all right. I'm just, um, I'm bringing you up on my screen because I like seeing the person that I'm talking <laughs> <Cool>. to <laughs> without doubling up the sound. All right. We're on A. Okay. My name is Raf, um, as Ben mentioned, and I'm an, immer I'm an immigrant in New Zealand. So I moved to New Zealand in 2006 and I grew up in Manila, Philippines. So 
that was, I grew up in a big city and I moved to a farm in the middle of nowhere when I was 17. And um, I probably didn't, didn't realize how big of a trauma that was for me um, until I was an adult, because that's when I really felt the, um, the effects of having um, mental health struggles and um, coming to New Zealand was, was definitely the best decision that my family could have done because I was a bit of trouble growing up. And um, when you grow up a little bit different than, you know, how society, I came from a very um, conservative family. Um, I was raised Catholic and I, um, our Philippine society is very conservative, um, I was a bit different. I was a little bit out of the box and I've, I mean, I'm outspoken and people know that of me now and I've accepted that about me now, but um, back then that was a, it was a big no, no, you know, when you're a, when you're a woman, when you're a lady, you don't really voice your opinions as strongly as um, men in our society were listened to. And I was always quite adamant that I wanted to be heard (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, um, so I was, it's pretty different growing up and I never really like, it was, you know, I'm 31 now and I've now, I now understand that you can be the person that you are. And, you know, probably the biggest hurdle for most people is accepting the person that they are so that they can express that person to the world. Um, but moving to Christchurch was, um, was well, I love Christchurch. Don't get me wrong, I love Christchurch, but I never realized how big of a trauma moving from a big city to a new country was. And um, anyway, so moving to Christchurch was great. I became an adult here in Christchurch, and I probably caught the last of the Christchurch nightlife. Um, I kind of I went to hospo straight out of high school, and um, that's how I met a lot of the people that I know now, and. Not long after, um, probably about two, three years into living in Christchurch, I got into a motorbike accident and I lost my job. And I kind of got stuck there because I didn't know what to do anymore. So I went back to school and I fell into a lot of good opportunities while I was um, while I was at uni and at Polytech. And probably not soon after that, this is like a, a long story short of my career, Um Probably not long after going into uh, um, CPIT, then IRA now business school, um, I got a lot of opportunities to become self-employed. I built my network big enough um, and I kind of enjoyed working for myself. I've been self-employed for most of my career. I've probably held down like five jobs in my life and then the rest of it, I've just been kind of trying to make it on my own. And um, that... Um, I don't know if there's a lot of small business owners tuning in, but being a small business owner, um, trying to make your own money, not being employed per se in a very traditional um, uh, kind of um, environment where you have to motivate yourself rather than having to be obligated to go to work. That is a huge challenge for anyone but particularly when you've got anxiety and depression. So um, I guess you see memes. You, you see memes a lot where it's a, it, it, it says check, check on people. You know, people come to work and fulfill their responsibilities regardless of how they're feeling. A lot of people turn up to work still and even if they're feeling crap and stuff. Um, because you have to, because you have a boss, you know, and if you call in sick, You'd have to use a sick day. Some people don't like using their sick days or whatever it is. Like, you know, when you've got a job job, a lot of people try very hard to turn up to their job because they don't want to lose their job, right? When you're self-employed, you have the option not to show up. (laughs) You can just go, you know, I manage my own schedule and the result of me not doing any work today is my own responsibility. So when you're feeling depressed, it's easy to go, I'm going to stay in bed, not do anything today. And... Mm -hmm. It's taken years for me to learn how to manage that, you know, how to manage my mental health and the success of my own small little side gigs. You know, um, 
Is there anything in particular you wanted me to talk about in in this field? Because it's the first time that I've gone public with, you know, like uh, I'm overachieving. You know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people know me as someone who's busy all the time and doing the things. And I don't tend to go out in public when I'm feeling something, Mm. you know, so... So when I tell people that I have anxiety and I have depression, they're just like, no, yeah, like really kind of thing. So if you want to touch on, on that being like, if there's anything that you want me to talk about. Do you think, um, do you think having to balance so many responsibilities is a, is a factor for experiencing depression and anxiety? Cause I know as a previous small business owner myself, um, I found it really hard to manage the, the, the weight of everything like the burden of responsibility um i just thought about you and how you were dealing with i mean you're you what the things that you've done in your life like your projects and stuff um you particularly being um they are they're big you you kind of go big (laughs) for the things that you want to do when you affect a lot of people my um my business, I wouldn't say isn't as impactful. Um, my, I tend to work one-on-one with my clients. Um, so I only tend to, like, for example, you, I guess you felt that if you didn't perform, you were letting a lot of people down, as opposed to if I don't perform, I probably would just bail on one client rather than, you know, like that kind of thing rather than having an effect on a team that's going to suffer if you don't perform that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, my, my experience is different in a sense that um, I am a busy bee. I thrive more when I'm busier. I like being busy, but, um, and I don't feel as depressed per se when I'm busy, but that doesn't heal me. You know, that, that doesn't, I, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people like me out there who mask their, their, I, I have trauma to heal from, you know, like Matt said, like, like, I think a lot of people, um, express their, you know, unhealed trauma, um, in their behavior and, and my, with me, I guess, there was a lot of trauma that was sitting there that I wasn't addressing because I was filling my schedule with other things, mm. you know, and it's taken years for me to sit in my silence, like in, on my own, like, like I'm 31 now. Um, I've been diagnosed with depression. I I've had this since I was 17 and it's only now that I can take one day off a week and not beat myself up for not doing anything on that day off. Mm. You know, I've got a day off and I relish that now. I kind of like, if I sleep in and if, if I choose not to do something, then it's okay. You know, but my entire career, I used to beat myself up for not doing that. And I don't know why. And it's the running. I ran a lot, you know, I ran a lot from healing from my own trauma. I didn't want to be alone with with that with myself for fear of what what I was going to experience if I did address whatever trauma that was and the pain that I was going to go through from healing from that and you know what like because because I've had a, a rough couple of years of you know I'm only I'm only just coming out the other side um you know I left my daughter's father like properly because we've been kind of my ex and I my daughter's dad I love him. He's awesome. He's a great dad. Mm. And, um, but it just, he just wasn't, you know, the person that I was going to spend the rest of my life with. But two years ago, officially it was, it was done. Like I was trying to figure out how I was going to, to do this as a solo parent, how to co-parent with um, someone else and not taking, you know, cause my dog, my, my ex and I split my daughter 50, 50 um, and navigating through that. Um, it's been a really rough ride for the last two years because for the first time in my life, I was out of a long-term relationship. I'm a serial monogamist. I'm a very codependent person. So I go in and out of long-term relationships. And the last one was the longest one, my daughter's dad. And finally I was on my own and I had a little one to raise. And 
it's been a rough couple of years, but it's in the last couple of years that I've probably experienced the most awakening pain that I've ever felt in my life. And it wasn't until I let myself go through that, that pain that I started to feel better. It's like when you watch trauma sitting there, you really need to face that head on and understand how that's affected your life and your behaviors and how you express that unhealed trauma. And that's very confronting because it kind of shows you the bad side of you. You know, I, I feel like for me, I don't know if this is the same experience as other people, but for me, the way my trauma expressed itself in my day-to-day life it was with negative emotions negative feelings negative behaviors and for me to get to a point where okay I'm that way because of this and then going that's not okay that I'm like I'm like that like that like that treating people like shit for years you know I've because of something that you haven't healed yourself that made me feel bad as a person but i had to like accept that and go okay well i need to change that and how do i heal myself so that it doesn't keep on coming out subconsciously and you know what sucks about being a small business owner and having to go through uh, being a small business owner having to go through this is sometimes it hit you it hits you on days where you're just like damn i got to do things mm. <laughs> you know <laughs> And I got to do things. I can't just like sit sit in bed and like feel bad about myself because no one else is going to make me work. I need to make my own money, Mm. you know, having to balance that part of healing because, you know, like over the last two years, even if I've been going through some difficulties, I still had to put food on the table. So you have those moments where all of a sudden something's brought up by, you know, you're triggered by something or whatever, but you still need to move forward and function in this society. And yeah, I, I know a lot of people who have side gigs and small businesses and all this stuff. And I don't know how many of them are, um, are being affected by having like depression and anxiety or just healing in general. You don't have to have depression and anxiety to be healing for some, from some form of trauma. You know, that's, that's difficult to balance on a day to day when, especially because it doesn't just sort itself out in one day, you know, yeah. like you kind of go through a period yeah. where you're like self-reflecting and in that period, everything in your life is affected by how you're feeling on the inside because you kind of, that comes out in your day to day, that comes out in how you relate to people that comes out in the, the, how good your, the production of whatever product you're doing or whatever it is, you know? So, Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, guess what? Hey, guess what? um, We've got audio doubling back. Um, We've got the video working, so you can turn your video on if you want. And boom, there we go. Kia ora. Um, So how do people, how do you think you in particular actually balance things moving forward? Because like you were talking about, it's so hard as a small business owner to, to be you know, like another feeling like it hits you when you don't have the time to deal with something. I'm like you in the sense that I'm always busy, always doing something. Um, and that's mostly because similar to you, if I'm laying around doing nothing, I get depressed because I feel like I'm not contributing or I'm not doing enough. Um, so I'm a, I'm a super busy guy. For me, what I do is I try to go this night here, Like at the moment, for me, it's Friday nights. My Friday nights, I'm going to sit on the couch and watch a TV show with my partner and do nothing else. And having that time where I put aside to do nothing helps me balance that feeling I have that I can be lazy um, and that's okay. So how do you go about balancing it when you have those tough days, especially when you feel terrible, but you've got so much going on? Um, Okay, so... Same as you, like, sorry, I'm shutting the window. Um, same as you. So, so I, I, I guess I'm very, very similar to you as well, where, where you know, I, I thrive more when I'm busy. Um, to be honest, like, to be really, really honest, 
it's you you, na- you hit the nail in the head where you give yourself permission to have a day off, right? So I have one day off. There's there's one day of the week where I don't have my kid. My kid's at her dad, and I don't. I try my best not to do it. If I'm going to, if I'm going to do something, it's because I chose to do it. You know, like it's because I added. I gave myself permission to do it. But the, on that day, this is a Tuesday. I take it in the middle of the week. Um, because then I can choose to do whatever work or not, you know, um, and I'm not busy being distracted by weekend things. Um, my day to myself, I give myself full permission to be, feel, and just whatever I want for myself. So if I choose to sleep in, I'm not going to beat myself up for missing half the day because I'm just like, well, it's my day off, you know, I don't have to be productive today and um but if i choose to work on one of my projects on that day then i that's me giving myself permission to go okay i'm gonna do this on my day off because it makes me feel good you know i like that's a that's a feel good day like that's one i think i think overcoming having a day off (laughs) i don't know why that's even a bad thing to have a day off i mean you know but overcoming that that feeling of beating yourself up because oh man i've got heaps of things to do like i can really use this day off to do those things you know like no like i just i that's the day that i don't have to be responsible for everything so i chose that day to give to myself and and having that day has been i should appreciate that day a lot more than i have for years because i've you know, like I've been beating myself up on my slow days, like I always do. Now I'm not. I relish that now. I, I'm just like, yes, Tuesday, I can sleep in kind of thing. Because life's always going to happen. Like you're always going to be busy. Everyone, like if you, you know, if you're one of those people that that take on a lot of things, take on a lot of projects um, or or just like being and doing and contributing and serving, there's always going to be something to do. You know, and, but allowing yourself that time off, even if it's not a day, even if it's just like a few hours, like if you say to yourself, I'm switching off for like four hours during this time, being really there in the switch off gives me energy. Like it, it kind of allows me to recoup the energy that is taken from me on the other days where I'm busy. That's one. The second one, and this is a hard one. So on the days, I've lost a lot of income. I've lost a lot of, I wouldn't say I've lost relationships. Like I'm pretty good at maintaining relationships. So I haven't really lost relationships um, or people from my mental health um, kind of uh, flare ups. Um, But there are days where say, for example, the day before I've had a bad day and and the next day, it's I'm still kind of feeling the effects of that day before. Um, being really present is really like be being there, being where I am at any given moment makes a huge difference to how I feel. Because there's a saying, there's a saying that worrying about the future causes anxiety and wallowing in the past causes depression so if you're right in the middle of that if you're just right there in the present then neither you can feel neither really so on the days when i'm really busy and i'm feeling like crap you know i can be kind of shorter not as nice not as positive and cheery as i can be but i try my very 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 best to be where i am on my schedule for the person that I'm showing up for. Um, And that kind of keeps me going for the day, but also remembering that whatever it is that I was feeling still needs to be addressed. That kind of sits in the back of my head. And if I know that there's something that's like niggling at me, I know it's going to come out one way or another. And I, I, I try to allocate time to feel that, <laughs> you know, you should feel things. Emotions are meant to be felt, you know, they're not there to piss you off or make you feel 
crap or anything. They're meant to be like experienced and acknowledged. But give yourself time. Like I, yeah, when something's niggling at me, I know that I need to address it. I try not to run anymore. I have lots of dreams where I run. And I think for my whole life, I've been running away from feeling pain and feeling bad. Um, and the only way to get away from that is to allow it yourself to feel it and just experiencing it and then letting it flow out of you eventually. But also having a solid support network. So I think having support is very important. To people out there who don't have support, there are you know numbers you can call and all of that stuff. But having a good support network, I think, is very important to people who suffer from mental health struggles. It's a big thing as well. So if I'm having a moment, I try and ring someone and just tell them I'm having a moment. And they tend to say, you'll be right. You know, and that's great. So how do you connect to you when you're, when you're taking that scheduled time? What is it that you like to do? So, cause everybody has like, everybody's experiences of mental illness and mental unwellness is so different that of course, all the solutions are different. You know, for some people it's pharmaceutical, yeah. for some people it's going yeah. walking, connecting with nature. What is yeah. it that really gets you feeling good? What do you do to reconnect to yourself? What gets me feeling good? Um, in my alone time or in my career, like in my business, uh, like in what? Both, else? both. So when you're taking that scheduled oh. time off for yourself, but also just your your kind of life values and ethos. Okay. Um, so I'm a business and lifestyle coach. <laughs> Let's start with that because... Um, and what I enjoy doing and my what I'm trying to make my bread and butter is teaching people like myself or people that are bigger than like business owners how to manage their lives better. So having a sustainable lifestyle while growing your business and business owners tend to be workaholics like people who own businesses, small or medium size or big are very, very work driven. Um, and their, their life, their personal lives, their relationships suffer for that. And so my job as a business and lifestyle coach is to help those people make their lifestyle sustainable as well as still growing their business to however way they want right um so in my work i also do personal training um in my work what you know what being being very open and raw and honest about the way that i deal with things in my life and relating to my people so my clients and the people that i work with um has been really refreshing for the people that I work with because I guess as a personal trainer or as, as a coach, you know, life coach or whatever, people think you've got your shit together. <laughs> Am I allowed to swear here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like the, you, you, people have this perception that because you're doing that job, you've mm -hmm. figured it out. You know, and you've just you're just awesome, and you've you're, you you've you know you, you've got it figured out. You've you've got your shit together. Your life is like picture perfect or whatever, and you do everything right. You know, especially when you're a personal trainer, there people think that you don't eat junk food. You know, <laughs> like that kind of thing. Um, but but I don't, and I'm I'm, I'm just as human as my clients. I have my own journey. You know, I have my own struggles. I just happen to have the knowledge. I happen to have studied, you know, strategies and ways to manage that or whatever it is. But um, and I just have that in my head and I can charge people mm -hmm. to teach that to them. Um, but, yeah, being myself, I'm very myself. So, like, when you meet me, I have no filter. <laughs> I don't know whether or not I should work on that. But it's actually been really nice for people that know me. Like, I think that's a, 
they find it endearing that someone's so honest, you know, about things. So in my work life, that rawness, that honesty with the people that I work with, um, that's, it helps them connect with me. You know, I meet so many people, random people, even the lady that does my nails, man, I remember the first or second time that I caught up with her, she cried and told me her life story. Mm. And I didn't like even the hardships that she's been through. And I wasn't expecting that, but I get that a lot. I meet a lot of people and they feel that they can tell me things because of the way that I am, mm. you know, like, because I'm very open and honest and, and they feel that I won't judge them, which everyone's kind of judgmental with their own biases and their perspective. But I tend not to like make people feel bad by my opinions in my head. I just, I still, you know, everyone judges people. When you say you're not, everyone has biases, you know, and in their perspective and their lives. Um, but I tend to be very open, you know, with, and I tend to communicate how I feel in a very honest way that some people get offended by it, but most people find it kind of refreshing and endearing and kind of funny sometimes. Because <laughs> so uh, that's, <laughs> I like making people laugh. I like getting a reaction from people, you know, because sometimes I spit something out that people are thinking in the room and no one has the nuts to say. <laughs> and then I spit it out and then my friends would be like, of course, you're the one that's going to say that. But, you know, like, <laughs> but yeah, so so in my work life, that's, that's, I, I'm glad for, and it makes my job easier. Like people do open up to me, which makes it easier for me to help them. You know, um, in my personal life, how do I connect with myself? Okay, I'm really working on that still. <laughs> like, probably the biggest challenge for me, and I'm not sure if this is this is probably the same for a lot of people, is really confronting who you are. You know, like being very accepting of the person that you are. That is... Um, it's a huge challenge for me because if I say, if I carve out some time for self-reflection, the, the things that are most painful, the things that you probably don't want to admit about yourself, the things that you deny, the things that you, you know, about yourself, th those are probably the most painful things about yourself. And those are the things that need to be worked on. That's where the growth comes. It's, you know, I'm, you know, that's why it's called growth pains. Mm. So sometimes I'm scared. Like I still, I'm better at being alone now. Like I'm better at doing, you know, like doing alone time and um, having some switch off time for people. Cause I do work with people all day, every day. Um, it's good to have that, but it's also kind of scary sometimes. Like if I'm in a phase where I'm not feeling super great and then I'm alone, I'm scared of what, myself will confront me with you know but that's where the growth comes from like i if there's anything that i want to leave here for people is that don't be afraid to experience that kind of pain when you sit with yourself and think about the things that are hard in your life because that's where you learn how to be more resilient more accepting of yourself more kind to yourself you know um I don't really do much, you know, on my day off, I try, I literally lie in the sun if there's, if the sun's out <laughs> and do nothing. Like That's good though. That's, that's it, a great way to connect to yourself. Yeah. I just do yeah. nothing. And I'm okay with that now. Like I'm okay to allocate myself time. It take, it's taken years for me to get to a point where I'm okay to just not do anything. I do nothing, you know, like, like really, I just lie there. I try, I scroll a lot, <laughs> okay, <laughs> like everyone else. <laughs> yeah, but I try not talking, to. talking to a friend and she mentioned uh, last year, I think it was about scheduling time for yourself. And that was something that I absolutely took on board. And I give that advice to a lot of people, just being able to actually feel okay with relaxing and laying down and doing nothing, like laying down on the couch and going, yes, this is what I plan to do today. So that's okay. Hmm. And I'm okay. I'm okay with whatever I experience in that time now. So because I know that I've got like depression and anxiety and all that stuff, I know that on my day, my quiet time, sometimes I'll feel real shit, you know, like just down and not very good. And I'm open to that feeling now. Mm -hmm. 
you know I, um it means something needs to be addressed in my life and and I'm okay feeling like that and when it gets really bad I reach out so that's the time where I take my friends or I call someone and go I'm not feeling very great someone be with me or talk to me or whatever um but also I I've accepted that that if I'm going through that then there's growth mm. for me in that space so it, it's a kind of a good thing that it's happening especially if it's happening in your quiet time where you've allocated time to just switch off because then I'm not affecting another person's schedule yeah I'm just in my own schedule mm-hmm. my time off so and I prefer <laughs> to go through that hard times and during those periods because then I give myself full permission to kind of feel crap and lie in bed and cry and pity myself for a you, you know for however long I've got time off but but try not to sit in that and obviously like most people you probably run away from that who likes feeling crap you know I don't purposely want to feel that way but on the days where I am feeling like that and I give myself permission to just sit in that space and go why am I feeling this way you know what is it that I need to learn and um, how can I take this pain and grow from it and become a better person tomorrow you know awesome hey thanks so much for dropping in raf and i think that kind of echoes what matt was saying as well about addressing like really addressing and confronting those things in ourselves and in those around us so just on behalf of everyone thank you so much for dropping in it's been super cool to hear your story and your perspective and um thanks again for being vulnerable i know it's hard in front of a lot of people um, you can't see them, but they're there. Um, so thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming in. Cheers. That's okay. Thank you. Kakite, take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you get some relaxing time. You too. <laughs> take All care. All best. Awesome. How good. So nice to have um, really open and honest people popping in um, to have both. Um, you know, Matt and Raph already is really, really cool. So two pretty incredible people um, sharing their stories. So powerful. So next we've actually got um, Amanda in. So I'm going to bring her in and she's going to give us a bit of a chat about her experience. Um, So she should be in in just a moment. Um, So yeah, just as we're going along today, fire away any questions as they come through. Um, I'm going to actually be really sneaky while I wait for Amanda and I'm just going to um, make a quick coffee. Oh, I better leave you with, with this.
Kia ora, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good, how are you? Good, good. So I'm just going to pop a straight and... Kia ora. sorry everybody, I just went to make a coffee. We could probably have like a little thing down the side here counting how many coffees I have today. <laughs> the so, mental heart. <laughs> yeah, I love my coffee. So we've got an Amanda. So kia ora to Amanda. She's going to um, tell us her story of lived experience and um, and her experience, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, with uh, mi misdiagnosis and from there into studying. Um, so kia ora, Amanda, if you just want to hit us with your background, tell us, tell us your life story. We've got 30 minutes, so don't be shy. Cool. I'll probably introduce my cat at some point. She's oh. coming in at the door and then out of the door and then back in the door. So she's a part of this as much as I am. No, <laughs> we're, pro we're pro cats in 2020. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm 29. I'm up in Hamilton. I was Christchurch based for a very long time. I moved up here four years ago as a part of my unofficial treatment, escaping what was re-traumatizing me. So I've been diagnosed with bipolar type 2, complex PTSD, substance abuse disorder, and depression. So a lot of people don't quite realize that you can have unipolar depression as well as bipolar depression, but it's, it's completely a thing. Mm. So I was always one of those children that was quiet with the head in the book, and then I would randomly get energy out of nowhere. I'd do really well in class. I'd join sports teams. I'm, I'm not a sports person. <laughs> <laughs> I'd do really well in debates and join school productions, and then I would go straight back to being a bookworm, and nobody really thought anything of it because it wasn't harmful. So that was fine up until I hit puberty. And so I came from quite a dysfunctional family background, and that started to show up in my high schooling. So I was a straight-A student. Everything was perfect, NCA, excellent level and everything, up until I started having these pitfalls. And there'd be days where I would just, I'd catch the school bus, I would get to school, and then I don't know what I did, but then I'd be back on the school bus at the end of the day, and I'd get home, my mother's standing in the kitchen, where the hell have you been all day? <laughs> I've been in class? No, I wasn't in class. I was doing burnouts in the cemetery down the road. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> And there were quite a lot of episodes like that. And as my family, the situation became a bit harder and that's where the complex post-traumatic stress disorder comes in, but I'm not going to elaborate on that too much. But with a bipolar disorder, they don't like to diagnose teenagers a lot because there's puberty, there's hormones, there's depression, there's, there's everything going on in your life. So it is, most of the time it's something else. So I went to my doctor to talk about the depressive episodes, the days where I didn't want to get out of bed, where I wouldn't go to class. I'd just sit in a field near school for all of days and just stare at the clouds, which now that I look back, that sounds really nice. <laughs> but um, they said that it could be depression, but they don't prescribe antidepressants to teenagers. This was back 15, 16 years ago. It wasn't really a dumb thing where I was from. And then it took quite a while. It took a few more manic episodes and they looked at me and went, okay, we're going to test you. So I got all my hormones checked. I got my thyroid checked and everything else. But they looked at it from a medical perspective and said that I was fine. So I started getting worse. And it got to the point where I passed NCA level one, two, and three. But I moved out of home. So you actually need a parent signature or a legal guardian to sign off on your qualifications. So I passed everything, but on paper I didn't. So that's a really awkward gray area that because I became an independent youth with no legal guardian, they didn't know what to do with me. So that, that kind of haunts me to this day. <laughs> I, I know I'm capable, but on paper I'm not. Mm. But I left school, I had a full blown manic episode and I ended up in the sex industry. So I became homeless. I ended up using a mixture of heroin and methamphetamine to, to both elevate me through the depressive episodes, but then to bring me down from the manic. I didn't know what they were. I just knew that some days I had a lot of energy, some days I had none and couldn't do anything. Mm. So this was my way of self-medicating, which seems to be quite common amongst people with bipolar disorder. So I was homeless. 
I was a sex worker. I was in very dangerous situations that were causing quite a lot of trauma. And I'm an advocate for the industry. I think I take my hat off to any woman or man that is in there. It's, it's really challenging, but I won't be going back just because it's, for me, it adds another layer of trauma to the life that I'm already trying to hold together. So, <laughs> I had my first NA meeting at 18, and they were great. They were amazing. They helped my hair back while I speared in a rubbish bin. <laughs> they, I still go to meetings to this day, 12 years later. They're amazing. Nice. But when I went to a doctor, all they said was they wanted to prescribe me a product called Antabuse. And I don't know if you're really familiar with that. Maybe you are from your community work, mm-hmm. but it's a... It's nasty. It's a it's a medication that they prescribe you and you take to the point where it's when you cannot control your drinking. So even one beer will make you violently ill. Like the worst hangover you've ever had times that by 10, and that's kind of ant abuse. But I didn't have a problem with drinking. So that didn't really help me. Mm. They tried prescribing me antidepressants during the manic period, and that made me, I, I went off the charts. So I had my first suicide attempt at age 19 and they kept trying to give me antidepressants, but I hadn't slept for three days. So I was sitting there in respite and they were just feeding me sleeping pill after sleeping pill. And I'm sitting there just watching cartoons, no problem, not feeling anything at all. And they just didn't know what to do. So they discharged me. And I know it's not the worker's fault. They're doing the best they can with the system that they're presented with. But that probably was one of the worst things that could have happened to me. Mm. So I lost three months after that. And I ended up selling all of my belongings and moving into a very organic community down south with with no technology, no anything. So everybody in my life freaked out because I just vanished after being released from psych hospital. Mm. But I thought I was doing great. The workers down there thought I was great as well because I was getting so much work done. I was awake all the time. I was doing repairs at night and out in the fields in the day. But then I crashed. And the depressive episodes don't always come after mania. But when they do, it's it's devastating. So you're up here and you feel so functional. And it's wonderful. It's beautiful. You're creative. You've got colors are brighter. And you have a wider vocabulary. Everything is just there. And then you're all of a sudden down here. You're not even in the grid. You don't have access to any of those thoughts. You don't have any of that processing speed that your mind had when you were manic. And it's not like if you went down to a regular level and then you had a depressive episode, it might not be so bad because it's not such a severe crash. But to be suddenly incapable of doing anything after thinking you're a superhero and able to do everything, it's it's really hard. So I ended up hitchhiking back to Christchurch because Christchurch is home, home is comfortable, and went back into the sex industry. And I was chatting away with my regular GP, and she suspected that there might be some bipolar disorder. And I was meant to be going through the funding, and then our earthquake happened. So that caused a lot of problems for a lot of people, and I think I'm one of the lucky ones that was able to get through but there are a lot of people that weren't, and I, it worries me. Mm. But that was me back in the sex industry working as a stripper for several years. That works amazingly when you're in a manic episode because you have this, this charisma that just pours out of you and people can't help but listen to you and pay attention, and you make bank. <laughs> But then when you have the depressive episodes and you've spent all of your money, that doesn't help you recover. So several years down the track, I realized that the cycle was what was toxic to me. So manic, sex industry, depressive, unable to cope, and just going round and round. It wasn't, it wasn't sustainable and it wasn't something I wanted to be known for. So I moved up to the Waikato in my way Sabari legacy. <laughs> I moved into my uncle's in Huntley, actually. I was meant to move to Auckland, and my accommodation fell through. And I was a bit manic at the time. I was hypomanic, so that's kind of just below mania. 
and I become really irritable when I'm off my manic. So I had a tantrum. I got in my car and I drove down to Huntley and I parked in my uncle's driveway until he woke up in the morning. And I just never left the region. I love it here. But it took a couple of years of, what do you call it? Baby steps of leaving the industry. So I had to leave the industry completely. But to go straight onto a benefit is so hard. You've got two to three hundred dollars to cover all of your bills for a week when previously you could earn that in an hour. It's been a big culture shock as well. The you have a lot more support in the industry than you realise. There's a, a camaraderie in those rooms that you you're not going to see elsewhere because the shared experiences aren't they aren't as deep, I think. So each workplace that I enter is a bit blander. But that's good because that's what I needed. So it took a lot of entry-level jobs that didn't stress me out for me to break that cycle and have a couple of years free from the industry. And during this time, I, I had an opiate overdose. I had a medication overdose. And then they finally found a medication that worked for me. So I was put on a high dose of lithium. And lithium is pretty rough. It's... Definitely not a first option for anybody, but for me, it did wonders. It gives you the, the horrible dry throat. Like, you know, you wake up after a night out in the town and you, your mouth is the Sahara Desert. It's kind of like that 24-7 with lithium. It's horrible. So you have to keep drinking water, which is great because you don't want the lithium levels in your blood to rise. Because when they rise, they become toxic. The downside is you spend half the time in the bathroom. <laughs> But, so that worked for, for a couple of years. And then I decided after getting some ACC-related therapy for my time in the sex industry that I have a lot of these skills that I really watched her and listened. And then I asked her what her background was before she was a therapist. And she just said that she worked in customer service. And I thought, well, sex industry is definitely customer service. <laughs> If I can sit there chatting while stark naked to middle-aged men about how their teenage daughters are problematic right now, and if they're just a bit patient with them, perhaps there'll be some better communication, then I'm sure I could do that fully clothed. <laughs> so it took me a while because I didn't want to make a really quick decision because being potentially hypomanic or manic, you don't want to make life-changing decisions on a whim. Yeah. So I was sitting in the back of my mind for quite a while and I thought the right opportunity will present itself. There'll be this big fanfare in my life and I'll let it. That's what I meant to do it. And then COVID happened. <laughs> I thought that's probably a good enough time to leave the workforce and go study. Because it's pretty hard when you don't have a great background on paper. My, my CV says that I was a performer and an entertainer for 10 years. I've got little houseway jobs in between, but it doesn't help you get those good rock solid jobs. So I went for a lot of temp work, a lot of contract work and stuff. And that doesn't really help you with that stability that you need when you have a mental illness. So my contract ran out two weeks into lockdown. So I ended up thinking, what, do I study something? Do I find a menial job and just toil away until my sanity is gone. And I ended up getting such a great support from my flatmates and my partner that I thought, well, I may as well do it. So lockdown was March and I was looking at my options and I knew that I would need to give it a really decent chunk of time between my application and the start date just to make sure that if it was a manic episode, it would run its course and I could withdraw before I have to pay anything. I spend a lot of money when I'm manic. I can, I've, I think I've dropped 10K on one weekend just like that. And that's, yeah, that's a lot of money. And as a student now, I really wish I'd just hidden that somewhere that I could find. <laughs> so, yeah, I decided to do a bachelor of counselling. But I encountered a few problems with studying link because I'd previously tried studying a couple of times and both had ended in mental health crises they didn't want to give me a student loan or a student allowance they were really concerned about that 
So I had to have quite a few meetings. I had to have a meeting with my GP. I had to have a meeting with Wintech, that's the Polytech that I'm at now. And I had to talk to my mental health team up at the hospital. So this wasn't a quick thing. It took a lot of reassurance from me to my healthcare providers that this is a solemn decision I want to make. I'm not making this as a rash decision. I am making sure it's sustainable. And we came to an agreement. Even though I've studied at level seven before, they wanted me to do a six month course, this um, Te Ara Putaki, which is my academic pathway. So it's it's a level four course and it introduces you to the idea of academic writing, to the social services and stuff. It's It's been amazing. And I can see exactly why they wanted me to be in this class. <laughs> There's a whole module just on how to take care of yourself while studying. And I didn't encounter that before. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really important thing that a lot of students should be given. But it's helped me build this routine that I can stick to because with, with bipolar disorder, you have to have a really rock solid sleeping and eating routine. If the smallest thing goes out of whack, it can trigger manic or depressive. It's, it's pretty rough. So I didn't have that last time I was studying and I think that's where I went wrong. So I've managed to attend most of my classes so far. There've been three or four where I had a wee turn and I emailed my tutors and they were, they were amazing. It's about keeping up that communication when you're studying and trying to stay ahead just in case. Like you don't have to be a Hermione Granger. You don't have to have everything perfect and in miles before the due date, just chip away at it. And that really helps just knowing that I can have a few days off. I've got me if I need it. And that's a really good approach. I think that has saved me. Because usually it'd be about the seven to eight week point that I would crash. And I'm week, this would be week 11 now. So I think I'm, I'm not going to say I'm going to clear. That would probably be jinx again. But there's, with study comes a whole can of worms. (laughs) So going into the Bachelor of Counseling can be pretty triggering. And most people, it seems, are attracted to the social services because they want to help. They, they've they seen life from another facet. They understand a little more. And they feel like they've got skills that they could contribute to the industry, which is really cool. I've got such a diverse class right now, and it's amazing. And that does help keep me motivated. But we are encountering a lot of really triggering things. So... and school service, which was really eye-opening because I realized, wow, my family grew up in really bad poverty. And you don't think about it until you're on this rubric and you realize that you're way down here. And Mm. that alone made me feel like, wow, I need to think about this a little further. I need to to process this before I can write this assignment. And that was... It was so interesting just realizing that a lot of my life experience is not the norm because you grow up, you see the world through your lens and you think that's the world. Yeah. But with the the degree next year, I know it's going to be a lot more intense. It's going to be quite, quite challenging in more than one way. And I'm looking forward to that because I'm very big on, on growth, on change. So one thing I did is we did this, we had one class, we had to go to a social services provider in the field we want to be in. So I chose a place called Safe Network because they deal with um, dysfunctional sexual behavior and adult offenders. So that was really interesting. I knew that would be triggering, but I had a friend that was there and we prepared for it beforehand. And it was amazing to go into this building that had to be an an industrial zone because nobody wanted them as their neighbours and this also kept their clients' confidentiality. So it looked like part of a factory and you walk in there and they've got a sensory room for children and a CBT room, a sand pit in a room and it was so cool to see all of these methods of communicating with a client Mm. 
And it made me realize that while their life might not be normal, they're still human. They're still us. And that helped me to overcome a lot of my, a lot of my PTSD from the sex industry, just seeing that needs driven behavior doesn't mean inherent evil. And a lot of people don't realize that. Mm. So I went from there and I decided that I wanted to do a master's or a PhD or some kind of further study already in um, families that share sexual communities. So I had a sister that was in the sex industry at the same time as me. We never worked in the same establishment, but I made sure that she was taken care of wherever she was. And I think that building models of communication between these family members would help keep things safe with good barriers, but also help keep them safe within themselves. Because you've also got like parents that date people the same age as their children or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And how do you talk about that? There's nothing worldwide yet that can facilitate that. So I thought this is a really great thing to get into. So that's that's my end goal. I know it's going to take a bit longer than the average person because there might be the odd hospital stay. There might be the odd time where I have to be dosed on a high level of medication, but that's, that's all part of the plan. And if I factor that in, hopefully I'll still get to the finish line. You're doing incredible. That's awesome. Wow. Um, what do you think are the, the benefits of you having such significant insight? So I guess in the industry, a lot of the time we refer to insight as the understanding of how, how your mental illness presents. So um, what are the benefits for you having such significant insight into when you're starting to go hypermanic or when you're in an episode? Like how does that benefit you or maybe not benefit you? It's helpful to know that bipolar has a 75% relapse rate with its medication and up to, up to 40% of people deny that they have it until they have another episode. So I didn't even believe that I had it up until I had to do an assignment and I'm like, oh gosh. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so the fact that I know that that it happens even with me and I thought that I was managing my illness really well I can see that in others and hopefully I'll be able to facilitate the journey to a safer place rather than coming from a judgmental standpoint and not having any understanding of how a manic or a depressive episode works mm. how important is lived experience working in the industry nowadays like I know back 20, 30 years ago, well, 30 years ago, closer, the idea that if you had had a mental illness, you couldn't really work in this industry, like broken or something. But now there seems to be this massive shift in the industry towards people with lived experience. Like how important is that with connecting with people? It's interesting that you say yeah, because even in my own personal life, I've had people say, but you're in a system. How can you be working in the system? Mm. So I think there's still a lot of public stigma around working with mental illness when you have one. But from a professional standpoint, I've received nothing but positivity from the NZCCA, who is, they're kind of supporting me through my student journey. The regional manager is one of my tutors, and it's incredible the level of support you get, both as a client of the system and as I'm not going to say an employee of the system because I'm not yet, but as a person that's interested in working in the system. So it's definitely changing and it's really nice to see that there's a lot more in place in regards to like safety plans and mental health care plans and bosses having mental health funding available for days off. So I think it's becoming a really positive change. Yeah, absolutely. I know even through my work that um, our own mental illness and wellness is something that's kept in really high consideration. Um, you know, we have like little well-being voucher booklets that we can use to take time off if we need to. Um, it's paid, which is really good. We've got access to EAP, which is a phone counseling service. So all those things are really important because you do find now that a lot of people working in mental health have their own journey or, or are still... Um, living with mental illness so 
Yeah. So, Amanda, you mentioned before about um, having your routine um, helps you. Like, what is yes. what is your routine? How do you keep that balance? Mine's mine's pretty solid. I wake up at six every day, even if I don't want to. Um, I have plans in place, but I don't feel like solid breakfast. I have meal replacement shakes. That way I'm still getting the energy I need because that's a big thing for me as I get quite busy, especially if I'm hypomanic and then I forget to eat. Mm. So eating or at least consuming something that's healthy is very important. So I have to eat at least five servings of fruit and vegetables. I have to have carbs. I try and avoid caffeine. You say you love coffee. Coffee is the <laughs> devil for me. <laughs> I love it, but it's – and you have to drink lots of water still, even though I'm no longer on my lithium. It's still – it's it's healthy. You need it. Mm. But I make sure that I have rest time as well. And so my rest time isn't always sleeping. It's just reading something that isn't stimulating or watching something gentle or meditating or sitting on my Shakti mat and – that is usually kind of at the end of my day. That's my break between what I've been doing in the outside world and inside my little sanctuary. Yeah. And then when it comes to bed, I make sure that I'm reading or I'm doing something easy. Lights are done usually an hour before bed. And then I just kind of slowly get into that, that sleep pattern. Or if I notice that I'm not getting there, I keep an eye on that. And if I don't sleep that night, I make sure that I take some antipsychotics the next night because that's usually a really bad indicator of mania. So I try and catch it before it creeps up by sticking to this routine because then I notice when when something's starting to happen, something's starting to change. Awesome. That's incredible. Um, I think we will try and find our next guest so thanks heaps for coming in amanda awesome to hear your story and and again like Thank you. and raf thanks for being vulnerable and and giving us a really good um background of of where you've been and where you've come from and where you're at now that's really awesome um wish you all the best with all your study that's so cool um as someone also studying in the industry i i know it's i know it's value and it's worth um super important stuff and you're such a cool person so keep it up thanks for dropping by we really appreciate it i hope you enjoy the rest of your sunday and um have some nice rest time in there thank you enjoy the rest of your live stream man it's pretty cool i will we're a couple hours in so about nine to go still zesty and fresh (laughs) yeah the coffee will do that hopefully (laughs) all right thanks so much amanda take care bye-bye Cool. That was our third guest, Amanda. How nice. Um, it's a really interesting thread, I think, between our guests so far is, is about being really aware about <clears throat> not just your past trauma, but also um, when you're feeling unwell. Like if you if you have a, a, um, a mental illness like Amanda with bipolar type 2, being, being able to recognize when those tides are changing when you're starting to feel unwell and being able to take an action that you know that works for you so very very proud and happy to have had um amanda on board today very nice i'm just checking and to see where my we're bound to have one or two people not show up today so um if that happens, you'll just be stuck with me rambling for a bit longer. Um, I'm just going to chuck over to this screen so I can just have a reminder that there's some numbers that we can access. So I think there was a couple questions there. Oh, kia ora, Megan. I don't expect you to be here for 11 hours. That's madness. <laughs> um, we have our schedule on the event page, so you can actually kind of check in there and see what kind of discussions we're having and when because a lot of these discussions will have threads of continuity but we'll be focusing on different communities different different aspects of mental illness or mental wellness so if you pop into the event you can see um, our schedule and that way um, you can know when you want to drop in or drop out um, cool so there was a question here from martin what strategies can someone use to heal from trauma 
when toxic family members still do everything they can to downplay, deny, and justify the situations that lead to trauma? Tough question. Um, <clears throat> now, first of all, I'm not a clinician, Martin, but what I would su suggest initially is that um, sometimes your surroundings can be amplifying your mental unwellness. So if you're finding that you know, your family are causing you undue stress and issues, especially with how you're feeling personally and that trauma and stuff, then you might pay to try and remove yourself for a while. Even just a couple of weeks can help you kind of find a bit of a balance and to engage in services as well. Like it's really important that if you feel you've got some tension in your relationships that you're able to address those because we don't want to just... um look at that and go oh this situation isn't working for me it's not healthy i need to exit because simply running is not not the solution as we heard from raf earlier so being able to talk to um, a service or a professional about that and there's lots of them just over here um you can you can talk to them and find some ways to address how that's affecting you inside and some tips about really talking to your family always being honest is good sometimes families don't understand that and i understand that every family is different some might not have the um spatial ability to really like dig into those honest um conversations some will some won't so um yeah approach the services do what you can give yourself some space but don't run away approach services have a chat to them and look at mediation if you need to. So that's actually just having someone that can go with you to sit there and have that conversation. Um, that's not necessarily going to take your side, but it's going to um, work with you to make sure that you're all right. Okay, good question. You guys can fire questions through like this at any time. Kia ora, Deb. Deb says, hoping health professionals are viewing this. Absolutely brilliant, Mahi. Kia ora. thanks, Deb. Um, yeah. I mean, hopefully they are. I mean, I think in general, the health services are starting to look at, um, you know, intentional peer support and peer support and different community initiatives as the way to go. I know for our political party, the Opportunities Party, where we want to see things like a whole lot of funding going into community driven responses um, or not so much responses, but prevention to actually um getting in i realized i didn't transition this across actually getting in and um having uh, you know community hubs and a space for belonging and a place to where there's barrierless um access to services or help from community groups and initiatives and ngos and everything um can help you know increase your sense of belonging and identity and community and that should hopefully um you know lessen the amount of social determinants that lead to mental um illness so Cool. So I haven't heard back from our 11 o'clock guy yet. Um, but if you can't make it in for 11, we've got a couple gaps later in the day and we can squeeze them in. So that's okay. Uh, what I am going to do, though, is I'm going to take a quick bathroom break. So I'll be back just in a couple.
apologies everyone i was just ranting about my job for ages and um and it was on mute i'm uh, i'm still learning this thing so thank you for um sticking with me <laughs> um cool so um just gonna have a quick reflection our guest hasn't shown up um that's okay i've sent him a message and hopefully he can drop by a little bit later uh when we've got another gap so our next guest is on until 12.30. So welcome to an hour and 15 minutes of listening to me. Um, thanks for all coming along. So just to revise, we're here for 654 minutes of live stream for mental health. Today is Sunday, the 27th of September. It is the last day of Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, this week we have, uh, on my candidate page, we've been talking about the five ways to well-being, and we've been talking about... Um, about Fari Tapafa as well with my friend Liam. So the five ways to well-being are, are five five things. So there's giving, being active, connecting, taking notice, and learning. And these are like five tools that you can implement on a daily basis to um, keep your well-being intact and good and healthy. And it it's a good reminder for you as well because sometimes I know I can become a bit isolated because I I keep busy. So thinking about how I can connect with other people, other communities is super important. Um, Te Whare Tapawha, um, no expert, but it was Mason Jury's uh, model from the 1980s about Māori uh, well-being, te ao Māori well-being. So the the concept of Te Whare Tapawha is that there's four pillars holding up the, the house, right? And if one of those pillars is weakened or damaged, then you rely on the other pillars being strong to, to keep the house uh, erect and, and standing, right? So these are um, tinana, um, heninaro, fano, and wairua. So that's your mind, uh, sorry, your body, your mind, your spirituality, and your fano, your greater fano. And the fifth one we discuss is actually whenua, which is your connection to the land and your roots. Um, it's a really awesome way of looking at mental health and well-being that's not really considered by a lot of western models about how all of these different things come together to form a support network for yourself and how you can connect and and work with everyone cool what would you like to see changed or enhanced with health supports ngo and dhb cool good question um, the biggest thing that I would like to see immediately is the gaps left by specific funding criteria. So I see this through work where we have a specific referral pathway to be engaged in our service. And pretty much every service typically has a specific referral pathway. This in itself is a barrier for people to access service. If they can't understand the referral pathway or the referral pathway isn't clear when they're told that they can't engage in the service because they don't meet criteria often those people will just move on and they'll move on without support they won't have that access that they dearly need to to get involved so that is a huge change that needs to happen so we need to we need to look at all the funding bodies and how they can create more diverse and interacting funding criteria between contracts with different providers. That means that no one's getting left behind. You know, we see it often when people will try to get engaged in a service, but they can't because they don't fit the criteria and, and they're just told, sorry, mate, you don't fit the criteria, you know, pop along to WINS and see if they can help you. But the problem is, is that WINS aren't mental health workers. They're not mental health supports. They are kind of like a bank in a way. And their people are assessing who needs what money and giving money. They're not really good at the whole, um, oh, this is the mental illness that you have. How do we work around this with you and build supports to deal with that? So that kind of covers, in a way, funding from DHV. But also, um, in my role, we get funding from different government government bodies as well so i would like to see the dhb look at um, funding more community-based preventative work and having ensuring that those contracts are 
almost interwoven with other community services in that area to ensure that no one's getting left behind. No one's not going to meet the referral criteria. Um, because a lot of the time, like, you know, to, to meet referral criteria, often you have to go to the doctor. The doctor has to recognize your uh, mental illness significantly enough that they refer you then to a specialist mental health um, caseworker um, through the DHB. And then they often will do the referral out to different services. So the starters, if you don't have a good GP and you go to the GP and go, hey, look, um, this is really hard for me to talk about, but I've been feeling unwell for a while. I'm pretty sad a lot. Um, you know, I don't feel like myself anymore. And the doctor might say, oh, okay, well, have you tried to um, take your life recently or, or harm yourself? And you might say, well, no, I've thought about it, but I haven't, I haven't done anything. And they might go, okay, well, you know, that's not too bad. That's kind of normal, you know, see how you go in the next six months. Then immediately you've asked for help. You've become vulnerable in that situation to share your truth and you've been disregarded. So immediately you can't access specialist mental health services because you can't access specialist mental health services. You can't access all these other NGOs because the referrals done by the specialist uh, mental health service providers. So if they can't refer you because the doctor didn't refer them, then you've got all these people who just, and fair enough, say the system is broken. No one listens to me. No one's actually helping me when I need it. So I'd like to see the DHB um, make better and more accessible pathways for people. Um, I would like to see, and this is pretty much our policy, is, is actually building community hubs and spaces for and it's like a i call it i i consider it like a no rond or policy really where you can go into a hub and say kia ora, hi my name's ben um i've you know been feeling pretty bad recently and um my my fiance just kicked me out of the house and i've got nowhere to go none of my friends will take me in and um you know, I, I don't feel safe going to the night shelter because of the drug use there. Um, and then hopefully in this community hub, they will be able to go, okay, there's a few issues here. Let's connect you with an NGO that um, does housing support. Let's connect you with someone who can discuss your relationship breakdown. Let's uh, put you in touch with someone that can maybe keep you busy in the meantime, you know, take up a hobby or something. So really looking at all these different community supports that you can have in place in the one spot that no matter how you refer basically just self-referral because we want to minimize those barriers they can just come in and find the assistance that they need you know do you have a gambling issue great we've got a service here that can help you you know are you drinking too much come and talk to this guy over here you know have you started using methamphetamine and you're finding that you can't control it anymore great you can come and deal with that here too so actually just having all those services together working as one. And I mean, this is what the mental health and addiction inquiry like calls for. This is what a person-centered approach is. We should be services working together to ensure that we have the person's needs at the center of how we work. So funding criteria has a big part to play in that. Um, you know, there's a lot of services doing a lot of good, but they need they need a lot of help there. Um, Deb says, it's great to see Mana Ake in schools, hoping this continues. Absolutely. One of the, um, well, one of my favorite things actually that has been implemented over the last couple of years is Mana Ake. So there's been, um, there were studies showing that uh, students in Canterbury were suffering um, post-earthquake with a lot of mental health issues and facing some um, post-traumatic stress. So the government actually put in place Manaake to help um, build resilience and offer support to children in schools. Um, very, very fantastic. And if I've got that wrong, please put me straight. But, um, you know, to be able to work with children in that way is harkening back to what we we're talking about with Matt, right? Like when people are acting out or, you know, using using drugs a lot or 
you know, engaging in crime a lot of the time. It's a, it's a cry for help from the inner child inside. So being able to address those traumas when they arise at a young age is super helpful. To be able to teach children uh, resilience as well is super helpful. She, the guest we're supposed to have on now, was going to talk about teaching these kinds of things in school, mental health and well-being. Uh, because once again, that's a really great preventative approach. We we spend a lot of time trying to build crisis, trying to put more beds in the hospitals and in the in the psychiatric institutions, so to speak. Um, and you know that's helpful, but we also need to look at the other side of the battle. You know, because and I've talked about this before. When if you've got two two little villages right on a river, and the river comes down here. And this, this village at the bottom of the river is always having to pull people out, you know, and they're doing a great job at pulling people out and saving lives and doing everything they need to do. Like, you know, they take off their wet clothes, they dry them down, they wrap a warm blanket around them, they look after them, they give them some food, you know, make sure everything's okay. That's our current health system with mental health, right? We're finding people at the bottom of the stream and we're doing whatever we can to help them. But... We need to we need to look at why they're falling in the stream in the first place. What's happening in that you know town up there? Are they throwing people in? Are people falling in because there's not adequate fencing? You know, is the bridge falling apart up upstream? You know, what like what is actually happening for all of these people to be continuously coming down the stream? And sure, we're doing our best to make sure we're looking after everybody that's fallen in the stream and come down river, but we need to actually go up to the other village and go, hey. What's going on here? How can we address this? How can we fix this? So it's really about continuing on how things are going with, with funding in terms of our psychotherapy units, but also looking at addressing those really core issues that are leading to people falling in the river in the first place. You know, What's leading to people becoming unwell? What social determinants are the drivers behind this? It's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, exactly, Jade. Thank you. Yeah, Tautoko, upstream solutions. Yeah, we really need to <clears throat> really need to take time to look at why things happen and how we can how we can address it. So I believe that those community hubs are really, really good option there. They build a sense of community, um, build a sense of identity for people to discover themselves and who they are, find their Tudanga Wai Wai. Um, <clears throat> you know. Every community would have their own say in what this would look like, which I think is really important in New Zealand as well. Because obviously we have, you know, people in Invercargill are very different to people in Auckland as a, as a very wide um, example. Also different tribes approach different solutions differently. So being able to have a, um, a true grassroots and culturally appropriate and community appropriate response in each community would be fantastic. I'd love to see a move to that model I think um, actually having been someone that's been involved with a lot of community groups and community action for the past five years is often that's where we see the true solutions first we see all the action happen from the community groups and the government's always five years later you know so when I started fill their lunchbox feeding kids who went to school without lunch did that with my own back with my friends and employees and stuff and you know, I always said, like, I don't want to be doing this forever. I want the government to kind of step in and help out where they need to. And that's just another example of things happen in the community before the government can really catch on and and get stuff done. Cool. So another question here. Do you see stigma on a daily basis around mental health and addiction, or is there a change coming? What courageous conversations can we have with others if we experience or hear this? Great question. Um, I think in my surroundings, I see a really powerful positive change in how we talk about mental health and well-being, and not just depression and anxiety, but other things as well. Um, and obviously, in my in my career, I see this. I think nationwide, community wide, we we probably still have some issues, um, and considering we still have a really high suicide rate. We, we must have some issues that that there is stigma there. Um, for years, we keep telling men to 
to talk up, you know, if you feel, if you don't feel good, talk up, tell somebody, you know, open up, be honest. But the problem I think is that we need to learn how to listen. We need to be able to provide space, not just for men, but for everybody and to truly know how to listen, how to be empathetic and not necessarily take the role of problem solver, which I've always been guilty of, um, but listener and being able to be compassionate and be there when someone really needs it, to be able to recognize when someone is feeling unwell and address them with really caring and um, driven questions, like actually trying to dig in and get them to open up. I know with men it can be really tricky, so I always suggest things like uh, going for a drive, or you know, you see it in barbershops all the time, um, or uh, maybe playing a game or something like a PlayStation game because you don't have that eye contact, so it's not quite so invasive. So it can be a bit easier, which is why like barbers and Uber drivers and stuff get a lot of really deep conversations because you're not face to face having a really personal conversation. You know, something else is going on around you. You can just kind of roughly address it. Um, you know, the, the stigma is a really, really punishing thing because, and we talked about this with Matt briefly, is, you know, if if people will forever be tarnished with the brush of their mental illness or their drug addiction or, um, or you know, their criminal history, things like that, if they're tarnished with that brush forever, there, there's no real incentive for them to grow and develop and change because... To them, they see the world neglecting them and failing to see the hard work that they've put in to get to where they are. So, and I saw that a lot at Odyssey House, like we need to actually back people, you know? Like this question here says, what courageous conversations can we have with others if we experience or hear stigma? I think the real courageous conversation is to be a public advocate of people who are trying to change. Because those people need our support. And if you turn your back on them because you think they're a meth addict or a former meth addict, why why would they change? Because you're actually part of the problem in encouraging them to give up on the world. They're trying really hard to re-engage and to get better and to do well in society. And you need to be courageous enough to, to front yourself and look at your... Um, your bias and your judgment about how you look at them and and see them for the growth that they have taken it doesn't mean in disregarding someone's crimes it just means actually seeing the growth they've made and honoring that and giving them the space to grow more instead of ridiculing them and pushing them back into the box you know so in terms of courageous conversations i think it's about really fronting up and supporting those that need it and giving them love and support Kia ora, Amber, the question here says, may sound like a ridiculous question, I haven't read it yet, but there's no ridiculous questions, but has anyone actually tried loosely costing how many billion might be needed to actually deal with mental health issues each year? I know it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string, but we might have a loose idea of the numbers of each type of mental illness and how much on average it takes money-wise to get each person back to wellness. Um, I'm not sure if there has been a cost-benefit analysis done um, or a business case for it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not much of a numbers guy. Sorry, Amber, but I'm sure I could take it to somebody who is because it would be a really interesting conversation. Um, what we do know, though, is that treating addiction and the the underlying traumas and mental health issues that lead to addiction that often lead to crime is significantly cheaper and better for our economy and people to actually help them out with going to rehabilitation instead of prison. It costs us $100,000 a year to house somebody in prison. <clears throat> so there's been two drug courts that have been trialed in New Zealand, in Auckland and Waitakere, where it's looking at sentencing um, drug offenders to rehabilitation instead of prison. Um, I personally really back that model. I think it's good to address the core issues right because if we just send people to prison 
for drug related offenses, they're just going to come out and probably do the same thing again. You know, there are programs where some people come out of jail um, and part of their parole release is that they go to a rehabilitation service. But it'd be nice to see that be the core thing rather than the conditional parole thing. So although I don't know if there has been a business case made in terms of money per mental illness solved, but <clears throat> yeah, what we do know is that rehabilitation is far better than prison. You know, we have one of the highest incarceration rates in the OECD. Um, <clears throat> it's incredibly, incredibly high. And and it's not actually giving us any, any fruitful results. We're seeing a lot of... <clears throat> um, committing crimes, reoffending when people get out. We see a lot of people um, still, you know, taking drugs. A lot of people that go to that go to prison for smaller drug offenses kind of come out and get involved in harder drugs. So we really need to reassess um, what money is best spent on. So although we don't have a business case, Actually, we can, though, look now and go, this is where we should be putting money in rehabilitation. We should be putting money in community supports into community-led initiatives and NGOs. So all of those people working together to create a better support network for every individual. Every individual has different needs. So I don't know why we keep driving home this whole, like, this is the one solution for everybody because there's no such thing. You know, we actually need to look at all the different things that contribute to each individual person's mental wellness and then address their issues. You know, everyone's different, so we really need to, to take that on board. Question here. Are there any ideal models of support or treatment overseas that you feel may work here? Um, not super knowledgeable on that, but I have followed loosely what's happened in Portugal so really that's actually um, a drug re drug reform where they they had really really bad issues with drug abuse in in Portugal and in 2001 they <clears throat> they basically reformed their drug laws where drug use was treated as a health issue and not a criminal one and what we've actually seen from that is a decrease in drug-related deaths, a decrease in drug-related crime, and an overall decrease in drug use. And I'm not just talking about cannabis, I'm talking about every drug. I know Kiwis in New, New Zealand here freak out at that, the idea that we might, that that you could decriminalize something like heroin or, um, or methamphetamine, which is a huge problem here in Aotearoa. But from the evidence we've seen from that model, um, you know, not making it a crime and treating people in a health-related model has actually transformed drug abuse in their country. So I'm always looking for the best health response rather than the best punitive or criminal response. I don't think, um, you know, like... <laughs> You ever like talk to a kid about going to jail and why people go to jail? And, you know, someone was telling me about this the other day and, and this kid was like, oh, you know, but, you know, do they get fixed in jail? And the person was like, well, no, no, they don't get fixed in jail. Well, why do, why do we send them to jail? Oh, it's for punishment, so they don't do it again. Okay, but when they get out of jail, do they do it again? Uh, yeah, most of the time. Okay, so why don't you just leave them in jail? Oh, well... Because it doesn't really fix them, we can't leave them in jail forever. So, you know, even young kids can see how silly it is to throw people in jail and think that that solves any, any of our major issues in society. Like, we've been doing this for how many decades and it's not working. So, I would love to see a shift in that direction. Um, I'm not sure um, if New Zealand's ready for that as a whole, considering we're still... Um, really stuck in the discussion around legalizing marijuana but i think just being able to treat things as a health issue is really really important cool thank you for all the great questions team um i still haven't heard from our 11 o'clock person um so we'll just keep going i already had a had an hour period there so we've got an hour and a half so 
I might actually have a quick chat about my job. So I was actually talking about this before when I was on mute, so I've already told a whole story on this to no one. Um, so I am a mental health and addiction support worker and a housing facilitator. So what's that? It's a pretty unique job. Not many people in the country have my job. Um, it means that I work with clients with mental health or addiction issues um, that are usually more often than not facing homelessness. So I don't work with street homeless. I work with people who are incidentally homeless. So they may have uh, been kicked out of their home, like during a relationship breakdown, which we've seen a lot post COVID might be sleeping in cars, you know, just recently gone to sleeping in the park, sleeping in a damp garage, um, just got out of prison, just got out of rehab, just been bouncing in between uh, respite services. So a lot of people in, in that situation. My job, my job is to support them into finding long-term and sustainable housing. Um, a lot of the time in New Zealand, when we, when we talk about mental illness, the conversation is assumed that um, the conversation is assumed to be um, solely about depression or anxiety. But the thing is, is that mental illness is more than just depression and anxiety. There's depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, you know, uh, bipolar, type 1, type 2, schizoaffective disorder, paranoid schizophrenic, psychosis. You know, there's lots of different mental illness and lots of different ways that it can affect people. So we work with a wide range of people that usually have comorbidities. So we, we find often people with that come from having an addiction, whether it's an opiate addiction or a methamphetamine addiction, or they're an alcoholic, they often have a comorbidity, comorbidity of post-traumatic stress disorder or other mental illness issues as well. So it's about trying to find housing for them. And it's really tough at the moment because housing is very expensive, very, very expensive. And if you're on the benefit job seeker, you get 250 after tax, and you might get $105 in Canterbury here for accommodation supplements. You get $355, give or take. If you have, if you're paranoid schizophrenic and you can't live with anyone else, especially strangers, you can't go flatting. You can't go onto a room share option. So you need a single bedroom household. To find one of those in Canterbury, it's around $250 a week, absolute minimum. And it's usually a, excuse my French, but a shithole. So we're essentially asking these people that are struggling with mental illness that can't live with others because of their mental illness, that they should be paying five sevenths of their income to live in a house that's often not even really suitable. It's a super challenging thing because back in the day, social housing was a little more accessible. Social housing wait list now is around eight months, according to the um, June public housing quarterly report by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. There's 18 and a half thousand people on that report on the social housing wait list. Uh, there was a news article last week saying it's around 19 and a half thousand now. By the time the next report comes out, it'll probably be around 21,000. And the thing is, is that we, we are finding it so difficult to house people with mental illness. And mental illness can be genetic or hereditary, but it's also, it's also determined, uh, determined by social determinants. So things like poor living conditions, living in poverty, having um, bad family relationships, uh, feeling isolated, all these different things can combined or, or isolated give you a mental illness uh, or lead to you experiencing mental unwellness. So it's like the cycle of people living in shit situations so they become unwell. Because they're unwell, 
we can't really get them into a good living situation. So there's some real big issues there and it causes um, me great upset to, to like try and find solutions for how people can be housed and live in good housing and long, long-term sustainable housing for their own well-being and for the well-being of their families. I do love my job though. It's a, um, it's a very, very interesting job. I get to meet lots of different people between the ages of, you know, 18 to 65, um, many different cultural backgrounds, um, many different life experiences. Obviously I won't talk about any, um, because of privacy. Um, but it's it's a really powerful job i absolutely love it um getting to help people on a grassroots level and to get to know them and find a tailored individualized solution for them is really really good um i hate the word bespoke and i hate everyone that uses it but in a way that's what we do we're like bespoke problem solvers because everyone you meet doesn't fit a tidy little box that you go oh, here's this XYZ mental health support you need and then you're fine. Everyone has their own unique circumstances, their own unique traumas, their own unique um, illness and presentation of illness that, um, you know, it's it's a very interesting way to engage with people and, and to try and tangibly help them. Um <laughs> Rachel, we need to figure out how to clone Ben. I think that's a terrible idea. Um, cool, we've got a question here from Jade. Can you discuss your views on how we can better support personality disorders that seems to me more that seems to be more prevalent in service presentations but do not fit within current mental health models? How can we better address systemic gaps for those who continue to fall through and get lost? Good question. Um, I assume you're probably referencing borderline personality disorder as one. Um, for those who aren't aware, borderline personality disorder presents differently in everybody, but common, uh, commonly in New Zealand, we see it with younger women more prevalently. And a key indicator that someone has borderline personality disorder is quite bad depression and anxiety often a lot of self-harm and also you see a lot of um, sabotaging of personal relationships and situations none of this is deliberate this is a part of their unwellness and and how they're feeling uh, it's really tough to see the solution for people with borderline personality disorder in the current system so obviously i work adjacent to the system i'm not in the system but, and again, I'm no clinician, but often people with borderline personality disorder aren't given any real hope in terms of help. The, and I could be wrong, but I'm pretty, pretty sure the current model that works down here is that people with borderline personality disorder are offered talking therapy. And that's the best way to help that um, at present. Um, I'm not sure if there's been any significant studies done here to to develop a alternative to that but it has shown that through talking therapy in time and often as people get older that borderline personality disorder becomes less um what's the word i'm looking for invasive in terms of how it um takes over you and can can really damage those relationships you have around you um it's a really tough tough illness actually borderline personality disorder um, and it presents differently in everybody so often i see it in ways that people will use drug abuse and sexual relations to sabotage and um, upend their, their current situation but you can actually have people who present totally differently and will maybe sabotage their living situations uh, without drugs and alcohol um, and those typical things we might come to know as borderline personality disorder and that shows me that borderline personality disorder and mental illness in general presents differently through everybody everybody 
is a bit different and their mental illness can often present differently. So once again, I'll probably say it a thousand times today, it's about finding those individualized supports for people. But yeah, Jay, to, to really dig into that question there, um, I think there there has, from what I've seen in my own anecdotal experience, almost a disregard for people with BPD and letting them fall through the gaps. So to address those systemic gaps, it's again creating those community models where people can have barrierless access to the supports that they need because currently you know if you've got bpd you're probably going to struggle to actually get to the right service you need for your own individualized response so kyoto really good question i hadn't talked about bpd yet today um, and of course there's other personality disorders as well um, so thank you jade really really great question um, amber who do you actually work for ben I work for Comcare Trust. We're only located here in Christchurch. We are an NGO, a non-government organization, uh, but we are funded by government entities. Um, we have many different teams under our umbrella from peer support to community support workers, job support, housing support, um, community housing, um, active links, which is like um, physical health and healthy eating. So we've got lots of different things all under the one roof. Um, awesome team, treated really well there. I love my job. It's very, very cool. A uh, question from Josiah. If there was one change you could make tomorrow in Parliament to most help people with mental health issues and prevention of suicide, if money was no object, what would it be? Your one instant change. Whew. Great question. Immediately, the one thing I would do would be establishing community-led initiative hubs in every single suburb everywhere. So, because one thing we're seeing for a lot of isolated communities is that they can't access the services they need. One thing we're seeing currently is that people can't access the services they need because there's a referral pathway and they, they can't oversee that. So actually just being able to walk into uh, a hub of different services would be it be one big building with a bunch of different like offices or rooms or stalls or whatever but just being able to walk in go to the desk and go hi i'm xyz and i'm dealing with xyz you know can you please help me and being able to just access a service like that so the whole point of that is to address feeling unwell before it overcomes you before you are facing crisis because new zealand's really really bad at this we especially us men we wait till we get to crisis point and then we call the crisis hotline or we call our doctor and we don't feel that anyone's doing enough because we're, we're in crisis it's too late we need we need all that help right away so actually trying to bring it back to being able to access help well not necessarily even help but just community supports it could just be even sports groups or hobbies, art classes, night classes, different different things are involved to in, in a community hub. So having all of these different things available in each one in each suburb or each community would be different. That means you can access help as soon as you need it would be amazing. I think that would do a massive change for New Zealand in terms of prevention of mental health issues in general and especially prevention of suicide. It's not waiting to crisis, but actually preventative models that are gonna that are gonna save our people. So that would be a one thing I would fight tooth and nail for to change. Um, I think that would change how New Zealand sees mental illness in general. Kia ora, Marianne. Thanks for having fun. Nice, nice of you to drop in. Cool, so we've got half an hour until our next guest. So, um, you know, feel free to keep throwing questions at me. We've been going now for almost three hours. That's awesome. Um, we've got about eight hours to go. Um, today is the final day of Mental Health Awareness Week, September 27th. So we are doing a 654 minute live stream to honor the 654 lives New Zealand lost to suicide in the last year. 
it's about today's about really listening to a lot of different people we've had three incredible guests on already this morning with matt raf and amanda who have uh, shared their own unique perspectives and experiences with us and for those who who missed that um, at the end of this live stream it will be available to go back and watch so those those first three were really incredible we've got another 12 or so guests today um, so it won't be me all day we will have some interesting people on here but the whole thing I really want to get across with today is, is about listening to people and hearing their perspective from their their lens and especially on behalf of some of the communities that they represent so please um you know these phone numbers on the side here um if you need any of these write them down if you have any questions about any of them i can let you know or i can google them if i'm not too familiar with them but um there's a lot of services available in New Zealand, but we often don't know how to how to engage with them. You know, we don't know the best way to go about that. So those are there for you all. Question here from Amber. Um, absolutely. Also, Ben, do you know what, if anything, the government are doing to build professional capacity? Cool. So I know on a on a small level in terms of mental health and addiction support under the trades um, apprenticeship thing they launched in July, uh, mental health and addiction support in terms of community support and uh, also for disability support, I believe, was um, covered under that deal. So now workplaces can take people on in a learn on the job apprenticeship model to to actually become support workers i know in new zealand we have a really big shortage of counselors and also um, support workers in general um, and youth counselors uh, we have a, a great deficit and so there there is support to get people engaged in this um, the, the ones available are just a level four and a level five, I believe. Um, so you can take those on and do that and work in the field that I work in or as a community support worker or uh, with a lot of government bodies or NGOs and you can do that support. You can also um, study a Bachelor of Social Work or of Counseling as well. But um, yeah, to... To get people in and really build that professional capacity, the government has opened that up. Um, I'd kind of like to like to see it stretch out a little bit more to the Bachelor of Social Work, which would be cool. But um, as it stands, just with the level four, and level five, that's that's quite good to help build professional capacity. Thanks, Dev. Thanks for hanging in here. Been lots of really good questions today, team. Really enjoying them. Really good to have everybody here. So if you have any more, just fire them away. Um, so our next speaker is due in at 12.30. They are actually not just one person. It's a university group um, called Lads Without Labels. They um, contacted me a few months ago to be a guest speaker at a, um, at a little event that they had. Um, so they, they run a group about mental health awareness for men at the university here in Canterbury. And they're all really nice guys. So I went along to the event and spoke there um, and was able to connect with them. And they have this week actually implemented a uh, like a spin-off of Project 71, which was something that my friend Stuart and I founded early last year, uh, which was basically we set up a gazebo in the city centre and we sat there for 71 hours over six days to talk with men about how they were feeling and provide resources and stuff for people to um, find pathways to access services. Um, so they, they launched Project 72 this week, which is really fun. I dropped in really briefly to see them on Wednesday and they, um, yeah, they had a gazebo there and heaps of bean bags and people playing guitar and people doing some painting. And it was all uh, very reminiscent of the OG Project 71. Um, and really cool to see that taking off in another another way because when we started Project 71 
we actually said to people like, we don't care if you steal our model, steal our model, implement it across the country. We think it'd be great to see this happen. Um, so someone picked it up. So I think that could grow some legs and move and do well. So those guys are dropping in. So there's a note here saying it's really important for those supporting a mate or loved one through mental illness to take care of themselves as well. They couldn't totoko that enough. So this friend said to me once, because I had used to have this problem of trying to fix everybody before I, before I got involved in my job, before I do, did anything really community focused, I, it's, it's often a, like a masculine thing to, to try and, and I'm a really avid problem solver. Um, it's something I love to do. And so I would often find myself in shitty situations or bad relationships, trying to fix things that I shouldn't have. And one of my best friends said to me, don't set yourself on fire to keep somebody else warm. And nothing else has stuck with me more than that in my life in terms of advice. It really made me look at how I acted to help other people. You know, was I, was I helping them to help myself? Was I sacrificing my own personal well-being to help them? So it really made me take stock of myself each time I found myself in the space of trying to help somebody which is why I've talked today about being able to listen um how's that is that better lagging a bit um so yeah actually being able to listen to people um one second Um, yeah, so actually being able to listen to people and not spend too much effort to keep someone else warm, you know, don't set yourself on fire to keep someone else warm. It's like, don't destroy your essence and who you are to give someone just a little bit of comfort. You'll always hear, um, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup and things like that. So it's really important that if you're in the space that you're helping a friend or a family member that you are really looking after yourself too giving yourself alone time, giving yourself time to talk to somebody else. When we organized Project 71, something we put in place immediately was a counselor for us to talk to if we needed it. Now, we could check in with every day if we wanted to, because sometimes we don't realize that things are having an effect on us. And being able to um, touch base with people and talk about how you're feeling on a regular basis it's much better than letting things get to crisis point so making sure that you're looking after yourself um you know eating eating healthy being active doing a whole bunch of stuff um you know make sure you're okay if if you're not okay and someone needs to talk to you the best thing you can actually say is like hey look I'm not doing so well at the moment, but I can help take you to somebody who, who does. So, you know, that might be going to someone, going with someone to the doctors. So sitting in the waiting room with them while they go and talk to the doctor and just actually being there to kind of hold their hand in a way, metaphorically, to get that support rather than put yourself in a situation where you're going to burn yourself out and not actually, because if you do that, you can't offer the right support that's needed anyways. So. Yeah, make sure you're looking after yourself. I hope that lags a little better. Um, cool. So, got a got something here from Joel. From a professional perspective, I'm a fully qualified counsellor. Nice, thank you. That's awesome. Had a had a practice for years and left the industry after five years for a few reasons. One was because the industry and country is quite immature when it comes to understanding mental health as a sustainable business and doesn't understand what's required to run a sustainable practice. I simply couldn't find enough money to support myself and my family despite being in high demand, and my wife also works. Third party funding is very helpful when it's there, but also the public need to have a different attitude towards servicing their minds as they would towards servicing their cars. Not all could afford services though, so there 
does need to be more third party funding well before the edge of the cliff, let alone the bottom. Absolutely, Joel. Um, awesome to hear that from someone that is fully qualified and has been doing this for years. I couldn't agree more. Um, and that's what we're talking about really is about actually having access to to the needs and your own mental well-being through, throughout. Um, because at the end of the day, it is like you said, like someone servicing their car. You know, if you don't keep up with servicing and looking after yourself, then it's going to fall apart. It's going to cost you more. It's going to cost the country more. It's going to impact your your own well-being significantly more. Um, so yeah, definitely that whole um, servicing your servicing your mind like you're servicing your car is very very true. A very good perspective to pass on to us. Thank you, Joel. Okay, so I'm aware there might be a bit of a issue with the video, some bandwidth issues maybe. Um, no one's here watching Netflix or anything, but it might just be lagging for a bit. But as long as everyone can hear me, that's okay. Okay, I'm just going to actually take a quick minute just to set up Zoom for our next guest. So bear with me, Fano. All right, kia ora everybody, back again. Just getting Zoom ready for our next guest, which will be in about 20 minutes. I heard it was supposed to be a big storm today, but looking out my windows, it's actually looking really beautiful. I was thinking I'd have a, a day inside where um, everything would be horrible out, but it's looking really good.
bear with me just working out some technical stuff uh, my man Josiah has been awesome to um, help teach me how to run a live stream like this and um, and he's also helping me when any issues arise today like the couple that we've had so kia ora to Josiah the man the man helping us out Yeah, actually, um, just touching back on the question before that there was around um, funding and like what we'd like to see the DHB do alongside um, other community groups as well is that there's been a lot of discussion in Christchurch about uh, cutting funding to the DHB. Um, a big concern I've had there is around... Um, funding going to NGOs and NGOs that deal with mental health so there's been a significant um, funding slashes to be made so I'm really hoping that those in the mental health industry are able to continue going on fort without being significantly impacted yep mm. Cool. So once again, just fire me any questions as you have them. Cool, so just want to talk a little bit about some of the other guests we've got coming on today. Been uh, really lucky actually when I put the word out that we were going to do this, that so many people jumped at the opportunity to come and share their perspective. So after our lunch break, we've got Tatiana who's going to talk to us about uh, mental health for women in Aotearoa, for Wahine. Uh, then we've got James Brody, who um, is a musician who lives up north, um, and he is autistic, so he's going to give us a bit of insight about how that impacts his mental health and how he um, deals with things, and he's just done some treatment himself, so that'll be really awesome to hear his perspective as well. Uh, we've also got Becky coming on, who works with elderly and patient mental health. So we'll be able to hear about how elderly people deal with things like isolation and um, feeling burdensome, which is quite an issue actually here in New Zealand. Then we've got John coming on. He's a board member for board member for Top, and he's going to be um, discussing his perspective as a GP. So you know what happens when people go to the doctor. Um, and ask for help you know so it'll be nice to hear from him and his suggestions maybe about how people can engage their doctors to get better better service we have Andrew uh, who is a top candidate from up north and he's going to be discussing his lived experience with us so that will be good too we've got Ben Claridge who's going to talk about um his experience as a parent of a child who lost his mother to suicide, how he's gone about that discussion with his child and um, and how they, they operate in a loving manner. So that'll be a really, really good conversation for a lot of people to hear. Then we have Jennifer Shields from Qtopia in. She's going to um, give us a bit of um, perspective on um, mental health in the rainbow community especially with our youth so Qtopia work with um, the youth rainbow community here in Canterbury and um, we've got Jake Keanu Skinner dropping in he's a good friend of mine um, the man love that guy to bits he's really good at um, you know almost similar to Matt Brown earlier this morning really addressing those core core things and digging into digging into addressing your trauma and and healing and recognizing your own behaviors and we've got Jeff Simmons the leader of top he's going to give us his story um, of lived experience at 6 p.m. 
Then we've got Stu, who used to run Project 71 with me. Um, that's going to be a real good chat. Um, that was a, a life-changing thing that him and I undertook together to to sit with with people for 71 hours. It was, it was 13 hours a day and then six hours on the last day. Um, it was crazy. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely wild. But I'll leave that chat for when he's here. Um, then we've got Joel, who's our candidate for Southland, who's going to drop in at seven. He's our last guest speaker tonight. Um, and he's going to be talking about um, his mum, how he lost to suicide. So we've got some really touching conversations to have today. And we've got some important perspectives to hear from people of different communities, which is the one thing I really want to push today is trying to understand that everybody's different and being open to listening to different perspectives and how, how we can work together to help people. And then for the last 20, 25 minutes, we're just going to have a bit of a wrap up, chat about the day, some last minute questions and what we can do moving forward. So kia ora everybody that's dropped in so far, kia ora to everybody that's dropping in right now. We're doing 654 minutes live stream today for mental health awareness. We are currently 197 minutes through, so still a few hundred minutes to go. How's everyone doing? I'm feeling all right. I've got a bit of a horsey throat already just from talking so much because we missed a guest. Um, so I've been up in yapping since 11 o'clock. So looking forward to our next guest so I can um, have a bit of water and, and listen a bit more because listening's, listening's really cool. Um, if anyone feels comfortable um, to share their experiences and be vulnerable in the comments um, I told Toko there if you if you wish to um, reach out um, we're here to, to listen to you as well so the the comments aren't just for questions for me or our guests they're also for you to talk with other people as well so Make sure you're engaging with us and others. That's what we're here for today. That's what this week's been about. It's about finding ways for us to work together as people and as a community and to help support people that we care about. Just checking for questions. I don't want to miss anybody out when they've got good questions. So these are all services that you can access nationwide. Um, they are all free phone numbers, free text numbers um, to limit barriers that people may face to access them. Something I think is really important to, to actually point out when you're accessing services or maybe talking to a counsellor is that we all interact with each other differently and talking with a counsellor or someone about your mental health is the same. So let's say you may call one support service and you might feel that they didn't listen to you, they didn't provide you the adequate support you needed, and you might feel that you've been let down. I would implore that you take the time to try another one or another two and really try and find something that connects with you. Well, one number one time and you get someone who's fantastic and then you call them another time and you get someone else and you don't really vibe with them that's okay try calling back another time try calling another number everybody interacts differently with other people like i say often at work with my clients i haven't had anyone drop me yet but i say to them if you if you feel like we don't work together you're more than welcome to ask for a different worker and it's the same with these kind of services if you um, if you actually engage through a doctor and and go to go to a counselor, 
you might find the same thing there. You might go to the council for your first session and be like, wow, this is not for me. You know, for me, I'm not much of a mindfulness practitioner. I'm more of a pragmatic talk about the issues person. That's just me. I know everybody's different. So if I were to be referred to a mindfulness counselor, I would listen, I'd take it on board. I I put it in my toolkit, but I probably won't use it too much. But that's just that's just because of who I am as a person. Um, but I would definitely dig in a lot better to someone who would give me really pragmatic let's talk about the issues, let's go through those, what are the, how are those making you feel, um, and really getting into that kind of level of support. Um, so yeah, you might find that you get sent to a counsellor that you just don't really work with. So you, it's well within your rights to ask for a different counsellor and to try and find the best support for you. So same with all these numbers here, over on the side, that way. Um, you know, not all of these will work for you all the time, but one of them will most of the time. So please just jot them all down, take a screenshot so you've got these. Actually, there was something launched just the other day, just the other day called, let me find it, findahelpline.com, okay? So I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to type that up right now if I can, um, and put that on the screen. Um, actually, there's a bit beyond me at the moment. Um, so findahelpline.com, you basically enter your country and then click what you're looking for, and it will um, provide a whole bunch of numbers for you to call. Pretty much like if you click depression, I'll give you all of these ones. But you can actually get lots of different um, supports for you and so you can use that anywhere in New Zealand anywhere across the world find a helpline.com so you can always check in there if you need anything I will put a link in the comments later for people so if not now um, yeah which is really cool that's really great great for people to access um, I'm just going to pop that in the comments so everybody can just find that Great, it's in the comments, everyone can find that now. Awesome, so our next guest will be in in a few minutes. I think we've got Sam from Lads Without Labels. Um, yeah, I'm gonna let him introduce himself, but very, very glad to have them on board. So I'm just gonna take a quick minute to grab some water and then I'll be back. Kia ora everybody. 
um, hot tip if you are wanting to watch this but use your phone for other things you can if you've got a Chromecast you can just boost this to the TV and then you can actually use your phone and then you can actually use your phone so you don't actually have to just sit on constantly cool mm -hmm. Oh, we've got a really good question here from Stephen. Uh, he says, lost a friend. He checked himself into the hospital. After a year, he was in and out. To lose him was devastating because we thought he was getting help. Among the close friends, we still struggle with the reasons and what more we could have done. I guess my question is, I haven't been able to relate to the advice I often hear. For example, it's okay to not be okay. What advice would you give about the balance between intervention telling your friend that you want to help and giving space to the professionals to do their work. Um, first of all, I'm really sorry to hear that, Stephen. Um, uh, it's really, really challenging to lose, lose a loved one, um, <clears throat> especially a friend. Um, the balance, right? Okay, so professionals should be giving space for Fano and for friends who are Fano as well to really be a part of the person's recovery if that person wishes to. There can be tricky things when it comes to privacy. So in my job, unless somebody tells me, gives me express consent to talk to somebody, I can't talk to them. Um, but say if I was working with someone and said, hey, my friend so-and-so, you know, I want you to be able to talk with them, then I could share information with them, specific information. Um, but no matter what the professionals are doing, you can you can be involved in your friend's recovery um, or their journey if they wish you to be. Some people don't. Um, and when those people don't, you've just kind of got to give them the space that they, they're requesting. Um, but, you know, when, when you say that you're struggling with the advice, like when people say, you know, it's okay to not be okay, um, what I would suggest is um, for yourself, Stephen, is to, to reach out when you can and if you can, contact some services to kind of talk that through. Um, losing someone can be quite a weight, especially it's, if it's your friend and often you think, you know, maybe I could have done something differently. Um, you know, at the end of the day, everyone could have, but would that change the outcome? We don't know. Um, but I would suggest that you, um, I'll pop the numbers up here that, um, you can maybe take a look at some of these and one of them might be, might be helpful for you, but yeah, keep speaking. Thanks for telling us that and being vulnerable about that, Stephen. I'm really sorry that that's happened. Um, but yeah, definitely reach out, talk to your friends as well. Talk to your friends because chances are they're probably feeling very similar to you. And um, you can find community and shared shared grief and, and find a way to work through that together with your friends. Um, I've lost friends to suicide and I lost one of my best friends in the earthquake. Um, and especially with the my friend I lost in the earthquake, being able to share our experience as friends together to, to move through that was the only thing that got me through it in the end. So yeah, kia ora Stephen, thank you for that question. Our next guest has arrived. Let's see how we go. Kia ora, Sam. How are you doing? Hey, Ben. Good, thanks. How are you going? Yeah, awesome, mate. I'm just going to send you in. So we're live, just like that. Oh. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming along. So um, Sam is from Lads Without Labels, a University of Canterbury group for... Um, mental health awareness specifically with with blokes but um, from my understanding they're they're kind of really a good face of mental health on campus in general so Sam I'm going to leave this up to you to 
um, introduce yourself, your own personal background, and and lads without labels, what you guys do, what you do, why why you're doing it, and uh, feel free to dig into your own personal experience as much or as little as you feel comfortable. Awesome, thanks, man. Um, I suppose I'll just start with saying, um, my name's Sam. I'm currently a fifth year student at UC, so I study law here. Lived in Christchurch pretty much my whole life, with an exception of about five years. I lived in Wellington. Uh, we moved up there for my dad's job, but we've come back down here. And I've always considered Christchurch home, and I've loved being back here, and I've loved spending my time at UC. Um, we started Lads Without Labels around the end of last year. It was sort of a time when I was kind of reflecting on my time at university because I knew it would be my final year this year. And I was sort of thinking to myself, well, there's a lot of clubs that have popped up in recent years, um, really advancing a lot of women in engineering. And they were doing these really, really awesome stuff. And they're really, really improving the well-being for women on campus in specific subject areas. But at this same time, I would look back and I would see the suicide rates for men. They would keep climbing up and up and up. And the mental health issue that men face in New Zealand, it's been something that's been highly documented for a really long time. So I kind of looked back and I thought to myself, well, why isn't there a club like that for blokes? So I had a chat to my mate, Jack Whittam, who's on the UCSA. And he sort of agreed that he thought it would be quite a good idea or something that we could put into plan. And that's kind of where we got started is that we, I sort of met with him and I met with my friend Isaac and we set out to get a bunch of like-minded students from all different areas on campus. So we have students from, that are studying engineering, we have students studying science, we have students studying fine arts. It's not just confined to one sort of subject area, but we all have this sort of like-minded goal or this shared concern about men's mental health. So what we did was we sort of wanted to start the club this year based around the based around sort of the intention to start having some more conversations around mental health and just to break the stigma on campus a little bit more and sort of encouraging people that it is okay to talk and that you should open up to your mates a bit more and that it's okay not to be okay. And our, our tagline has this year has been, we all have men we care about and that's sort of trying to encourage everyone to sort of come along and join up to the club because we might have received a little bit of pushback at the start or just a little bit of concern from some people going, oh, is this just a men's club? Can women join it as well? And we made it very clear from the very beginning that this isn't a club exclusively for one sort of gender identification. It's always been a club for everyone, but a club that we all have the shared concern that men's mental health in New Zealand, it's, it's currently really not where it should be. And so we really need to start taking steps now to try and improve it because the suicide rates, I, I think it's for men under 30 and men over 50, it's the highest in the developed world, I think, in New Zealand. Is that right, Ben? Yeah, it's. Uh, I know last year it was. I'm not sure this year, but that's just because I haven't checked yet. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if the statistics have come out yet fully. They, might be, they usually come out around this time, but I was thinking with UC, if we can start having these conversations now and start sort of building really good strategies and building mindsets with people our own age, then that's going to feed into the next generation of people because as we get older, we'll become more mature and have to deal with it a lot better. And also when we have children or when we see the new generation coming out after us, we can impart that onto them as well. So it's not just about encouraging more conversations or breaking the stigma a little bit. It's, it's also about sort of trying to sort of change the way we as New Zealanders approach mental health for men. Nice. Awesome. Um, so what has the engagement been like with people at university? Um, our engagement this year, it's been really positive. We had about, in terms of clubs day, we, we had about 500 students come and sign up to us on campus, which I was told is the most of any first year club at UC in club history, which was really, really awesome. And We've also managed to be, despite COVID, put on uh, two or three or four events throughout the year. So we had um, Ed Dool Sutherland, who came in from um, the, an organisation called Umbrella, based up in Auckland. He came down and spoke to a group of us um, just before lockdown happened, and he was sort of teaching us about 
how to identify if your mates are struggling or just how to try and be there for them better. And of course, Ben, we had you come in uh, during term three once lockdown had lifted and that resonated with a lot of our exec and your your um, event Project 71, which you did a couple of years ago when you spoke about it, it actually um, ignited our interest and we actually took inspiration of it and did, uh, we called it Project 72. Um, that just happened just this week during Mental Health Awareness Week when we added a space on the main lawn at university and just set up a space where there wasn't always something particularly happening, but we created a space for people to come down and chill out during the day. We just sort of created a space where people could just relax and take time out of their day. We had about we had about five or six collaborators on it across the two days, which was really so the engagement this year has been, I'm really proud of the year we've had despite COVID. Um, it hasn't been a typical first year, I suppose first year clubs, it's, but it's definitely been a very good uh, year. That's been a, been a good proof of concept yet. See that, you know, the engagement is what we hoped it would be and that there is actually a market for this. Um, there was also another club this year called Women's Wellbeing that started up and they did some amazing stuff as well. And we're quite excited. We're going to be collaborating with them next week on a seminar, which is based around um, reflecting on the year as a whole and what it's taught us about um, how to look after our mates better. So in terms of engagement, I couldn't be happier with the level of engagement we've had. Kia ora, that's awesome. Do you reckon um, now that you've had the experience of creating a physical space for people to come and engage or, or just relax and and you know connect with other people do you think now you've taken away something from that that you can look at building a space that's not necessarily physical but like online or in the way that you can interact with people over the phone and things like that do you think you've maybe taken away just a bit of aspect of that yeah it's funny i was talking about it with my mate last night and she really enjoyed coming down to it. She came down to it about two or three times throughout the Wednesday. And what she liked about it was that she kind of likened it to sort of when you were at high school, everyone would just sort of hang out in this one general area and there wouldn't be necessarily like a reason for you to have to go there. But it was just a place where everyone would go and sort of meet up. And I really liked that comparison of the event because it was kind of exactly what we were going for. It's like just like this environment that anyone could sort of show up for and in terms of translating that to online, I think what we could do from here is sort of our, our main hub is essentially our Facebook page. But if we could build that up a lot more to be a space where anyone could be comfortable to, if they could, if we could maybe put some things up online there that help people, I don't know, take something away from it and learn about how to reach out to their mates a bit better. That's probably what I think our next step for social media would probably be. Nice. That's awesome. Do you know, um, well, you will know, do you think you could kind of enlighten us a bit about like significant and unique, potentially unique experiences that uh, university students face that maybe the wider community aren't really aware of? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, this year it's, it's been a very interesting one eh? because I don't think any student has expressed a sort of a year like four in terms of lockdown where we essentially got shut our own flats or our houses away from all of our friends and we essentially had to do it in half of the year by ourselves. So I think it was a very interesting experience for us in terms of we were kind of, the term isolation, the government used it, it was actually quite an apt way to describe it because when you're a student, you're almost on campus. You're on campus. Essentially, and you're always seeing your mates and you're always going out for a coffee and you might go grab a beer. And you're always, this year, we essentially got cut off from our main sort of support circles, which is our friend. While everyone did that, we also had universities but on top of that as well. We still had to meet deadlines, which were at times were a bit uncertain. We also had um, we were also looking at the universities and we saw that universities like Auckland and Otago, they were getting 5% um, increases to their growth. Saving that. So there was a lot of students that during lockdown, while we had this period of essentially being alone and away from our families and our friends and also having deadlines and having uncertain around employment, we were also looking at it and it's kind of 
it was I think it was this growing attitude throughout lockdown that UC students weren't being valued to the same extent that other university students were because we didn't receive that sort of increase. But ultimately, the university did come through and did implement a policy which um, was similar to it. But I think for students this year, it's just been a very interesting year. Of, we've essentially had to navigate um, our own sort of independence without anyone else around us because we have been locked in our homes. We have been sort of, a lot of us, if you have jobs with lockdown, a lot of people might have lost their jobs. Uh, a lot of people probably had a lot of uncertainty around paying things like rent and power. So I think for students, it was a very interesting time when we were sort of, it was this brand new experience where we were on our own for a fair amount of the time and we didn't really know what to do. And I obviously, I can't speak for every student that you see, but for me personally, it was it was a very interesting time because my parents were over at our, over in Australia. My brother is over in Europe. So while I had my aunt and uncle, I was essentially by myself and it was my first year. So for me, it was essentially my first real time where I was by myself fending for myself. And um, well, I, I got diagnosed with depression when I was about 17 years old. And it sounds very silly, but the isolation aspect, it, 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 it kind of came a bit easier to me than I think for this because I was, I was used to that feeling and I knew how to manage it. But I know for a lot of students, this feeling of, being myself was, was it was a completely new experience. I'm not sure if it's been properly addressed by some. Sorry, mate, I'm just losing you. Yeah, sorry. Um, the catch. All of that, or did you want to repeat some of that? Lost the last twenty seconds. So, um, you were, oh, you were talking about essentially, yeah, able to. Um, you were familiar with the isolation. Yeah. So, it was, it was a sort of an experience that I'd I'd already experienced myself. So, mm-hmm. I was kind of familiar with how to manage it. But I know for some students, they might not have had that feeling before. So. It was something that a lot of students would have had to experience for the first time and how to manage. And what I'd like to see going forward is I'd actually like to see universities or governments actually come in and visit universities or actually have a bit more engagement with young people around lockdown and actually see if we can gain a bit of perspective from students on how we felt it. Because I think this isn't, I think there's going to be a lot of people that once COVID-19 is fully, um, fully over and it's, there's no more restrictions or anything. I, I don't want people to go, oh, sweet, that's, we've finally made it through it. I think it's important for young people that we have an opportunity to reflect on this time and sort of reflect on what we've learned about how to manage ourselves when we are isolated and when we are alone. Yeah, I would have thought that maybe um, Canterbury University maybe would have learned from lessons of the past. Um, I was at university when the earthquakes hit, so, um, you know, for us, we had... Uh, big tents in the car park and you know when it was cold freezing cold in the mornings we were trying to do our classes in these big makeshift tents um which just didn't really work Uh, a lot of people trying to use learn to study at home and yeah i mean my experience there was i felt generally unsupported um so yeah i guess it would be nice to actually see some more action coming out of this right yeah, definitely. And around it was around about a year ago today. Um, it was it was on it was in the media. A student um, actually took their own life in a hall, or they, a student died in a hall, and they they went undiscovered for a number of weeks. I actually, I actually can't say if, if they took their own life or not. That actually hasn't been released. But um, there was a big investigation into pastoral care at university last year as well. So I actually think University of Canterbury has a really really good opportunity here with the last sort of three hundred and sixty five days it has to. Um, implement a really, really strong new pastoral care policy, um, which is completely focused on looking after students and encouraging students to sort of speak to um, speak to student care, speak to the lecturers, or even speak to their mates, and just make sure that they're always checking in when they're not doing okay. And to my understanding, I had a um, our club. We hosted a forum on mental health with um, UC management with the vice chancellor. Uh, earlier in this year and I believe they were working on a new pastoral care policy 
So I'll be very excited to see when that's released. And I hope that they've sort of taken on a lot of a lot of learnings that I'm sure students would have had from COVID-19 and implemented those as well. Yeah, and I mean, there has been um, issues of um, suicide at the university before. Um, so yeah. it, would, it would be nice to actually see them reach out to groups like yourself to get that um, student perspective and, and hearing from lived experience, because that's one of the most important things with, with mental health is actually hearing from the people that are feeling it and living with it. So what do you think? Uh, I think it's the right, right. Is that... Sorry, Sorry, far away. I was going to say, I think that's one of the most important things, right, is that what we've been trying to push all this year with our club is that like, we're just students. We're not experts. We're not trained in these areas. All we can do is try and encourage to have more conversations and sort of draw our, on our own experiences that get encouraged to have those conversations as well. But sort of people in those positions of authority or university management, those are the people that can actually make the change. So it's important for us that we're pushing those things forward to them in a way that encourages them to make that change as well. Yeah. So what are some things that you see in your peers that make you maybe question if they're not doing so well? Um, so Dougal from Umbrella, that organisation, he talked about when you're identifying things from your mates, and this is what I've learned from it, is that if you look at a person in terms of almost a house, where you've got all of these different walls that are sort of based around like their physical well-being, their spiritual well-being, their emotional well-being, and their mental well-being comes into it as well. Um, one of the things I've learned this year is sort of recognising if there's sort of changes in my mate's behaviour or if they're behaving in ways that might be a little bit different to what they're normally doing because – or if they're, they're doing things that are actually – changes that are actually detrimental. Like, for example, if, if you have a friend that – might have gone through a difficult breakup or you have a friend that has started to drink a lot more than they normally would or if you have a friend that isn't sort of who used to go to the gym quite often actually isn't exercising as much as they are um if, if you can see those changes and just kind of say like oh hey bro like kind of a notice you've been doing this a little bit more you've been doing this a little bit less is, is everything okay because when those changes of routine happen this is just what i've heard is that those changes of routine can sometimes be caused by something that's all to them. So it's important that if you can wreck those things and try and make sure that they're not changing your behaviour uh, in a negative way to sort of cope with that. Nice. Do you think, um, do you think the levels of, um, testing and assessments is a significant factor like a determinant in students mental health and well-being so could you just repeat that you just, you just cut that a little bit there do you, you do you find that um the high levels of testing and assessments is perhaps a determinant in mental health and well-being of students um for, for law students definitely i think um just from my own experiences um, when you have, I think, it's almost like the level of it, not many assessments, so the weighting they give to particular I, which means that you can have quite a lot of pressure on yourself to perform really well to They call second year law almost the equivalent of third year med because you have a full year law paper and they have exams with 60% of your final. Do well, we don't do that great in your interview. One, the year. Yeah, absolutely. First year of Canterbury does it with clothes, and it makes us. You're to apply what you've learned to the particular exam. Mm -hmm. So I know personally, they those exams cause me quite a, quite a lot of anxiety, and they cause me quite a lot of grief because. 
I would always walk into the limit and be worried that if I don't remember a particular case or if I don't remember a particular principle because I can't bring it in with me, but I still know how to answer the question, I'm going to have a grade that completely doesn't reflect my ability in this course. So for students, it's really difficult because it's almost like we have assessments that happen. They always all happen in the same block, but there's so few of them that they're all the amounts that each one is really, really important, but they also, they structure exams. They also always appear at the same time. So you kind of have these really, really big modes of stress followed by these troughs where nothing's really linked. So stress yourself up all the way up to these exams and then you completely decompress and you need to take some time out to sort of you're immediately back in another big period. So I do think that, um, I think that there could be some changes to how exams are run and assessments are run at university because I think currently the nature of sort of 60% end of year exams, which always generally happen around the same time. I remember my second year, I had one 60% exam on Wednesday, and then two days later, I had another one, and then two days later, I had another one. And when you're memorising entire years, a year worth of content, and it's all, it all has to be in your mind, you can't bring in any materials. It can be really daunting to only have that small amount of turnaround in between your exams. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wonder though, because we've seen, I guess, with high school and the change to a lot of internal assessments, if if that's had a had a measurable impact on health and well being. I know, I know, it's probably a bit harder for teachers. Yeah. Sorry, you just cut out again there. Oh, just that's all good. That. Just talking about, uh, I wonder if there's been any measurable um, points from high schools, because a lot of them do a lot of internal assessments now throughout the year. Yeah, and I know um, with their externals, they, um, they've had a couple of them in the last couple of years. That especially, it, it occurs a lot around math internals, math externals that I've noticed that sometimes they can create the exams and the question can actually be impossible. So there'll be a lot of students that will study really hard and they'll walk into this exam that they actually can't answer and they'll all work out feeling really, really stuck. So it's interesting to see sort of, I think they're reviewing the NCA policy currently. There's been some more discussions around national standards. So I do, I do think the times are changing a little bit in terms of how we measure the academics of sort of high school students and sort of university students. Yeah. So Sam, before we say goodbye... Um, and you may have already touched on it already, but what would be the one thing that you would like to see changed for university students and their mental health and well-being? Sure, that's, that's a big, big question. question. <laughs> um, one thing I want to change. Um, you know, it's it's probably more of a philosophical, philosophical change, change rather than rather than a change, change that sort of any one person can implement, I suppose, but I want university to sort of become a place that if you're having a bad day or you didn't do that well in an assessment or you're worried about things that are going on at home, you can feel 100% comfortable to talk to people about it and that you on that campus about it. So you could, I want to make a space where I want it to become a place that Students can actually talk to the lecturers about things that might be going on that might be impacting their performance in a course. I want students to be able to talk to their mates and go, hey guys, I'm really not okay right now. I want it to become a place that everyone can appreciate and acknowledge that mental health is a massive problem and then we all have to take steps to fix it. Um, but the way that's going to change it, it's not going to come about with a pastoral, new pastoral care policy. It, it's not going to come about with the cross to grades when we have them what it's going to come down to is each and every person taking steps themselves to create this environment because you know, there's that phrase around, you know, bitch, the world was sort of where we have to lead by example. Is that I think we all ourselves, students at uni, um, I think it's time that we all sort of taking, start taking steps ourselves to start having those conversations or reaching out to mates for particular reason other than just going, hey, I haven't seen you for a while doing it. Okay. I think the minute we start doing that, 
Yeah. A big culture change, eh? Yeah, yeah massive, massive culture, culture change. change. Mm. I think that, that probably, probably sums it up. Awesome. Hey, Sam, thanks heaps for dropping in. Sam's from Lads Without Labels, a uh, um, university group at Canterbury University here. Um, it's been awesome to get to know Sam and his crew and to um, go along to their events and to have um, Sam along to ours. So kia ora, Sam. Thanks for coming in. We really appreciate it. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. You get to relax, have a good day. It's starting to get pretty windy here now. I think that's why my internet's struggling a bit. It's all good. Um, kia ora, Ben. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I also just want to say on a personal note, um, Ben's been someone that has, you've really, really inspired this club this year. You've actually made a lot of us put into plan a lot of things you've done and you've actually helped inspire a lot of events and installations that we've got for campus. So um, I don't think this club would have been as successful in the back half of the year without your involvement. So I do want to say a massive thank you to you and um, I feel very, very privileged to be here with you today. Um, and yeah, I hope you have a good rest of your day as well and best of luck with the rest of the interviews going on today. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Let's get this relationship going. All the best, mate. Definitely. Thanks, mate. Kaki See you later. Cheers. How oh, nice. Sam's such a good dude. Um, awesome to hear perspective from from the university students and, um, you know, some of those unique challenges that they face, especially in, in a year as tumultuous as the one we've had with COVID-19. Um, it's been really challenging for a lot of people and sometimes we get really caught up in viewing the world from our lens and our own skin about how we deal with things um that we kind of forget about all these other different groups of people and communities that that have their own very unique struggles and there's a there's a point there where i can really relate um to university students this year and in, in dealing with isolation and lockdown and trying to study as like I said during Sam's um, chat, is that I was at university when the uh, earthquakes hit. So I went through that period of trying to study in a uh, tent, which was not very ideal, to be honest. Um, cool. So thank you, everybody who's um, been checking in today, who's still got cat here everywhere, who's still checking in now. Um, we are just knocking on the door of four hours of live streaming. This is my longest live stream ever um, by probably like three hours already. I don't think I've ever done one even close to an hour, really. Um, so thank you all for coming. It's going to be a super long day. We've got lots of chats still to come. We've got a bit of a half an hour break here. I'm going to actually take five minutes or so um, in this next half an hour just to have a sandwich or something, a piece of fruit. Um, it's important that I um, keep up with eating today, although I'm here as well, but I just don't want to eat in front of you on the camera. So I will smash myself a sandwich, have some more water and maybe a biscuit or an apple um, in the next wee bit before our next guest comes on. So I'm just going to send her um, our contact details for the zoom now i'm just kind of doing this as we go mm -hmm. cool. mm. Two, three. and she is on at 1 30. the weather is starting to get pretty windy here i wonder if that's why my internet's struggling a little bit um, so bear with me with any internet issues everybody kia ora nathan loving having everybody here there's been some really good um really good questions and stuff and um and points put forward by People with lived experience, professionals, people that are worried about their friends, um, been some really good, really good chats. We're now officially at four hours, so 240 minutes. So that means we have another 414 minutes to go. Cool. Um, 11 hours seems like a lot, but considering we've done Project 71 and that was 13 hours, um, 
I think we can do this. We're, we're all good. So we've still got another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven guests today. So jam packed. Um, I just want to take a little moment to um, chat about who we've had on so far and maybe some reflections there and um, you might have your own ref reflections that you might want to put in the comments that I can share on behalf. So, so far we've had Matt Brown. So Matt Brown is uh, the owner, him and his wife Sarah are the owners of My Father's Barber, uh, which is in Rickerton here in Otatahi Christchurch. They also run She Is Not Your Rehab. They basically model, um, you know, vulnerable behaviors so being vulnerable themselves as a form of leadership to inspire other people to to be vulnerable and to talk about their traumas and to grow and move past that in a supportive environment together um dealing with those in in their workplace they have groups every wednesday where they get together and they um they show that behavior and then um, they've got public groups as well and so their barbers are having good conversations with people their staff are having good conversations with each other they're having good conversations with their family they're really just promoting a really good way to address those personal traumas that people have and support each other through it through honest and tough conversations sometimes it's always good to lean in rather than lean out when when you're feeling a bit awkward or confronted by um, a feeling or maybe a trigger as Matt was talking about earlier so it was really great to have um, Matt on board he's someone that I look up to um, both him and Sarah they are fantastic people in our community uh, Otatahi Christchurch is incredibly lucky to have people like that uh, representing their communities and for him to um, share his insights and and especially um, a bit more chat about um, how it affects uh, how it affects indigenous communities and Matt's own personal upbringing was was really nice. So if you missed the chat with Matt <clears throat> and you'd like to watch that uh, when we finish this live stream, it should be available. And so Matt was on at nine thirty, so that was thirty minutes into the live stream. So. You can actually go back and watch that chat with Matt. Um, fantastic guy. I can't say it enough. I re really love the work that he does for people. Um, he's really got people at his heart and he does fantastic work. Uh, we then had uh, my friend Raf drop through. Um, she is a... Whoa, I just pushed the button on my chair and I dropped down. <laughs> I do this all the time at work. <laughs> it's because I put my heels under the, under the chair. <laughs> Um, Raf dropped in to um, give us a perspective of mental health and well-being from a small business owner. Raf's like me, she works super hard, she's always juggling heaps of different projects or um, entrepreneurial things. She's a real go-getter and really busy all the time. Um, she was able to share her story back with us about, once again, she was you know, being vulnerable and doing so, she was able to share how she was a runner. She would run from the trauma and not really face it or address it um, in her life. So she was able to let us know how she faces that. And in a way, it's similar to what I do in terms of scheduling myself downtime where it's okay to be lazy. It's okay to just lie on the couch for a couple of hours, and scroll on the internet or watch, you know, something rubbish on TV. And, and to feel okay in doing that. She also kind of talked about the struggles that a lot of small business owners face where, you know, in some jobs, if you're feeling unwell, you can take a sick day, but sometimes when you're the only one that works in your self-employment business and you need to work or else you don't get money, then there, there becomes a bit of a struggle to balance your own mental wellness with providing a, a stable and basic income for yourself so um raf was able to talk through that with us which um i really appreciate raf's um hilarious she <laughs> as she mentioned in her live stream she doesn't have a filter she's um you know 
full action all the time, get stuff done. But it's nice to hear from someone in that position because a lot of people look at people like Raf or myself and probably assume that because we're busy all the time or achieving stuff a lot that um, we're overachievers and that we must live a very easy or or stable life of wellness but often that's not the case so it's a good reminder that you can look back at, at the struggles that people have um, sorry you can look back at people that you perceive to not have struggles and that are doing really well and and think maybe maybe there's something under there that they're struggling with that they're going going through themselves so you know even though people may have a very healthy looking facade they or a front facing personality they might be struggling underneath so always take time to ask people how they're doing and how they're going next we had an amanda um who was um very very lovely to actually step in and give us a very truthful and uh, heartfelt look at her history and and how she's got to where she's got to now um, Amanda has bipolar I believe she said type 2 from memory um, and she was able to talk about going through mis misdiagnosis being prescribed antabuse um, when she wasn't really a drinker and how that that negatively impacted her and how she struggled through um, dealing with the traumas in her life and re-traumatizing through um, you know doing sex work through manic phases and then the cycle that that often would perpetrate um, and she had a lot of insight to be able to recognize those cycles that were just going round and round and how she could establish routines to break that. Um, so thanks to Amanda for coming in and talking through that. That was really powerful. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of people listening to that would have been able to get some really um, healthy takeaways for themselves. So thank you. Thank you very much to um, for coming in there. Oh, sorry, Amber, I didn't see you comment there about the um, schedule, but thanks, Nathan, for posting that in. Um, I think our next guest is Tatiana at 1.30. Mm -mm -mm. Um, cool, and our last speaker we had was um, Sam from Lads Without Labels at the Canterbury University. Um, great young guy, uh, really compassionate and really cares for his fellow students um, like you would have just seen we've worked together a little bit recently which is really cool really happy to keep that relationship going because I like seeing people of action when it comes to doing stuff in your community um, it's half the reason I'm an aspiring politician is because I'm a guy who does action and doesn't just talk about it so I love seeing that from other people in our community and I love supporting those people um, to get out there and do, do really cool stuff. Um, Sam was also vulnerable as well today to, to share with us his experience with mental health. So thanks Sam for that um, and thanks for coming along. Really good dude, really great club. They're going to do some great things I know in the future. It's their first year they've had a tough year with COVID but they're going to do some pretty cool stuff. I'm just going to answer a couple questions before I take off for a super quick lunch break. I will be quick, I promise. So from Sean, Kia ora Ben, good on you for doing this. How do you conceptualize leisure in your work? Also, what are your thoughts about the expression, the right to health? Cool, awesome question. How do I conceptualize leisure in my work? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about my day-to-day -day work as a mental health and addiction support worker. Um, I think it's it's actually just recognizing when you need to take time for yourself. Um, my work's pretty good at that. My team do a lot of um, supervision with each other, making sure that we're all okay, being able to talk about different difficult situations with each other and source help. But one thing we do is we've got this little booklet of vouchers, uh, well-being vouchers, and they entitle us to take an hour off or two hours off or half a day off so we've got like 30 something vouchers or something spread between those options that we can just cash in at any time so if i'm feeling a bit overwhelmed maybe on a thursday um 
I could go, you know what, I might actually just take a half day on Friday and go and do something with my partner because Friday's her day off. So I could go and hang out with her in the afternoon. So I can actually cash in a voucher to do that, a half day voucher. Um, or if I wake up one morning and, I th- and I've got no client work on first thing and I'm just feeling a bit tired, I can cash in a two hour late start. I'll just send a message to my boss and go, hey, I'm just going to cash in this voucher. I'll give it to you when I get to the office. And I can actually take time for myself. So there's a bit of, I guess my concept of leisure is recognizing when I need to relax or when I need to take time for myself so I can be a better mental health and support worker. And the um, second half of your question, um, the right to health. Um, it's not really an expression that I've heard a lot, to be honest, but it's definitely something that I support that we should have equal opportunity to access any health and well-being needs that we have. Um, currently, I don't see that particularly well in the mental health industry. And I was talking about that earlier with those tricky like referral pathways and and specific funding criteria that prohibit some people from being able to access the right service that they need. Um, and because of those very niche funding requirements, a lot of those organizations aren't publicly known. So it's not something that people can just walk in the street and get involved in. So there needs to be a easier way for people to have equitable access to mental health and well-being. And yeah, as a right, it should, it should be something that's funded, something that's a bit more um clear and eloquently presented which i think is something we're struggling with at the moment so cool hope you guys don't mind i'm just going to take a couple minutes to have a quick bathroom break and have a quick bite to eat i will be back with you in no time um thanks to everyone that's been um following along so far you guys are troopers um i hope you are finding the conversations today valuable in some way shape or form kia ora i will be back very soon
unmute, unmute. Kia ora everybody, I'm back from a, just a very quick lunch break. <clears throat> so I'll wash down my sandwich. Hope everybody is doing all good. Cool, so we'll be getting ready to see our next guest. <laughs> They will be in here shortly. Um. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So we've got four consecutive guests coming up. Tatiana, James, Becca, and then Jono. Then we'll have a bit of a half hour chat with me. Then we've got um, a real long slog to end the day. We've got Andrew, Ben, Jennifer, Jake, Jeff, Stu, and Joel. Seven guests in a row. And that will be to round out our day pretty much. So from now, there's only going to be one kind of gap where I have to do a lot of talking. So it'll be nice to, um, to get real into the thick of it now with lots of different guests and <coughs> lots of different perspectives which is the main thing about today so thank you everybody for dropping in so far uh we're just over four hours in four hours and 20 minutes um so 260 hours if my math's all right it's 260 minutes um it's been super fun so far i hope everybody's been finding it valuable in some way shape or form we've had some really good perspectives so far and um some really good questions and um, and so some chat, some chats. <clears throat> cool. Oh, cheers. Josiah. Josiah is helping me with all my back end stuff. Um, he actually trained me how to use the software this week. So. It's new to me, and without him, I would have been up SIHT Creek without it. So hot tip again for anybody who's just checked in that are, that is watching this. If you've got a Chromecast and you feel like checking in for a significant amount of time, you can actually just beam it to your TV, and then you can still use your phone for other stuff. Cool. So when we've got our guest speakers in, if you have any questions you would like to ask that person or myself, just write them in and fire away and we will answer them for you. Um, I'm sure that they're all popping up for me. So you can also watch this on YouTube. If you're watching this on Facebook via the Opportunities Party YouTube page. Or if you're on there and you don't want to watch it on YouTube, you can watch it over here on our Facebook pages. <clears throat> cool. Cool, so not quite sure what point halfway is. If we're here for almost 11 hours, it'll be about five and a half hours. So we're about an hour away from halfway through. So awesome effort, everyone. Things are about to get not hectic, but we're just going to have pretty much solid guests from here on out. Just one more break at 3.30. So stick around if you want to. Chuck it on the TV. Think about some questions you'd like to throw to us and get involved. Cool. So our next guest is in the waiting room. So I'm going to... Pop her in right now. Kia ora, kia ora, Tatiana, how you doing? I'll just make sure that she can hear me.
don't think she can hear me. It says she's connecting to the audio. So if we just hold fire for a second. Classic technology. What's going on here? Cool, we're just trying to get the audio all good. Go. Got some action, I think. Kia ora, Tatiana, can you hear me? Kia can you hear me? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Hi, you there? Sorry. Awesome. Can you hear <laughs> That's all right. I was just saying connecting to audio. Cool. So we're pretty much live now with audio. So when you're ready to join in with video, then we can fire away. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I, was, I, I, ooh, I don't know, know if I can set, set the video up via... via while driving is it okay that's okay right. no, you, you can, can video yep. of the black screen <laughs> that's absolutely fine we are our first guest today we couldn't even get the video going so you're all good yeah sure okay. awesome um so I'm just gonna, i just pulled over for a second because i was like oh, it's been a while like <laughs> i wonder is the audio okay yeah sounds great i think that will yeah. be fine um We've had no this issues. Is a, with this is a modern, modern age that we're, we're in, having to <laughs> 2020. You know, navigate around. At least, least, yeah. least everyone pretty much knows how to use Zoom now, so that's cool. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so this is Tatiana, everybody. She is here to give us a bit of um, a chat about mental health for women in Aotearoa and for Wahine. So, um, Tatiana, if you just want to give us a bit of. Um, your background and who you are and 
and you know feel free to dig in as personal as you wish or feel comfortable with and um and yeah and then once once you've kind of introduced yourself and and had a bit of a chat we'll go with some questions and and dig into some stuff Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, Hold up one second. We're losing your audio. Uh, inviting me on to have the video today. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really valuable to be doing what you're doing. Yeah, I'm back. Cool. Okay, we can hear you now. The audio went a bit fuzzy can for you a hear second. Me? Yep, you're all good now. Okay. 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 Sweet. Um. Yeah. No. Thank you for inviting me on to have a chat, to have a corridor. I think it's really valuable for what you're doing. Um. And I'm gonna say I admire you. Definitely sitting in front of your computer for that length of time. Um. But. Yeah, I, I think I think for me, like like a lot of people, a lot of my mental health and well-being experience has come from lived experience, um, and I think that's, that's a lot of the way that people sort of can relate to each other with these issues. Um, so I guess my mental health journey for me started quite young. Um, it, are you still there? I'm, I'm yep. now realizing, like, am I coming out or? No, nope, you're here. We're all good. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, I'm still <laughs> Yep, you're still here. I'm We're still all good. Yep, yeah, far away. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so my mental health journey, uh, yeah, my, my journey for me started quite young. Um, definitely moving from Wellington to South Canterbury. Uh, growing up in Tamaru, I didn't have a great time through primary school or high school. Um, and yeah, just like through my I guess, very formative years, like a lot of young people, I started to notice my own sort of experiences with my mental health that had been led into my adult life. Um, but as background for me, I studied my undergraduate uh, at NASA, which is the National Academy of Singing and Dramatic Arts, which is based in Ototahi. And I mean, that in of itself, like any other creative school. Um, being in the creative dreams, and I do think that can, for a lot of people, like bring up and um, highlight things about their mental health and well-being that they may not have noticed, they may not have observed before. Yeah, and I think especially my my own training as an actor, was, you know, stuff we delved into that all of us would have days where we would just be like, well, this is, you know, <laughs> bringing up some heavy stuff. So that's why it's so important um, for, for anyone, for anyone who's young, really. But, um, yeah, I think especially for, you know, creatives, um, that sort of thing, and yeah, now I'm doing my postgraduate um, in the same field um, at Utter. I'm doing my Masters of Creative Practices, and um, what I'm focusing on at the moment, which I guess lends itself a little bit to kind of what I've talked to you um, about today, is I'm my research project is to create a piece of uh, original New Zealand theatre that uh, showcases kind of ideas and themes about feminism, modern day feminism, to um, 18 to 25 year old Wahine in Aotearoa. So yeah, that's that's kind of my gig. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, what I wanted to come on and, and have a chat about today is um, how sometimes those big diagrams, I think, do overlap. Like, obviously, we know that, um, and I think what a, a lot of what your work, as I understand it, um, has been a, around, you know, mental health with, with men. Um, and, you know, men are disproportionately, as we know, high in terms of um, suicide mm. rates. And, you know, 
mental health really being as recognised as as much in the community sometimes. But you know, our, our young wahine are also disproportionately high when it comes to things like statistics around you know sexual violence and domestic violence and sexual assaults. Um, and I think that that is something that undoubtedly affects a lot of Kiwi women, a lot of women internationally, and it really can affect their mental health because it is really, really common, um, which, you know, is, is, I think, kind of maybe a fact that everyone knows but doesn't necessarily think about the implications of, yeah, really, it is that one in four, um, which is kind of scary. Yeah, that's a terrifying number. Yeah. Well, it's not um, a number. That's also, the terrifying thing, right? It's it's real people that that we yeah, all know. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't have all of my. I don't have all of my stats in front of me, so you have to excuse me. But I think in New Zealand, it's also increasingly common for sort of like the sixteen to like twenty-year-old age bracket of young women, and then obviously, um, not obviously, it's not the right word, but uh, it is higher um, statistically for Māori and Pacifica Wahine as well. Um, yeah, and I think, I think the thing that we just have to question and have to constantly be thinking about is like, well, when these statistics are so high, like how can we change that? You know, I think it's really important to, to have these conversations and to kind of look at things um, look at the way that our society operates and the structures that are in place and say well, what implications does this have on the mental health and well-being of uh, young women and, and young men and everyone really yeah because everybody's connected right and like we talked about with matt earlier and he said heal the man heal the whanau and that you you know like no one's an isolated uh, person you know because we're all and we all have whanau or greater whanau or communities so seeing how how we can help one one person often has a greater absolutely yeah yeah absolutely so do you think think, you know do you think for women that i mean as terrifying as these statistics are there's probably a significant portion that go under reported um, oh absolutely yeah yeah So how how do you think we can foster better, uh, well, less barriers for women to access the services and help they yeah. need? Fuzzy. Damn, I think we've lost. We've lost we've lost you for the last thirty seconds. Are you back now? Am I back? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, I think I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's just a bit patchy. Um, yeah, no, I, I was going to say that I am biased and I'm a little bit of a, you know, bra burning feminist. Um, but I do think that that is one way that we can, you know, have these conversations, empower young men and women, um, but also highlight things to our young men as well, you know, mm-hmm. by kind of standing up and, and looking at things that we experience in our day to day life that we kind of can tend to just not question or take for granted and actually being like, well, how, how does this affect us? How, how does this affect um, the way that we interact with the world as everyday women? But yeah, I think it is about really trying to, from a grassroots level, empower young girls and really speak to them and be like, hey, this is really common. You're not alone. Um, there are things that you can access, you know, things like ACC, sensitive pain, um, 
funding and support which is there if you want it. If, if you know, if you don't want to reach out and you don't want to connect with that either, then that's totally okay. But it is about making sure that we can go to this because, you know, I um, come from my own journey with, you know, making an ACC sensitive pain and it wasn't, I knew nothing about it until the friend actually brought it up to me and was like, hey, this is something that is available to you. You know, if you have experienced uh, sexual assault, sexual trauma, um, sexual abuse, and it happened in New Zealand, um, you are eligible, you know, for this free counselling, for this free support. And there are a lot of, um, you know, institutions that are connected in some way through, you know, like women's refuge, family planning, but also setting up lots of support for women who have experienced um, domestic violence as well. Because, you know, we know our statistics in in New Zealand, the the OECD are very high, mm. and I think it's just about having these conversations and, and getting on these platforms and saying, look, this, there is help available to you. There, there are ways that you can um, really know that you're not alone and know that your greater father and your greater community are supporting you. And yeah. So, how do we screen to the hills that? Um these services or like ACC are available for people to get counselling? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, that is, that is a really good question. I mean, it, it is hard. Um, I personally would like it to be um, talked about a lot more. I think when it does come to things like sexual harassment and, you know, sexual violence, there's this, um, you know, stigma like there is with any kind of mental health, I think especially for women and, and men too that um, experience that Oh, we lost yet. Are you there? Kia ora. Oh no, we've dropped out. Oh, you there? Sorry, we lost, we lost the last 30 seconds. Hello? Kia ora, That's okay. um, we lost the last 30 seconds. I think that was going to be a good chat. Do you want to give that to us okay. again? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah. I, um, uh, I'm not sure which bit she got and which bit she didn't. But yeah, I, I was saying that I think with um, sexual violence and sexual harassment, like they're very taboo subjects. We don't really feel comfortable talking about it. Damn, lost it again. Can you hear me? Um, we don't really like the idea of it. You know, like the fact is that in our fathers, you know, um, a lot of sexual uh, abuse victims know, you know, their perpetrator, um, their abuser. And, and so, yeah, the, 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 you mentioned, you know, like how to scream from the rooftops, that this kind of stuff is available to women and it's available there to, to support their physical and mental well being. Or just having these conversations out in the open, you know, just being like, look, this is something that we deal with disproportionately highly in terms of the rest of the world and, you know, disproportionately highly in terms of how many, how common it is for women and young women. And if we can, I think, get on platforms and have conversations about this happens and it's not going away and it's not something that we can just rush up under a rug and then even go deeper into why does it happen, why is this something that, you know, in our society kind of fundamentally upholds and continues to kind of let this stuff happen, then that allows more people to come forward and actually be like, hey, this happened to me too. And, you know, I think that is really important as well to touch on if we look at globally. I mean, obviously COVID's kind of brought in a hell by all of us, but through that, the Me Too movement in the States and, you know, internationally has really highlighted how, how common it is and how important it is for women, I, you know, I say, I say women, I say Wahine, but I, I do meet everyone um, because, you know, patriarchal standards affect 
men and men's mental health, you know, just as much as they do to women, that whole thing, you know, men shouldn't show emotion or men shouldn't cry, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, it's, it's about women and everyone banding together and being like, this isn't okay, it's happening, and we need to stop it, we need to learn how to face up to it and talk about it. And, and then, yeah, really, really coming in up to that and being like, and if you know someone, um, this is this is how they can reach that help. You know, I think I think with um, the big push that there's been through a lot of like the kids marketing recently, um, like the one seven three seven hotline, that's amazing. I think it's so important that we are coming out and we are putting the mental health hotline as well, um, and, and letting people know that that support is there. And I do think like the next step, just like add on to that, build it, and make these kind of foundations even stronger, is to be like and you know, if you have experienced sexual assault or if you know someone who has, um, this is where you can go for that and make that really, really readily available as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've got a, a number available. Um... Uh, no, but I will find it while you're talking. There is a sexual abuse um, helpline in New Zealand. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's it's interesting as well because I think with women, oh. I see it often in homelessness where women struggle to meet some funding criteria because they're not street homeless for X amount of time because mm. women are more likely to um, stay in domestically violent or sexually abusive yeah. relationships to have a roof over their head. Yeah. Um, so they often yeah. don't get measured in homeless absolutely. statistics and don't get the assistance that they need. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, that that is something that, that does affect it, right? It's, it's almost like, to a certain extent, this kind of behaviour and this kind of violence is so normalised that we know about it and, and we know it's happening, but we're just kind of like, oh, well, that is just the way it is. And it's kind of about, you know, really trying to dig deep and be like, no, why is this the way? Mm. And why do especially young girls, you know, feel that this kind of behavior is normal and that, you know, having me weight on potential is, is normal, the status quo. Mm. Um, and again, like I was touching on before, I think that's all about really trying to break the taboo around sexual assault and, and really look into, you know, having um, sex education for young children and our tamariki and saying it's really important to make sure that, you know, the sex that you're having when you start to have sex is really consensual and all parties are really to keep going. Um, and, and again, you know, just as much for young, young men because, yeah. you know, this kind of idea that, oh, you have to be strong and, you know, you have to want to, you know, beat as many women as you can and that shows what a man you are. It's like, well, that's not you, then that doesn't have to be you, man. And if you are a man and you're in a, a relationship or an experience where you are feeling like you're not consenting and the, the um, you know, it, it's still happening that you you have experienced uh, an abuse just as much as any woman has, you know? Yeah. Um, are you familiar with Mates and Dates? It's no, a, uh, I'm not. It's a program in high schools where they teach healthy relationships for young people. So, um, yeah. yeah, much of what you're talking about there is super cool. There was a pilot program launched, I'm not sure where in the country, but ACC actually have funded it to launch um, nationwide. Um, so very cool. It's teaching young teenagers about um, consent and healthy relationships, when to recognize an unhealthy relationship and uh, things like that. So I think that kind of preventative measure is really good to see, yeah. especially from ACC. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's uh, a number here for women to call if they need it is 0800 Refuge, which is 0800 733 843. That's 0800 733 843. And that's for um, a woman's refuge if anyone needed some some chats or assistance yeah. there. And I, I would just say also, like, I think I might have mentioned the ACC sense of the plane um, and not really touch on what that means. So, yeah, um, essentially, if you or anyone you know has experienced, like, some kind of sexual abuse or violence or trauma, 
you can contact ACC, you can do it through your GP, or you can just contact ACC directly. Um, and basically, there are a few different steps and routes that um, your, your journey kind of takes with them. But at the very basic level, they can just give you short term counselling, um, or at the longer level, you know, if it's you know something that's happened, say during childhood, and it's still affecting your mental health and well-being, well into adulthood, um, ACC kind of sets up a program for you where you kind of you go through and you have certain steps along the way with different counsellors. But then you can essentially be entitled to uh, free counselling for so long as you should need it. So for some people that's, you know, six to 18 months, for some people that, you know, might be the rest of their life. Yeah, awesome. That's really cool. That's a really good tangible help for people to take away. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, kia ora, Tatiana, thanks for dropping in. I really, really appreciate that and good to hear um, from the perspective um, that you bring, especially towards uh, yeah. women suffering abuse and and thank you so much for having me and I, I apologize for the kind of catchy connections throughout that's, that's all right we made it work <laughs> thank you <laughs> take care and i hope you enjoy the rest of your day and thank you so much for dropping in i really appreciate it yeah thank, thank you so much Jen. awesome kakite take care cheers that was really nice to um have tatiana's um perspective there um, around um, some of the issues that women in New Zealand face and terrifying to to see just how many um, women in New Zealand are in that situation. It's quite um, upsetting and shocking and it ties back to our first speaker today, Matt, who um, was speaking to us about his childhood experiences and, and what we often as children perceive as normal um, and even sometimes as adult, you know, adults you know we get um, stuck in situations and we don't realize that there's a better opportunity out there for us um, so kia ora Tatiana for, for dropping in and giving us giving us all that information um, our next speaker is James Brody so I'm going to get him in in about five minutes and um James is going to speak to us a little bit about life on the spectrum. So um, James is a musician, and I'm sure he'll tell you all about it. Um, yeah, so I will let him introduce himself properly in five minutes. But kia ora for anybody just dropping by. This is a 654-minute live stream for mental health. Today is the last day of Mental Health Awareness Week for 2020. I am the mental health spokesperson for um, the Opportunities Party. So I really wanted to honor Mental Health Awareness Week in a um, tangible way. And for me, um, this tangible way is, is showing that listening and giving time to people is a really powerful tool. So um, today we're all about hearing different perspectives uh, from different groups, different communities, different people to hear what life is like with mental illness or mental unwellness for them um, and also different community groups and fixes and things that are available or um, things like the numbers here that you can call if you need um, so all of this stuff is super important we've still got uh, we've been here streaming now for just shy of five hours so we've got uh, I believe Six odd hours to go. Yeah. Yeah, six hours and 40 seconds. Look at that. So we're still in for the long haul. Um, from here, we've got a lot of speakers, um, which will be good. It'll save my voice for a little bit later. Um, so next we've got James. And after that, we've got Becca and then Jono. And then we'll have a quick break then. And then we've just got guests right the way through to the end after that. So I hope everybody's having a good day. As usual, any questions you have, um, please drop them in when you can. Um, Amber, um, just 
letting us know her experience with ACC. They're absolutely despicable. They don't want to help. They just want to re-traumatize you, slap a label on you and write you off. Put your needs down to your childhood. They need a complete cull. I haven't had any personal interactions with ACC, um, but some anecdotal stuff I've seen through work is that, um, yeah, there, there could be a little bit of work done there. Um, it's good to hear that they have access for sensitive claims in the counselling though, um, especially when counselling is so dearly needed. Um, and I do appreciate the Mates and Dates um, program and what that's doing for our young people. But yeah, I'm really sorry to hear your experience, Amber, and sadly um, to have heard from many people that that's kind of a normal experience. Sometimes bureaucracy doesn't deal too well with real people and real people and real experiences. So it's a real... Real shame. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to send through the Zoom link to our next guest. Hopefully our internet holds out. It's been a bit chumpy last couple guests, but we'll see how we go. Um, if anybody can't hear us, just let us know as we're going along. All right, our guest has arrived. Um, Kia ora, James, can you hear me? Kia ora, James, can you hear me all good? I think you need to turn on your audio, I can't hear you. Hello, uh, have you got me this time? Oh, now we've got you, that's all good. How you doing, buddy? Cool. Awesome um, doing good. I've just been listening in and doing some demos. Um, no, one second. Um, hmm. I am just having a little bit of... The phone was going, going off, off, so I've, I've just, just had to go shut the door over and sort that out. That's cool. I'm just going to see if I can get you pictured in. Um, having an issue. Uh, one second, mate. Just out of curiosity, will I be able to watch the talks back later on? Yep, so once once the live stream's finished, then everything will be um, uploaded. So, uh, Brilliant. One second, I'm just having a bit of... I'm just trying to get your picture in. So we're live, everyone can hear you, but I'm just trying to get your picture going. So one second, just bear with me. Um, Mm. I'm just going to get someone to help me do it remotely because I can't work this technology that well. Have you had a good morning so far? I've, I've had, had a good morning. morning. I've, I've been, been demoing some songs on the guitar just, just for fun and, and I've been listening to the talks. It's been really fun so far. Nice. And it's good really job. helped educate, educate me as well. well. Nice. That's, that's a good thing about today. We've got lots of different people with different... Um, backgrounds and perspectives and everything so um yeah and this is one of the few parties that are actually talking, talking about this so more than happy to help oh cheers mate i'm just going to quickly send yes. this message away and then we'll get started and then we'll have the picture going at some point i'm sure josiah 
can help me. Cool. So, so you're just a little black screen at the moment, but we'll get that fixed as soon as we can. So kia ora James. Um, James Brody is a good dude who lives up, uh, where do you live? Sorry, it's up um, Waikato ways, isn't it? I'm from Tierra Hood, but I'm broadcasting to you today from Morrinsville. There we go, Morrinsville. Um, so James is going to drop by today and give us a bit of um, a chat about his personal experiences. And James, you um, are on the spectrum. So James is going to be able to give us a bit of insight about how that works for him and how we can better support um, people like James. Um, so James, if you want to take it away, give us your brief history. And after about 10 minutes or so, or when needed, I'll just chip in with some questions. And we've got about 20 to 25 minutes, so we'll just have a real good chat. Sounds, Sounds good, good to me. me. Okay, okay, so, so my, my name, name is James. James. Some, some people know me as a musician. musician. Some people know me for working as a mental health advocate and annoying politicians about matters relating to mental health. Some people know me as an actor up here, but for the first time in a long time, I'm not talking to you in any of those guises. I'm just talking to you as James, which is something I haven't done very often. And it's something that I really don't touch on because I've got my own life and I try and stay out of trouble, but for today i'm taking off the personas getting away from the music and talking to you openly as me i've been raised in the same area all of my life i spent most of my life as i said growing up in sierra home i'm currently residing in morrisville but i go back to my hometown often and I am autistic and ADHD. Those are neurological disorders that basically wire your brain differently and make things like social interaction, connecting with people, understanding social norms, and that sort of thing quite tricky. I'm not a scientist, so I'm not good with the exacts, but that. To put it in a sentence, my brain's probably weirder than yours. Uh, having autism and ADHD for me has been a blessing and a curse, depending on the situation. It's been a blessing because I've been able to come into things like this with a different perspective that a lot of the time isn't heard in different conversations. It's a curse because sometimes my brain can be my own worst enemy, especially with things like change and anxiety and other bits and pieces relating to it. So enough of the backstory, I'll just jump straight into the deep end now. My problems began when I was 12, there have been little bumps along the way through childhood as you get. But when I was 12, I started to notice there was something really wrong with my anxieties and depressions. I can't really go too far into the circumstances of what it is, but basically I was being held back from my friends and I'd grown up with those guys since I was three or four years old, so... That wasn't helping. The year below me hated my guts because I was the autistic dude and I would pay for that the following year. And through high school, when I was 14, things got really bad. I started self-attacking, harming myself in public, fits of rage and anger where I would blank out, act in a rage and then when I came back it's like oh god what have I done 
So this would go on for about a year until April 2011, when finally I decided to get help the first time. I'll touch on why it was the first time in a few moments, but basically it got to the point when my friends were ready to leave. My anxieties were becoming a daily problem, not a every once in a while problem. Everyone was keeping a wide berth and life wasn't good. I wasn't happy. I wasn't enjoying myself. But then my now nine-year-old little sister was born and that sort of made me click and go, wake up. You need to set an example for her and you need to get your own house in order. So off to counselling for the school very intensely and my little sister was born on the first day that I took counselling. So that was quite sweet. And up until recently, I'd been able to keep a hold on things for about nine, ten years just about, which is a long time in my world. And in that time, I've just about died. I've started music with Ivy Blue, found a healthy way to write down what I'm feeling, which is a lot of the lyrical content you see in Ivy Blue and all the music that I write. I've been able to enjoy other projects. I'm now the head of the Students Association. I advocate still for mental health and I just get on with my life. The world locked down a few months ago. Some of the world is still locked down. And during lockdown, as I'm sure we can all relate, we all had anxieties and depressions and the rest of it. For an autistic brain like mine, certain emotions are amplified a lot more than the regular brain. So if I'm really happy about something, you're going to know about it. If I'm really depressed, then you're also going to know about it. There's no discriminating with my issues. And it's very hard to turn it off. But for a while after lockdown, things got okay. I started getting my own house in order. Started writing songs again for what was supposed to be something released well into next year. But then everything crept up again after I lost my dad in, in July. The anxieties and the grief and the... Other emotions that come with it started to creep a little too high. And on August the 5th, I went to my counsellor and asked if we could do some intense work again through the equivalent of going to rehab without leaving your house. So that was set up. I completed the program a couple of weeks ago. I gave my own house in order, signed to reconnect with friends and family, writing a few of those anxious wrongs and getting on track. I suppose the message you can get from my story, and I've got a book and I do other things. If you want me to go into more detail, I can do so. But the main message is we've all got stones and we're all a little bit messed up. If my brain can amplify things tenfold and take me to the end of the world and back, it's not too late for you. And I hope that through this talk and through the questions we'll be starting shortly when Ben eventually comes onto my screen, that maybe I can help you in some way and show you that the road's not always going to be pretty, but it's always worth traveling down because we're all on the same highway in the end. On that note, I'll hand you back to Mr. Addison. Thanks so much, James. Thanks for sharing um, so intimately, um, you know, your struggles and what you've been through. Um, really touching stuff that I'm sure a lot of people listen to. I'm supposed to be able to see you, Ben. You're just a black thing on my screen. Oh, can you hear me, though? You're all good? Oh. I can hear you. It's a, weird, 
It's a little weird rectangle on black, but oh well, it happens. Oh, the camera should be gone. Um, so, question I wanted to ask you is how do you recognize when you're not feeling too well? As I was saying, the way my brain's wired, it does not discriminate. If I'm feeling great, I'm all the way up here, here bouncing off the walls, as some people have known before. If I'm sort of down here, sometimes I'll know, sometimes it'll hit me without warning. And when it hits without warning is when it does the most damage. If I know, then I can click on and go, okay, I need to go meditate or I need to go play a guitar. I need to write this down. Or I just need to do something a bit more productive than mellow in it. Because if you mellow in the shadows for too long, it doesn't work. Do you find that you've got good access to supports? I'm luckier than most. I don't use the WinTech counselling services because they only give you six counselling sessions a year and for someone of my needs, six sessions isn't going to do it. But through the rehab, I had a lot of help and support. I'm still keeping up with it. In general, I would say that it's very much a hit and miss with what support autism and ADHD gets. It's still very much a taboo subjects in New Zealand with mental health and neurological disabilities. So it's very, it's very tricky mm. okay, to have that balance of what you get and what you need. Mm. And it's a structural thing, but I'm glad it's been addressed now. How do you think um, the communities or government or um workplaces can better support people with a neurological disorder and mental health issues for better support well i think what labor sun is a good foundation but now you need to build the house you've it's similar to how i was on a live putting in the question to national the other day asking about the same thing how do you plan to support people with those issues while still managing the economy as we come out of this pandemic that we're going through right now. They talk that they have a plan, but no plan's been spoken of. So it's nice that people say, we support you and we want to help you, but without the walk and actually putting things into place, it's nothing. And some of the things I would put in is more relaxed counseling, and being able to work with them on certain things like academics, which you had a guy on earlier talking about. He's on the right track. We need to open up the services because under national, it was strangleholded as long as possible. And we've got a big mess to clean up. And ideally, if we've got one of the worst OECD statistics for mental health and suicide in the world, that's not something to be proud of. And while it's good to have an economy, if you don't have healthy minds working that economy, it's all for naught. Do you mind, James, talking a little bit about um, how ADHD affects you on a daily basis? Okay, yep. So ADHD, for those who don't know, is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. For me, I find that it, I'm affected through short bursts. So I have short bursts where I'm really hyper-focused on something, like talking to you or writing that next song or something like that. But then when it comes to other things, it can take me a day to get on track or I'll be flowing in between lots of different things. So in that regard... A lot of people that I've spoken to about it think that it's a switch you can turn on and off, but just like the autism, it does not discriminate and it doesn't care if you've got that big project due next week. If it's going to cause a problem, it's just going to hit your left side and cause it. So it affects me in a way where 
I try and get things done in shorter bursts because if I leave it too long, then that thing just hits you and it becomes very difficult to get it done, especially when you don't have a break in your frontal lobe or an on and off switch. Mm. Mm, yeah, I hear you. So for you, what is your best support network? Easily communication and talking with people. For me, I've had the same counsellor just about since high school. I've still got most of my best friends from primary school in some degree in my life. I've got my friends up here in Hamilton where I study who do really well with me as well. I was dating someone and even though we're not on at the moment she's we're still talking and she's still been really supportive so i'm very grateful i've got that good network of friends and family otherwise you wouldn't be talking to me today i would have been buried a long time ago and thank god that i'm not in that position now because if i can use my story to help with other people then that's a life well lived we're absolutely happy to have you here, James, um, and that you've got such good support networks. It is really an important thing for so many people. Um, so what's next for you? Now that now that you've just come out of a bit of a tough time personally, where where do you want to take your take your talents to next? Well, I have an album coming out on October the 24th called Recovery, and it talks about everything in great detail about how I felt, about loss, about anxiety, and it's the most personal thing I've ever written. Some ways I think it might be a little too personal, but I've already put it out there, so there's that. I'm taking a nice break from performing any live shows until probably next March, maybe a little later, just to build that foundation and build the house with all the beams and the support networks I need. Um, creatively, I'll still be murmuring, but I'm going to be a bit quiet. And the rest of the year is pretty much going to be spent on my studies and rebuilding my life because... August the 5th, I had pretty much gone into Bedlam when I said I need help. A few days later, my partner sort of said I need to back off. And even though we're talking now, things need to settle down before we decide what happens next mm. if and go on from there. Um and then there's friends and family I've got to reconnect with and start building relationships with again. So the rest of the year is going to be pretty quiet, especially in the creative sense. But I think middle of next year or early next year, I'll start looking to come back in some degree. Awesome. You're such a trooper, James. I love it. Always working hard. But well, always... there's only one of me. And if I, if I disappear, what, what am I going to do? Too true. So, Morinsville, forgive me. Is it a what? What population is Morinsville? Do you know? Well, the district is about nine to fifteen thousand, and that includes Matamata, Tierra, Morinsville, and all the little sub towns. So, mm -hmm. I put it around the three, four, five thousand mark. Sierra has about 20 minutes that way. Mm -hmm. Hamilton's about half for now, 45 minutes that way. So, so is there, is we're there somewhere in the middle. middle. Is there a lot of professional? And we don't get a lot of business, but we just get on with it. <laughs> Do you find you get a lot of professional support in such a small place? Um... A lot of the support stuff I do in Hamilton with the professional stuff like group therapy and counsellors and such, but as I said, I've got friends and family out here that are very supportive, and especially in Sierra, most people know who I am and about my work, so in country towns, being so to stay quiet for very long, and 
generally people are very accepting, which I'm very thankful for. Mm. I know it's not the case with everybody. Yeah, that's awesome that you've got good support there. I just wanted to share a couple comments that have come through for you. Um, sure thing. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about yourself, your circumstances and things, James. And another one um, that says, hi, James, man, you're so brave, James. So just a couple nice, nice comments in there for you. Thanks very much. Um, without people like you and me sharing our stories through our creativity and our personality, then we'd just be in the middle of somewhere and nowhere. And while it comes across as me being brave talking about this, trust me, it's not, while it's not an easy thing, it's something that needs to be done because it, while Labour have put on a good foundation, we it's what it's building the house that's going to make the difference. If we can make a substantial difference in that area, then hopefully things will continue to improve. I made some very choice comments to national supporters the other day that I'm not going to touch on, but I honestly think with them in charge, we're screwed. So I hope that through sharing my story, it'll help with your shadows in some way. And it'll also help influence the top guys to actually do something. It's one thing to send thoughts and prayers and say that you're brave, but it's nothing without the action. And I hope by sharing my story, even if it's just touching into your own life, and it will help your own path in some way. If that's what my story can do, or my music, or whatever creativity I'm doing, that's my job done. That's amazing, James. And hey, James, we just got the the finally got the camera working, so everyone can see you now. Get the way. Yeah. Technical issues. What can I say? Yeah. Um, We've got you now. So. You now know who's been talking to you for the last <laughs> 22 minutes or however long it's been. Um, wow. Hi. <laughs> oh, kia ora, James. Thank you so much for, for dropping in. And um, I think you'll be a crowd favorite today. You gave us some really um, nice touching insights um, for what it's like for you. Because the big part about today is that we get to hear from different perspectives. Because I know what the world is like through my lens. And my lens is a very neurotypical lens. So to be able to have a guest like yourself come in and share your perspective with us through your lens, through your worldview, and um, and be so um, touching and and vibrant about it was really nice and i think everyone on behalf of everyone everyone's probably really enjoyed you coming along thank, thank you very much this, this is the first time i've done a talk like this since being in rehab and being friends outside of all this through music and the rest of it i'm glad that i've been able to share with you best wishes with blindfolded led to the woods and opportunities party and everything you've got going on Thanks, Pat. and I hope that you guys do the best. Thanks, James. It's a pleasure having you here. Um, I'll touch base with you again soon in, in personal life. All my love, pal. Enjoy Brilliant. the rest of your day. Take care. Kakite. That was my pal, James. He's amazing. Um, really good chat from him i really 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 enjoyed that thanks so much james for for coming along um can be hard to be that one everybody what a what a good guy um whew. that was really nice thanks james thanks again i hope everybody's doing good thank you all for for sticking in with us here we're at the five hour and 24 minute mark of our um, pretty much an 11 hour stream, 654 minutes. Um, so we've had lots of wonderful guest speakers in today to talk about um, how they're doing and 
you know, their own personal experiences, the work that they're doing in their communities and their families <clears throat> and, um, and what they would like to see change to New Zealand, you know, how they would like to see action implemented. And I really like what James was saying there about, you know, we can be brave, but really we need to listen to people and then take action about it because thoughts and prayers go so far. Um, so I really admire those who are willing to step forward in their respective communities and really, um, really fight for change. So awesome, awesome chat from James. I'm just going to take a very quick second to send through the Zoom details to our next guest speaker. Um, Oh, how sweet. James just sent me a message. Thanks for the great session. Had lots of fun. Off to mow Nana's lawns now. We'll watch the replay um, when I get back. He's such a great guy. Thanks once again, James. Um, cool. So our next guest, um, Becca, she works with elderly and patient um, mental health. So she's going to be able to give us a really good perspective on um, things that a lot of our older population um, deal with such as um, isolation and that feeling of being a burden um, maybe to their family or to um, to those around them. Um, it's, it's something that I'm especially conscious of in, um, in my electorate here in Banks Peninsula for those who live here is, is actually we're quite a bunch of suburbs quite spread out and that some of those don't have easy access to service or even like a pharmacy and stuff um, so that isolation can be both uh, physical isolation and also mental isolation so um, I don't know much about this so it's going to be really good learning point for me to listen to Becca on this so I'm just going to let her into the zoom room now Kia ora, how are you doing? Hey, good, how's it going? Good, good, I'm just going to bang you across and we're pretty much live straight away. How's, how's your morning been? Um, yeah, good, yeah, enjoying the nice weather. Nice, yeah, it looks yeah. a bit windy but it's still really sunny which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, so everybody, Becca is going to talk to us about um, some issues that um, our elderly population face. So. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Becca, but you work in elderly inpatients? Um, yeah, older persons, mental health, yeah. yeah. Cool, awesome. So if you want to just give us a quick background on yourself, um, I've known Becca for years. We actually used to uh, work at a cafe together probably like over a decade ago. Um, and last time I bumped into Becca, I was wearing a pink bikini on the beach um, by Wild Foods in Hokitika. So, <laughs> awesome. So, Becca, if you want to take away and yeah. give us a bit of a background on um, who you are and what you do, um, and I'm sure myself and everyone here is really keen to hear about some of these issues that our um, older people are facing. Cool. Um, well, yeah, my name's Becca. Um, I'm a registered nurse, um, and I've worked and elder person's mental health, um, which is mental health services for people over 65 on and off for the past um, six years. Um, and I'm like, quite keen to just talk about this because um, in my opinion, older person's mental health um, and the issues around that isn't something that's kind of ever really been in the spotlight. Um, it's not really something that's been in the news very much. Um, no, it's great we've got this um, focus on mental health in general, but um, it kind of doesn't really highlight the um, issues that, you know, there is quite um, a lot of things going on um, in older person's mental health. Um, you know, there's lots of older people out there um, with a wide range of mental health issues, um, including dementia, but that's kind of like a little bit of a separate health issue. Um, so 
I won't really talk about that too much today. Um, but yeah, in my opinion, it's not really seen as a priority. Um, and yeah, I'm not really sure of the statistics, but um, you know, suicide is an issue in old people as well. I think I had a wee look um, earlier on in the suicide statistics in 2013. So over 85, um, people over 85 was like actually really big. So um, yeah, it's something worth kind of talking about. Um, yeah, we've got um, an ageing population in New Zealand as well. So it's something that's going to kind of, in my opinion, like creep up in the next 10 or 20 years. So if it's not something that we're really thinking about um, now, it could be like, quite of a shock to society and to the health system. Um, so most of the people um, that come to our services um, are predominantly there for anxiety and depression. Um, and you know, it kind of comes away but with the life stage as well. Um, you know, and when you're over 65, um, you know, you, people do a lot of contemplating on um, you know, and reminiscing on what what they've done throughout their lives. Um, and on on one hand, you've got, um, you know, somebody who feels like they've had a really, really positive life, um, and they think back and they say, oh, yeah, I've had a good life, good memories, um, you know, everything, it's all good. Um, and then on the other hand, um, some people, like, ruminate, ruminate on their regrets. Um, you know, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, should have done this differently. Um, and kind of without the distractions of the lives that they used to have when they had a job and were like busy and everything like that, um, those negative thoughts, um, they actually get quite intrusive sometimes. Um, yeah, and just also, like, you know, as you get older and you've got health issues and things like that, there's just a lot of time to kind of sit around and feel bad about that, which, um, you know, is fair enough, but... Um, we not just kind of all those negative thoughts become all encompassing. It's um, just quite hard for for people. Um, another kind of contributing factor that I think um, is kind of this change in family structure from what it used to be like. Um, and I'm talking about this from like a um, like a New Zealand Pākehā um, perspective. Um, like there used to be a lot more support. Um, for the elderly from their family. Um, now people just go into rest homes. I'm not saying that just because your family members in a rest home that um, you know that you don't care about them, but it's just it's just different. Like um, you know, when people get older, you know, their kids would look after them at home and things like that, um, and they would keep their kind of like um, tight knit family structure. And that's just a little, what's happening now is just a little bit different. So that, um, yeah, uh, one situation I can remember when I was a new graduate nurse is I was sitting down and talking to a lady about some strategies um, around you know, what she could do um, if she felt that her mood was um, if her mood was dropping, um, and I said to her, "Oh, you know, you could just talk to your family and friends." And she stopped and she looked at me and she said, look, dear, all my family have moved away and all my friends are dead. And I was kind of, you know, quite taken aback by how frank and honest she was being with me. But, um, you know, sort of reflecting back on that, I realised that, you know, she, she literally had no one. Like, she was at home by herself. Um, yeah, and when she got into trouble or, you know, wasn't feeling good and needed to reach out to somebody, she didn't really feel like that there was anyone that she could talk to. Um, you know, and we, we got a bit upset um, about being in lockdown for however long it was, like five weeks or whatever. Um, but for some people, some older people, um, that's their reality every day. Um, and it's been like that for a long time. And, you know, sometimes the only person that they might get to talk to is, you know, the man that comes to mow their lawns like once every two weeks or something like that. Um, you know, unfortunately, they do experience the loss of their friends and their partners and um, do get really socially isolated. 
I actually remember my grandma, who I loved very dearly, uh, before she was in a rest home uh, in Nelson up Toy Toy Street. She lived at um, these flats for elderly people. And she mm. would spend all day lent up against the little green fence out on the road. So she could just wave or talk to anybody that walked past or any car yeah. should be looking at them like, is that somebody I know? Um, <laughs> always looking out maybe maybe to check if it was family that weren't going to drop by and see her. Um, yeah, she was always out there just waiting for company. Um, mm. And what you said before, actually, I never really thought about it. And I guess it shows my ignorance about how you said that they, they've got all this time to dwell on things. And you know that's their positive memories but also their the stuff they're ruminating on and that's something i've never really considered considering also knowing myself that i keep busy otherwise i feel a bit depressed and like talking to raf earlier who was talking about how she keeps busy to run from facing those those demons that she has um so yeah i feel quite bad that i never really considered about that a significant part of the isolation and how that's really bad for them is actually just how much time they have stuck in their own head yeah yeah lots of spare time and you know some people some people thrive in that environment but you know i think it would get a bit old after a while and mm. you know you do they do realize that you know oh, i'm actually really lonely mm. you know yeah um is isolation yeah. like one of the biggest issues for for the elderly people you work with what's that is isolation one of the the primary issues that you deal with on a day-to-day -day? um it's part of the reason yeah um i think another one of the big ones is um just there's more of a generational stigma around um talking about mental health um, in the current elderly population. Um, and I think that kind of stems from back in the day, um, you know, if anybody had any sort of like quite severe mental health issues, um, you know, they were locked away. Um, and, you know, they were kept out of sight, they were out of mind. Um, you know, sometimes it was almost like a family secret. Um, and, yeah, I, I would say they were like locked up in mental institutions um so there's kind of um some people have talked about um you know the fear of speaking out about something um you know that they've got anxiety or depression and that they're not coping and the fear that you know they are going to get locked away and um just their um preconceived ideas about what mental health services are like um which fortunately has changed Quite a lot. Yeah, you um, raised such a good point there because yeah, I mean, it wasn't that long ago but, where people were getting locked up, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, and I think there's, there's also a lot of um, like embarrassment almost around, you know, people they've lived these um, wonderful lives and they've got through all these struggles throughout their life. And they've you know conquered everything that they've come to and then you know they're they might be oh, say like 70 and they just figure that they're not coping anymore and it's something that seems so small compared to everything else that they've been through mm. um and so they kind of think oh like it doesn't matter um i'll just get over yourself and they sit on it and it gets worse and worse and worse and it's not until um you know, it's actually affecting um, people's ability to do um, self-care and things like that, which is obviously a lot more important when you're older because if you're not eating and drinking and you're a bit frail, then it's, you know, you've got a really high chance of getting physically unwell. Um, and it's, yeah, it's most of the people that come in, it's, with, if it's their first kind of presentation, it has gotten that bad that you know they might have lost 10 kilos in like three months or um you know they haven't had a shower in like six months and yeah we hear some like pretty sad stories sometimes about how people just haven't been able to manage looking after themselves and it hasn't been picked up for a long time 
Do you find a, a lot of the people you work with are first time presentations or are there a lot of um, kind of people coming through again that have had lifelong um, fights with mental um, illness? A lot of, yeah, I'm a mixture of both, but there's um, most of the ones that come in for anxiety and depression. Um, you know, there are some that have had um, kind of lifelong problems with that, but a lot of the time it is a first presentation. And, um, you know, often after a big life event, like their partner's passed away or, um, you know, just a, they've experienced some sort of loss in their life or a big change and it's just um, affected them enough that um, just kind of tip them over the edge, I guess. Um, we don't see so much um, of the other kind of mental health things like psychosis and schizophrenia and the elderly population, um, but that is starting to come through, but that's just the reflection on um, the, um, I'm going to say, humaneness of mental health treatment. Um, because people who did have those things a long time ago, you know, they weren't treated very well, so they just had really poor health, so they've actually not lived long enough to come into our services, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but, um, but yeah, things are a lot better, better now. But That's good to hear. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we get a lot of first presentations of anxiety and depression here. Um before um oh sorry i lost my question um so there's been a really big focus with mental health around you know educating and kind of trying to normalize it do you think we've completely just missed how we can communicate that with the older population um yeah definitely mm. um yeah i mean like what is out there is, is great and it's really cool to hear, especially young people talking about their mental health and things like that. But um, yeah, I've never really seen anything that's been specifically targeted for older people. Um, and unless they're kind of already in the mental health system and they don't, yeah, they just, a lot of people think it's normal mm. um, and just, yeah, they don't get any help. Is mm. I would think in my work that most of the elderly presentation I deal with is actually probably drug addiction um, with a comorbidity mm. of a mental illness rather than just a mental illness on its own. And that's probably just because they've been in the methadone program for some time or have been involved in drug and alcohol counseling for some time. So yeah, now talking to you and, and thinking back on my client load, I don't, I don't work with a lot of elderly people with just mental health issues. And mm. I think that's what you're saying about getting those first presentations for depression and anxiety. And that just in general, there seems to be a bit of a, a hole in how we can really communicate and make services mm. easier for older, elderly people to access. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I can't actually think of any sort of anything that's been out in the media specifically tar targeted for old, old people. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, we've got a couple of really great community services, um, but um, you've got to. Um, get referred through your GP mostly to go to go to those. You can't just um, can't just walk up and go. Um, but they're quite um, the community services that are there, and, and they're they're great. Um, but they're not very diverse. And um, so, for example, if we refer somebody to like maybe a day program or something that they go to. Um, I think it's like once a week or something. And if they don't feel like they fit in with that kind of group, there's not really a lot of other options. It's kind of like that or nothing. Well, not nothing, but yeah, that's... Mm. 
Interesting. So something I wanted to ask you about that we haven't touched on yet is um, elderly people feeling like they're a bit of a burden on on their family and the people directly around them and how that can impact their mental health. Do you have much experience of seeing that on the out in the field? Um, yeah, um, definitely. Um, so, you know, in today's society, everyone, you know, you ask somebody, oh, how are you? And they just say, oh, I'm, I'm really busy. And that's just become the norm um, with most people these days. And um, a lot of old people feel like that you know, their families are too busy um, to be around to help them. Um, you know, they might say, oh, my daughter's already got three kids and her husband to look after. I don't want to worry her as well. But I'll be fine. Um, and, you know, in most cases, that's not true. Like, if, she, if they did ask their family, they would help. But it's just, that's what their perspective is. They don't. They don't want to be a burden on their families. Um, and it's, you know, when you, when you get older and you're needing um, help, you've got, you're, you're losing your independence. You might not be able to drive anymore. Um, you might need help doing your groceries. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a, a pride thing as well um, that, you know, they, they don't want to ask for help. Mm. Um, and, but depression is great um, at making people feel like that anyway. Um, but then when you've got a lot of other things going on, when you actually do need to ask for lots of help for other things, then it kind of um, it contributes to um, you know, actual real-life situations um, instead of just situations in your head about feeling like being a burden. Yeah. So how do we, how do we help elderly people that are physically isolated like living in small um, communities that are a bit far away yeah um, well I mean I think what's what's really important is um, I'm not I'm not don't have any really great ideas about how to help people if they're like geographically isolated if that's what you mean mm. um but you know somebody can feel socially isolated even if they're living in a, a block of flats um you know and they've got like five different neighbors or whatever but um mm. yeah Jeff, i've seen that firsthand really that feeling of loneliness and i mean not knowing not knowing one's neighbors or feeling safe to know one's neighbors so what so what can we do as a community to uh, better understand how elderly people are feeling in regards to their mental health do we need to listen more do um, we need to make more contact yeah, just think about what it was like for us when we were all in lockdown and think about what it would feel like living like that for the rest of your life and also add to that the fact that you might not understand how to use a cell phone, you might not understand how to use a computer. Um, so that's kind of how I could try and get people to think about if they want to relate to how people are feeling. Yeah, that's a really good way to think of it, actually. Um, when I've talked to um, when I've talked to some people, some people um, at work, um, they just say that um, you know people are really busy in in their own lives and they don't feel acknowledged. Um, so you know they just walk past you in the street or something like that. Um, and, you know, they say, oh, I wish that person talked to me or something like that. So, I don't know. Um, mm. Give them a wave, give them a smile, um, just anything that pretty much says, you know, I see you, you're appreciated and you're cared about, which is the same as what everyone else wants, really. Um, and nine times out of ten, they'll probably appreciate that heaps. Mm. Um, and... 
if you are worried about um, an older person, um, there's also age concern that you can contact. Um, so um, it's you can ring them up and it can be like an anonymous kind of referral um, and you can talk about your concerns about somebody and say, well, you know, I haven't seen them out and about very much anymore and every time I've seen them, they seem really sad and I don't know, I noticed that their cat died and they, you know, I think they're a bit lonely and it um, doesn't really seem like they have anybody. Um, so age concern can give them but either a phone call, they can um, drop a pamphlet in their um, letterbox and that just kind of gives them the opportunity um, to reach out um, if they want to. Awesome. That's really cool. That's a really good tangible takeaway for us. Because listening to you talk makes me feel um, like I need to better action things in my personal life um, for the elderly people around me, you know, and around my family stuff like that mm. so thank you for giving me the kick in the bum <laughs> that, yeah. I, that i need oh good and hopefully um <laughs> hopefully that's been a good kick in the bum for other people watching because yeah i i i think something i've learned today listening to you becca is that our elderly people are just getting left behind you know we're when we're looking at trying to fix mental health there isn't a lot of work going towards helping them or understanding them i think you know like obviously becca you work in this field um and you'd know the kind of funding issues you might face where mm -hmm. you know we see a lot of campaigns around for young people's mental health and well-being but not much for the elderly people and becca mentioned at the start that the suicide statistics for elder people was it 2013 you said um, I think so. I just quickly looked at it before yeah. I jumped on here. But, but I'm, I'm pretty sure pretty yeah. much year on year, actually, um, for elderly people over the age of 80, the suicide rate is actually quite high. Um, yeah. It tends to be youth and then kind of like middle-aged men and then people over the age of 80. So mm -hmm. it, is, it is quite a common occurrence, sadly. So given that they're overrepresented, I think, um, it's definitely a discussion we should be having a bit more. Mm. So yeah, we have um, we have this poster at work, and it's got a picture of an older person, um, and then they're looking in the mirror, um, and what they're seeing in the mirror is um, you know everything that they've done in their life. They're seeing their reflection as like a younger person, and all these things behind them that's happened. Um, in their life that's made them who they are, the experiences that they've had and everything. And um, the idea behind the poster is like, you know, just, you might just see like a little old lady, but, you know, they've got such a, mm. a cool story behind them um, and so much wisdom and, um, you know, life experiences and things like that. And, um, I've, yeah, it just encourages you to kind of think about them from rather just, rather than just what you see, but um, yeah, and in and, and other cultures, um, you know, elderly people are really revered, mm. um, they're looked on as, you know, like the old, the old wise one, um, but here in New Zealand, I don't feel like, well, in um, like Pākehā culture, I don't feel like that's happening, and yeah, they're just not really um, seen as a uh, priority. Yeah, I've seen that in Japanese culture, how old people are treated. Um, and it's very, very different to here. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. Like, there's a lifetime worth of experience and wisdom and stories there if we just choose to listen, right? Yeah. So awesome. Thanks so much for coming in, Becca. I'm going to grab a quick water and get ready for our next guest. That's been um, really eye-opening for me. Um, I've possibly learned the most in the past 25 minutes than I have all day um, because uh, that's something that I'm not really actively engaged in a lot and um, I think I should reevaluate how I uh, maintain some uh, relationships even just with my neighbor you know so um, thanks very much Becca for dropping by super super awesome information to to hear and um, yeah let's just do what Becca says and get out there and get to know our the elderly people around us.
So on behalf of everybody, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for dropping by. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thanks. See ya. Take care. Kakite. Oof, we've learned a lot today. It's been really good. Um, I can't believe, you know, I myself probably see myself as somebody that um, thinks about minority groups or affected peoples in our community and how I maintain my position within those communities and what I can do to help them and to just kind of talk with Becca then and realize that um, there's so much more I could be doing and just in terms of um, simple conversations you know a really easy fix just to engage with um, some of our elderly community and yeah, like she said, they have stories. They have a lot of stories. They've lived a whole life, you know. One day we will be in their shoes, and I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be happy with being written off as just another little old person, you know. There's there's a lot of a lot of story there and a lot of wisdom to share. So I'm just going to take a quick moment to make a coffee because that's who I am. It'll be like a coffee today, I think, um, and just ensure that our next guest has our. Uh, Zoom link. So we've just had Becca, who's a registered nurse who works with um, elderly inpatients with mental health issues. And next we've got Jono, who's actually on the top board and he's a GP. So nice little segue there. And then after we've talked to Jono, we're actually just going to have a bit of a, a debrief and questions again for half an hour before we kick into the last long slog. Cool. So I'll be back and just a couple minutes. Thanks.
Unmute, unmute. Okay, kia ora, we're back and up and running. Okay, it looks a little bit jumpy. Hope it's coming through okay for everybody. Let me know if it's not. Cool, so we are six hours through exactly. So five hours and, uh, sorry, four hours and 54 minutes to go. Cool. So we're gonna bring in Jono. He is on the Opportunities Party board and he is a GP. So we're gonna get a bit of an idea um, from his perspective. And are we working? Kia ora, how you doing, Jono? Can you hear me, mate? Yeah, we got you. Loud yeah, clear. good, good, I can't see you. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to, because I think the priority for the camera is going to um, the thing that's streaming out to everything, so. Okay, no worries. Yeah, as long as you, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. So everybody, this is Jono. He's going to um, give us a bit of an idea on his background and and I think talk about how how he experiences mental health from the perspective of a of a doctor, a GP, and um, and then we'll probably dig into some questions about um, how people can access services and and how um, GPs assess mental health um, when people arrive to discuss how they're feeling. So, kia ora, Jono, take it away, mate. Thanks, Ben. And, um, yeah, just uh, I think what you're doing today is, is amazing and, and it's so important. And um, I've been flicking in and out and, and just seeing, um, you know, a number of really different and interesting stories that you've been telling and, and conversations that you've been having. So this is just really, really cool what you're doing. Kia ora, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, so my name is Jono. Um, I'm a GP um, in Auckland. Um, I work out in South Auckland, and, and um, I also do <clears throat> some. Uh, I'm a clinical analyst as well, so I get involved in some of the digital side of um, healthcare. And I mean, mental health um, is is such a, a big part of of my job such an important part of my job and when um whenever you're seeing a patient um you know there, there, there always has to be considerations for um how someone is um doing in in relation to you know if, if, even if it is a more physical problem you know a, a busted shoulder or, or, or something like that that um you know that has uh, ramifications for someone is feeling and viewing themselves, um, as well as people's, you know, social and economic circumstances. So, um, you know, mental health is really at, at, at the core of, um, of what I do. Um, and, um, you know, cannot be understated about how important it is. And particularly at this, um, at this time, um, things like COVID, um, social media, um, you know, a, a list of other pressures uh, are, are pushing um, pushing for uh, us to really think quite critically about, um, you know, how we're looking after each other, what kind of society we want to create. Um, and so I guess I see myself as a GP sort of as one small cog in, in that overall um piece that, that's looking to, to support and, and, and to improve things for people. Um, so in terms of my my background, so um, so I've been a doctor for almost eight years now. Um, I worked in Tauranga Hospital for a while, um, did some paediatrics, did a diploma in paediatrics, um, and then moved up to Auckland and started my general practitioner training and finished that last year. Um, and have done some extra uh, training in, in, in digital health and uh, I've been sort of working on some of the COVID response stuff too. Um, and yeah, that's, that's sort of much of my professional background. I've done some research um, and 
yeah, that's that's sort of me, I guess. Nice, awesome. Thanks, man. Um, um, what would be a good first question? Um, how do you find people generally when they're presenting um, to discuss mental health with, with you? Do you find that some people are quite open about how they're feeling? Do you think some people kind of dress it down a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so, um, I mean, of, of course, everybody is, is different. And, um, you know, there are different contexts where people are vastly ready to be more open than other times. And uh, some of that has to do very um, specifically with their situation. And other times it's the relationship that you have. Um, so, you know, for, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know. So I'm sure there was many times where people came in uh, having a really challenging time um, and, you know, we, we spoke about something different, uh, a different health concern, and um, and we weren't able to, to, to get to the, to the real root of things. Um, but in, in my experience, um, patients tend to be actually quite open with how things are going um, because in some respects they've already made the decision to come to see me mm. and and I suspect that it's probably the biggest decision to make is you know making the appointment getting in the car you know opening the door those kinds of things and I think for some people that's that's all they've kind of gotten to and so hopefully once they kind of come through the door, that's where I can help, um, you know, explore some of the, the, the questions and some of the struggles that they're going through. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, yeah, as I say, you, yeah, you don't know what you miss, and I'm sure there, there'll be plenty that I do miss, but I do find patients are, are, are relatively good at opening up to me. Um, and there are times where, where, you know, you just have to park back things that, that you can tell either you're not the right person, um, it's not the right time. Mm. Um, those, those sorts of things uh, all come into play. So let's do a little hypothetical. Say if I uh, came to your practice and, and I explained that um, I've been feeling not like myself for the past few months. I haven't been eating well, uh, maybe been using uh, drugs and um, have kind of lost my passion to do things that I would normally find interesting. What would be the first steps that a GP would take? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, importantly, I mean, this, this isn't necessarily for... Um... Uh, just GPs, but the first thing is to listen, mm. um, to 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 pause, um, and to to really listen and to really um, give the person the time and the space to uh, articulate and express um, what's really going on. Mm. Um, sometimes people, it's the first time of said these kinds of things. It's the first times they've, they've said it out loud and they've heard the words. Um, and so allowing people the, the time to do that is, is, is crucial. Um, you know, the, the way that we're trained um, is, is all about safety. So the, the, the first start is, is somebody's immediate danger. Um, and, and that's, part of that first piece of processing that I have to do is to understand is this person a risk to themselves uh, or a risk to others mm -hmm. um, and, and 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 that's a that's a foundational piece to, to how you assess someone but yeah listen, listening is the is the first the first part and you know there you know I, I hate to say the word agendas but you know that <laughs> patients will have a particular view on on what's going on and and of course from our clinical experience we have uh, a view on um 
the relative weightings of certain things. So, you know, if you mentioned uh, at-risk drug taking, whereas um, the patient might be more uh, concerned with their job, um, I would try to, um, you know, have this conversation about what is the, the biggest immediate risk to somebody and, and um, you know, uh, drug use and alcohol abuse and things like that. Well, with us, just going to re-bump Zoom. Um, well, it's just having an issue there. Okay, let's see if this is working now. Let's see if this is working. Okay, mate. All right, do I have you back? Um, Oh no, Zoom is struggling. Be here with us everybody, just a little technical issue. Okay, Jono, can you hear me? Or is Zoom tripping? Okay, everyone, bear with us. Just struggling to get Zoom working in our favor. Welcome to 2020. I will just pop this up while we just try to get things sorted.
Kia ora, how's that? Um, we are having problems with Zoom, but it appears that this is going. Uh, frame rate's working. Okay. So, um, my computer is just struggling with running Zoom as well at the moment. So, we've, we've lost um, Jono, who's our GP that we're having a chat with, but maybe hopefully we can touch base with him later. Um, we're just about to get in some good nuggets there. Um, so, if someone could jump in the comments, let me know if this is working. That would be awesome. Luckily, we're actually at a bit of a break. We don't actually have our next guest for another 20 minutes. So I'm hoping that if we're just running as we are like this for a bit, my computer will chill out. I don't really understand computers that well, but hopefully it'll chill out a bit by the time we come to bring our next guest in. Hopefully it will be working. Um, if it is not working, what I will do is I will phone people and I will just have my phone here and we will be able to hear them. Not the best, but a workable solution nonetheless, so we can continue streaming. So we're at six hours, 37 minutes and 20 seconds. Um, huge. So we've got about another four hours and 15 odd minutes left to go. So pretty much where we were at with Jono, I guess, is that he was talking about... Um, he was talking about how everybody um, presents differently and has different needs and stuff. And so they're assessed, obviously, different regarding their mental health when they present um, at a GP. So um, what what we were up to talking about was actually finding out kind of what's the pathway for people to get involved in specialist mental health services, which is something I really want to get into, um, which you missed. So um, if we don't get back to Jono, I will find that out from him. And I will post that as a comment. So, welcome back. It's working. Yay, technology. <laughs> Thanks, Josiah, for coming in and um, sorting us back out. Um, the computer was running at like 40-something percent, and it was struggling. And now it's back down to around 20. So, fingers crossed, this means... Um, we can bring people in later. If it doesn't know, I will just phone them. Cool. So if everybody's still in, drop me some questions. Let's let's chat some mental health. Um, we just had a real good um, run of guests, actually. Um, for those who weren't here, we had Tatiana, who was talking about um, mental health for women, and especially women who are victims of um, domestic and sexual violence and how um, they can access some services. So that was really um, good to hear from her perspective. Then we heard from uh, my friend James, who um, has ADHD and autism, as well as suffering um, from mental health. So he was really awesome, as he always is. Um, always great with the banter as James, and he was able to give us some really good insights um, as to what it's like to live with a neurological um, disease and so I um, really appreciated having him on as I'm sure everybody that was listening at that time did. Um, he was on at 2pm so if you if you happen to watch this video back you can just go and jump in at five hours and then you'll you'll find him. Then we have Beckerin who, um, who's a registered nurse and she works in um, elderly and patient mental health so she was able to really open my eyes a bit to what it's like for elderly our elderly community and how mental illness was viewed back in the day and I, and I know this a little bit from my study actually around um, institutionalization and how people used to be put into mental hospitals that were more like prisons and um, and some kind of negative things around that so there is still a bit of stigma there for that older generation as to what a um, what mental health support or having a mental illness actually looks like um, in terms of experiencing it and how other people perceive it. So that was a really, really good chat from her. And then we had John Owen, who's um, a board member for TOP and um, was able to give us some real good perspectives um, from a GP before he lost him due to technical difficulties. Um, but we're back. Yay. I didn't, I didn't think we would get that back running, but here we are. Um, so, I'm just going to run back because I think I missed um, 
missed a couple statements and stuff earlier and questions. So there's um, a question here. What can churches and other community groups do to better support mental health? Good question. So one of the first things anyone can do is listen. Like actually find out what people need and what you can what you can provide to them as a form of assistance but really it's about um getting all community groups involved together because sometimes some groups like to try and run things by themselves but really what we know from a person-centered approach is that we really need organizations to work together to better benefit the client or the person that's that's seeking assistance so the best way that a community group or a church could could help the um the people who are accessing their service or their their um the members of their church is to try and build a network of supports around that person so finding what they need finding how you can in the current system finding how you can refer them or get them involved in those services a lot of the time it might require a GP referral or a referral from specialist mental health. Um, but if you're just looking to maybe like creative art groups and stuff like Google is your friend, reaching out just community groups on Facebook, finding out what other things are out there for people to get engaged with and really just build supports around a person. So because if you have one support and that support fails you or Sometimes I, I see this with um, people accessing services is that they might do a couple no-shows and feel that the service doesn't want them anymore, even though that might not be the case. So they just kind of self-discharge and in doing so then fail to be connected with any other services or support. So then they're stuck, isolated again with no assistance. So being able to have multiple supports around a person means that if one falls, the others are still there to carry them. It makes it easier for those other services to help that person re-engage in the service that they've disengaged from. So really it's just about thinking uh, less internally about what one can do to help another and to hold hands with those around you to create a better network. So good question. Um, good question there. Uh, Yeah, there was a statement here um, about spending too much time at work and that we don't spend enough time in our communities. The breakdown of our communities is, in my opinion, the biggest reason for increasing mental illness because many of us are alone and lonely. Funnily enough, in a world as connected as it is, like with the internet, um, connections like at an all-time low. I mean, I don't know if it's because we have this ease of contacting people now like it's so easy at any time you could just pick up your phone and contact anybody that you just fall into a habit of knowing you can just do that anytime so then you just don't do it or you get easily distracted by other things and life can be distracting in itself um but yeah that you're right into that comment there about actually not having that, that breakdown in community spirit and, and access and togetherness is something that I agree is a contributing um, social um, determinant in decreasing mental health. You know, I do see that from a lot of churches. Um, they're able to bring that sense of community and oneness and unity together, um, but not, you know... And as we've seen a step, and I'm not a religious person by any means, but as we've seen a step away as a country from organized religion, I think we need to start looking at if we're moving away from that. Um, and I'm just speaking about that in terms of what the census has shown, the last two census. Um, how do we replace that sense of community? How do we engage with those around us and ensure that those supports are still available? Um, especially for, as we talked about before, our elderly. Um, so yeah, and I mean, I've been harping on about a lot today, but it's about those community helps and actually having those 
places that don't have barriers to access where you can just get in and get involved even when you're fine like that's something i talk about a lot is that even if you feel that you're mentally fine and good there's no reason why you shouldn't be connecting with services or community groups or community in general in terms of just being able to be connected to something um, or talking to a counsellor even, because it's much better to continually do those. And we talked about that earlier as like a, a mind service in your mind, like you would a car, you know. It's better to just keep on top of things and regularly check in rather than wait till things hit crisis point. Because when things hit crisis point, it's very difficult to um, cope with everything, like Every step in crisis is difficult. It's very, very challenging. But those steps are a little bit easier if if you're not in crisis. So being able to act... Hi, Craig. Being able to access those services or community groups um, earlier and more if easily, um, making them more adequately available should theoretically um, help reduce that social um, determinant Craig's back for a visit. Cool, so our next guest is on in 13 minutes. Um, he's a candidate for the Opportunities Party. So um, he's going to be talking about his own mental health journey. But um, if you want to fire any questions his way, then um, get going. So his name's Andrew K. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right, but we'll, we'll get that right when he's here. Um, so I'm just going to take a quick bathroom break. I probably should have done this when we were fixing the computers before, but I didn't. Um, so I'm going to take a really quick bathroom break. I'll be back in two.
Kia ora, we're back. So we're just about to jump into our final leg. So um, if everything runs to plan and we get everybody in, um, from here there won't be any breaks really between guests. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guests to go. Uh, and we are pretty much at four hours left. Crazy. I can't believe we've been here for almost seven hours already. I'm starting to have to like stretch out my lower back and stuff. So kia ora, thank you to everybody that's dropped in so far. Um, to everybody that's left a comment, to everybody that's spoken with us and shared their perspectives. We're doing 654 minutes of live streaming to honour the 654 people we lost to suicide in New Zealand last year. We're doing this because it's Mental Health Awareness Week um, and I am the uh, mental health spokesperson for the Opportunities Party. A uh, value I live by is um, it's basically uh, to just do the action, you know, like there's, there's talking and there's doing things, saying things online and then there's actually doing something about it. So I thought that what I could do to honour Mental Health Awareness Week and hi Craig and to talk about um, the, prop, the issues we face in New Zealand is to actually get on many different people from many different communities um, with many different perspectives and to actually share share their experience with you and their perspectives so we can better understand people in general okay so we've had quite a diverse group of people and today, speaking about, um, you know, their personal experiences and the experiences of those that they work with, um, it's been quite valuable so far, I've found, and I hope other people have found that as well. My cat is very smoochy. There's, I can't actually put it into words how smoochy she is. Um, I need to stop buying black clothes, that's for sure. Cool, so our next guest will be popping in in just a few minutes. <laughs> yep, big scratch, there you go. I'm gonna have to like take a five minute break in like an hour so I can um, make dinner for the cats, otherwise they will be a huge pest. All right. Hmm? Kiss? All right. You are molten. Okay. <laughs> My cat, everybody. I love it when people are um, dropping in to say hi to Craig. She loves the live stream she does. Um, oh, I love this comment from, from Deb. Here we go. Recovery is living well in the absence or presence of one's mental illness. So keep connections up when feeling well. It's amazing what you can offer and give back to others. Very true. Very, very true. Thank you. Thank you for that, Deb. All right. Hmm. Knocking on the door of seven hours. How good. Okay. Cool. So if we if we lose our connection here, what we're gonna do is um just pop it over to the screen that's saying just hold fire for a couple minutes and I'll call Andrew. Um, I have a feeling it might work okay now, but just in case, if it does go a bit sketchy, um, we'll sort it out in a couple minutes. So hold tight with us. Thank you. Here he is. Hello. Just in case, if it does go a bit sketchy, 
You might need to um turn the volume down, Andrew, but we've got you. You got me? Oh, yeah. I've got you playing on the speaker. How's that? <laughs> Perfect. Looking good. Nice background. Yeah, um fortunately Dan set that up for us. It's uh, oh. it's the map, it's my arm. Oh, so, beautiful. Uh, Here we go. So everybody else can see it. We've got you on the screen now. Oh, exciting. I can't nice. see me. Is so, there anyone I can see you? Oh, this um, is me. Not via Zoom, but if you have uh -huh. um, our chat up, it'll probably be a bit behind, so it might confuse you. But yeah, you're not missing yeah. much by missing my face, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's been a lovely face. I've been enjoying the stream today. Seven hours, I think you just said. Yeah, seven hours, knocking on the door. It's um, It's gone quick, really. I guess lots of uh, different chats, which has been really, really nice. Um, mm. So before we go forward, how do I say your last name so I've got it right? Uh, Kai, same Kai. as today for food, just spelled differently. Beautiful. There we go. Got it right now. Um, so for everybody, this is Andrew Kai. Uh, he is the Opportunities Party candidate for Tauranga, yeah? Yes. Nice, nice. So Andrew's going to drop in today to have a chat with us about um, his lived experience. So... Um, once again, if anybody needs wants to share anything in the comments, fire away. I'll keep an eye on those and I can send them to to Andrew. Um, don't don't grill him too much about politics. This is more about mental health, so <laughs> be nice. <laughs> um, but Kilda, bro, like tell us tell us your background, where you're from. Give us give us the the ten to fifteen minute um, life story, and then we'll start throwing some questions at you. Well, thank you. Um, well, I am Andrew, obviously. Um, I was born in Auckland and I grew up there for the first 10 years of my life. Um, and then my dad had a heart attack and wanted to get out of the, uh, the road race, the stress race. And so we moved to Tauranga, um, down to lovely Papanoa, just a couple of hundred metres from the beach. And that was awesome. Um, Tauranga's a lovely place. And then I did my schooling here. I went to university in Auckland to become a physiotherapist. And then I did some uh, brief work over in uh, Melbourne. And eventually I came home kind of back to Tauranga to live with my parents at the depths of my mental health journey. <laughs> um, do I just ramble about it? Yeah, go. You just you um, be as open so would, or as, you know, just be as comfortable as you, you want to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm generally pretty open about it, though I'm often talking about depression will uh, get me emotional because there's a pathway in my brain now that I've come to accept. The brain's like a muscle, and um, and the more you work it, <clears throat> the more the pathways form. And uh, usually with uh, depression, it, uh, it just triggers this pathway that I get a bit of emotional but um so when i was 15 is when my journey really started um because my brother passed away in a car accident and that sucked obviously um but it it took my world from me i went to a religious school at the time <clears throat> and my understanding of the texts and my understanding of the religion was essentially that my brother was now suffering for the rest of eternity and that drove me away from the religion. And so I lost my circle of friends who were all religious. Um, and that happened in sixth form of high school. And everything else just moves on. It's something you learn very quickly about grief. Um, and obviously it's hard for you to do so. So I lost my circle of friends. The sixth form was an absolute daze. Um, seventh form was patchy um, and then ultimately as I said I went to um, Auckland to study physiotherapy I did pretty well there made some good friends at university um, I, had, I was with my high school sweetheart at the time and after university she struggled to find work so I was getting a lot of pain in my hands from physiotherapy and being the only income in our relationship, there was a lot of pressure on me to kind of just carry on going. And then we moved to Melbourne um, because there were more work opportunities for both of us. Unfortunately, because of the professional association, my partner couldn't, at the time couldn't find work. Um, and so again, the burden fell on me 
to provide the only income. And um, so during this time, I was battling with depression and a bit of hopelessness. And then I burnt out at work. Um, I just I just couldn't handle working anymore. Um, so my escape for that was to smoke marijuana. Um, cannabis, I believe I should call it. Um, and so not having a social circle, not having friends, not being able to meet people, and then kind of just going to work, going home, and then smoking myself to oblivion, um, I really spiraled down. At about the same time, I started to use my science knowledge to get into the literature of climate change. And so all of these things kind of compounded together that I just had a real hopelessness for the future um, and my present situation. And so my ex-wife got pregnant and then we had our little son and that was, she got pregnant at about the time I was almost arriving at the conclusion that I didn't want to bring a child into this world. And so then that added on top, like the future that he's going to have and the life that he's going to have. Um, and then we separated and she moved back to Tauranga and I followed soon after. And it was kind of a very similar position, whereas now I was on the benefit. Um, I was smoking a lot to numb the pain and just generally feeling pretty useless with myself and my life. Like I hadn't turned out the way I'd envisaged in my young, optimistic ways. And again, not having a job makes it hard to meet people. It's pretty hard to make friends as an adult these days anyway. And it just continued to spiral that I had no social circle, no support, no capacity to really get support. I had my immediate family and they were really amazing. But on the flip side of it is what a lot of people will understand if you've been through the situation is I just felt like a burden on other people. Um, and I didn't want to be that burden. And then just as I was starting to get better, my dad passed away. And again, that knocked me for six because he was the one I was really relying on at that time. Um, and eventually I moved in with my mum and her partner, but still had that battle of not wanting to be a burden on anyone and not really being able to get help. Eventually my GP put me on the wait list to see a public health counselor, a DHB counselor. Mm -hmm. And I had one, she was amazing. And then she just disappeared. Um, I got a call for one appointment saying she was away and it'd be canceled. And then same thing next week. And then the week after they called me and said she's gone. And, um, and they'll put me on a list to see someone else. And everyone else refused to see me until I quit smoking cannabis. Um, but the irony was that I couldn't stop smoking cannabis because I needed to address the issues that were driving me to smoke it. Um, so I really continued on that downward spiral for another year or two, just kind of mulling around. When I had my son, um, I'd give him all my focus. And then when I didn't have my son on the days he was with his mother, I would just smoke myself into oblivion. And it wasn't until about, oh, what are we up to now? At the start of this year, um, that I got my, got a little dog, um, and he really helped because he gave me a solid routine every day and got me out every day. And that's when I started to really begin to move forward. Um, and then eventually I applied to, to stand at the top because there's no one around. And, um, uh, I thought it'd be better to have a face on the local billboard instead of just the branding like it was last time. And, um, and that's been really good, having a purpose again and having hope again. I know Naomi speaks about it, if you've ever heard her, but I get a lot of hope from top that we might actually be able to change some of things for the future. Um, so that's been really cool. But that's the, the, the short window of my battle. Um, there were a couple of times where I was really close to taking my own life and Having, I didn't, the main reason that stopped me from doing it was my mom, because I didn't want her to have a pair of two sons. Mm -hmm. um, but having my own son was really difficult because there's a part of you that wants to be there for them. And then there's the other part of you that just convinces you they'll be better off without you. 
And that's a really hard demon to overcome. Um, so yeah, that's that's been my journey. <laughs> um, thanks for sharing, and I'm really sorry to hear about your your brother initially, and then your dad. Um, little things, well, not little things, but things like that can just set you on a whole new path, can't they? Yeah, and it was it was a really inconvenient moment. Like it's never particularly. Mm. But um, it was just that, that I, like I was 15 at the time, like it was just that, that age where you're kind of trying to discover everything and then to just to lose it all. And I think, as I mentioned in the comments earlier, one of the biggest problems with our society today is that we just don't have a community anymore. Mm. Um, if you go back for the longest of times, um, well, we're quite tribal by nature, and then when we got into the bigger cities, it was very much based around religion. We had our weekly meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was as much to, to learn about your religion as it was to, to catch up with the community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one of the studies that I read a while ago now that really shocked me was, I think it was done about 10 or 15 years ago, and I asked how many people, if you were in a state of crisis, how many people could you call? And I believe the, uh, the average number was three or four. And then when they read the study, the average number, the median number was three, but the most common number was zero. Most people had absolutely no one they could call in a state of crisis. Um, and I think that's really telling because, you know, kind of to deviate a little bit, or maybe not, um, solitary confinement is considered a cruel and unusual punishment. Um, and many of our people are so alone these days. Um, because our communities are so detached from each other in a way that I don't think they really ever have been before. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I totally vibe with all of that. And, and I bet a lot of people watching too have probably done this before. When, when I was quite depressed, I thought, who can I reach out to? And I went into Facebook because that's how I communicate with pretty much everybody. Um, I don't really use Instagram. I don't really text message. I just have everybody on Facebook. It's a lot easier that way. And I would just scroll through my entire friend list and go, oh, you know, none of these people are really who I would reach out to in a crisis. Um, and it's not about them as a person, but just about how I viewed my relationship with them. Or if there was someone that I thought I could reach out to, it would be like, oh, well, you know, they're actually real busy with this thing at the moment. So you would just kind of disregard it. And I think a lot of people would have probably either done that or experienced that very similar thing in a connected world, feeling very, very disconnected. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, again, the burden thing is like you don't have a place, you're burden on anyone. And then... If you do get knocked back, there were a couple of people that I reached out to um, at different times, and the responses weren't particularly great. Like the, the first one and the most solid one was um, was kind of the old, you know, just think happy thoughts, try harder, and you'll overcome it kind of thing. Um, and then that brings you down more because you don't want to reach out because you don't want to be kind of dismissed in that way. Um, and the other major problem I faced, and a lot of men out there will <clears throat> potentially understand, was that I had consistently had beat out of me that we shouldn't show emotion. Um, in my final year of high school, when they gave out the high school awards, um, I managed to win the, the year group's most emotional person. Um, there was me and two girls going for the award as a nominee. Um, and, and they made sure to say before they gave it to me, like, this, this is a joke award. Um, but the only thing that I really took away from that was that, all right, I'm not supposed to show emotion. Yeah. And then there were a number of other kind of events that, that built upon that, and it got to the point that I didn't realize that I could only feel two emotions. I could only feel happiness or anger. And every other shade of emotion was funneled into those two feelings, mm. uh, which is obviously just not a healthy way to express yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Before you were talking about um, your story, and, and there was a lot of parallels to your own, 
actually, um, a heavy, heavy cannabis user um, in my 20s until maybe the age of 23, 24. Um, I, never, I never quit cannabis. I ended up just gradually smoking less to the point that I didn't really smoke it anymore. But what I really noticed was you talk about finding your purpose. And um, I love that because that purpose is the one thing that changed my life when it came to my own mental health journey. And I always acknowledge that everybody has their own journeys and that everybody's journey is different. And that purpose worked for me, but it probably won't work for most people. But yeah, finding my purpose, which I've actually defined down to a very simple sentence, um, helping people help people. Um, so it's about providing pathways for people to help other people um and once i kind of drilled into that and found my way to engage in community i had my purpose and things have changed dramatically especially for me in the last year um and so purpose is a really massive thing and i think church in a way offers and i don't mean this disrespectfully in any way but church can offer like a kit set purpose for a lot of people who might not have the means or the mental fortitude at that time because they're struggling to to find their own purpose but church provides a community and a place where you can kind of have a purpose built for you and you can engage with immediately so it does actually provide that really quick connection that some people look for yeah absolutely um and that, that's what I got from physical therapy. My passion was for helping people. Um, but it also contributed to my burnout because the people that needed my help the most, um, an ACC would recover it, or so on, so on and so forth. And these were typically the poorer people who were injured and needed to get back to work and couldn't get similar to me, couldn't get the help they needed to achieve the goals that were required. Mm. Um, and it can become a very vicious cycle of you can't get the help, so you can't improve, so you can't do what you need to to continue to get better. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a challenge. Um, before you were talking about uh, when you started studying climate change and you became quite disillusioned, what do you think we can do about climate anxiety, especially for the younger generation that are quite passionate about it? That's a tough one. Um, the simplest thing, obviously, would be to do something. Um, and I don't know that to sound like a lazy answer, but like one of the big things that depressed me is like, well, we've known this about this for the last 25 years when I was doing my study. Um, and an absolutely certainty, with absolute certainty for last 15, you can argue about the the accuracy of the inputs or the time frames of it, but the, the direction has been very well known, and we have systematically not only just ignored the problem, but made it worse in pretty much every facet. Mm. Um, so, like, I think the biggest thing to start with was that we actually, as a collective, start to do something serious about it and, yeah. and, and still really there has been so little movement in that regard and um and i understand and, and i believe the rates of anxiety and depression in our young are through the roof and like one of the number one things that they kind of mentioned with that is is the climate anxiety and i understand that that it provides a lot of hopelessness for the future because if you understand the, the reality of the literature that we're facing, it's uh, it can be quite daunting to know that that's the world you're going to exist in. And yeah, yeah, there's not a lot. It's that overwhelming. There's not a lot you can do about it by yourself. We need serious collective action, yeah. and it just doesn't seem to be on the cards. Yeah, it's a it's a challenge that one, isn't it? And our, our younger generation have had to deal with a lot recently with climate anxiety, with COVID, down here in Christchurch with the, the earthquakes and um, the also the mosque shooting and the Port Hill fires. There's been a lot, a lot going on. Yeah, 
Yeah, and we know four rights. Uh, and I might be wrong with how it's changed now, but like when I went through the education system, there was just nothing mm. um, about coping strategies, about um, mental resilience, about anything. And, and even back then, it wasn't one ago, we've come a long way. Um, no one really understood depression at all or anxiety at all. And it was still a very harsh thing. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you think we could do to better prepare the youth? Oh, basically, it comes down to education and um, giving people the pathway to feel like they can do something tangible about it. Um, and that comes back to my purpose again, like helping people help people. It's about trying to lay out those pathways for people to get involved and something i try to action in my communities a lot of the time is don't give money because money's a cop out uh, money's the easy thing to get. Yeah. give time and give effort give give something really tangible to make a difference i was when i was planning this i was initially thinking that uh we could try and get people to like donate money for every minute we do it or something but i didn't want this to be about money i wanted it to be about time and listen to people's perspectives because i think that's important with mental health and um and so it comes down to a lot of social issues i one of my pet peeves is what i, what I call slacktivism which is when you complain about things on the internet but don't actually take any action on it um so yeah because if you if you don't action something within the twenty four hour first twenty four hours after becoming upset about something, chances are you'll never action it. So I always try to encourage people to action yeah. things straight away and just find something tangible that they can do. Some things are really difficult, and especially with the climate crisis. You might feel like, oh well, if I stop eating meat, then that's not really going to be enough. But just that process of actioning something changes who you are and how you will proceed to action things in the future. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, that's absolutely true. It's giving um, people a big kick in the bum, really. Yeah. And, and to be fair, that's why I got into top, um, mm. because I was ranting on the internet often enough and it just <laughs> got to the point, uh, well, that's why I said the fan, um, kind of put up or shut up kind of thing. Just at least if I put my heart into it and try to bring about what I think will be systemic changes, then like to me, I can look at my son and say, like, I tried, <laughs> I tried to do something. Yeah. Whether it works or not, you know, it's yet to be seen, but obviously it's a long-term game. But it was just, I didn't see any other option of, systemic changes that might have a chance of being effective. Um, yeah. Like in this protest joints, you, you can protest groups, you can join like um, Extinction Rebellion or, or things like that. But ultimately, especially for climate, the climate crisis and for many of other of our society's issues, um, politics is supposed to be our central government. So we need to we need to influence that. We need to change that if we want to make headroads into these major issues. Yeah, bro, I hear. That's why I'm here too. Because we're in New Zealand. We live in a country that <laughs> if something bothers you, you can actually kind of kick the can loud enough. And I always say this in my debates. You can kick the can loud enough um, to actually make a difference. And... You know, whether or not you get elected into parliament or not is irrelevant, I think, because at the end of the day, um, putting the message across and getting that heard by voters is a massive step in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and even, if, even if it pulls the other parties along, um, you know, that, that's, that's a win to me. I don't personally don't care who implements the changes that benefit our mm. people. I just want our people to be better off than they currently are. Yeah, absolutely. 
Hey, bro, thanks so much for dropping in and um, giving us your lived experience and um, and having a chat about what we can do about some of these things. Um, been super cool to have you in. Um, I hope the campaign's going well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to shut down Zoom because Zoom is, is murdering us over here. And I think we'll just bring everybody else in by phone. But um, thanks heaps for dropping by. I hope I get to see you in Wellington on election day. Definitely. Awesome. Thanks cool. for having me. Thanks but, for dropping uh, by, man. Nice, nice to be involved. Yeah. Cheers. Take care, buddy. Kakite. Peace. Oh, computer oh. is struggling. Okay. Okay, bear with me, everybody. I'm just going to close down Zoom. It is struggling so dearly. And um, at least for the next couple guests, we'll see how we go. But I think what we'll do is we'll just bring everybody in via uh, speakerphone on my phone. So I'll put my phone next to the computer here and, um, and we'll give that a whirl. Hopefully, that works a bit better. <laughs> All right, Craig. Um, mm. Cool, just trying to close that down. Okay. Cool. How are we going? I'm just going to check that this is working. Okay, are we back up and running all right again? <laughs> It wouldn't be an 11 hour stream without a significant amount of technical difficulties, right? I mean, we kind of knew this is probably going to probably going to be the case. All right. How are we doing? Just checking that this is running. Still a bit laggy. That's all right. Cool. So that was really awesome to have Andrew in. Um, Andrew Kai. There we go. Uh, like Hamawana. He's our um, candidate in Tauranga. Um, so super awesome to have him on board. He's a really great guy. Uh, really passionate, obviously. And um, it was nice to see a lot of similar similarities in our journey. Um, oh my goodness, my cat is having a big stretch. <laughs> aren't you? Um, so yeah, really great to have him on board and, and we've had some really personal stories today. So um, for those who have been listening most of the day, um, if you find a lot of these chats um, to be a bit heavy, just make sure we have a little bit of a debrief later on, you know, um, have a chat with someone close to you just to, you know, talk about some things if you feel like talking about them. Um, it's good just when when having these conversations to keep your own um, well-being in mind. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> it's my cat. What are you doing? That is a ridiculous purr. Okay. Cool. So I'm going to call in my pal Ben, who's our next guy here. He is um really, really awesome dude. I love this guy. Okay. 
and um, yeah, he's going to have a bit of a personal um, chat with us, so hang in. Hey, those are my biscuits. <laughs> Kia ora, brother. How you doing? Not too bad. Nice is good, isn't it? Yeah, nice. Hey, I'm going to put you... <laughs> yeah, you could, but it wouldn't be fair to, right? <laughs> I'm going to um, chuck you on speaker since we can't do Zoom, and I'll just um, bump up the volume, and I think we should be all right. So um, no one gets to see your face, but they get to hear your lovely voice. <laughs> All right, one second. All right. Give us a hello and we'll see if we can hear that. Hello. Are we, are we, we live? And... We are live. I'm just going to see if I can push that volume up a bit. I'll boost it a bit more. Yeah. Give it, give it hell. Give it, <laughs> just scream at you. <laughs> yeah. Full, full. Full all right so i just want to check with someone that the audio is good before i um get you chatting away clear with the uh with the with the with the the, the viewers and whatnot yeah check it with the tech team yep how's it how's it all running anyway um, been pretty good. We've uh, had a few technical issues, which is, I guess, to yeah. be expected. Um, She's pretty standard, eh? Yeah, it's uh, the old computer struggling with um, all the technology. So, <laughs> yeah. So we're going old school with a phone call. How good's that? All right. We're going vintage, baby. Yeah. We're going vintage. Bring it right back. Cool. Yeah. It suits me fine because that's sort of more my thing, mate. Yeah, good. Good, good. I'm more one of those those sort of people. Nice. I was terrified at the computer, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, like same. It's probably going to burst into flames or something. <laughs> I've had some um, last minute trainings this week on how to run this, and without those, this would have been a nightmare. No, I reckon. <laughs> All right, so I think we should be okay. Uh, awesome. Okay, so kia ora everybody uh, on the phone. We've moved on from Zoom. Um, on the phone we have uh, my friend Ben. Um, and Another one. Another one. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and I've known Ben for quite a while, eh? Probably since, ugh, I guess like almost 15 years, really. Well, probably like oh, yeah, early, ben. early tw think, like 19, uh, 20 or something. Yeah, it'd be the, uh, oh man, it would have been like, when Jet Set was still there, I know that much. Yeah, yeah. So Jet Set, great yeah, place, a uh, long, long time ago. Um, mongrel kids in our, in our <laughs> years. Yeah, playing in our metal bands. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, I actually found um, found the old Athena CD today. Oh, classic. I was like, how is that? There's a throwback. What a cool one, <laughs> Yeah, brought back a few memories. Nice. Nice, awesome. So, um, Ben's gonna gonna chat to us today about a pretty personal story. Um, and um, for Ben, just you know, just be as if if something's getting too uncomfortable, just say so, brother. But we're gonna just um, I'm gonna let Ben kind of talk for a bit, and then we'll maybe ask some questions. Um, so I'm not even gonna preface this, Ben. I'm just gonna let you kind of take it away. You're a brave man. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so well, all right, well, I guess to keep it to a, a a simple version, just to sort of yeah. Well, I guess the, just the um, gist out. yeah. I guess um yeah, the short background about what happened, and then then how how you've kind of worked, decided how you've worked through things, really. Okay, sure. Um, 
Well, I was, uh, I guess, fortunate enough to have a child with uh, one of my best friends in the world, who unfortunately, due to uh, the, the topic of the day, mental illness is, uh, is no longer with us. She, she took her own life. Um, and due to that, uh, I have been left with the, uh, the daunting job of uh, looking after the wee man um, on my own. So, well, I mean, I, not so, but I definitely have help here and there. And um, right now, I'm lucky enough to have a very supportive partner um, who <laughs> has to deal with a lot of the, the fallout because of that. Um, yeah, so I think I, I think the biggest thing out of it, man, is that I had literally had the hardest moment of my entire life. I don't think I don't think I'll ever have to do anything as hard as that again. Um, I can't I can't fathom anything that would be more difficult for me personally to do and, and, and having to tell my seven year old son that uh, his mother had passed away um, being the person that has to I guess you, you like yeah I guess there's, there's a heartbreak that comes with mm -hmm. um, losing a parent um, at any age but personally being the person that had to I guess cause it in a way was yeah absolutely hands down the worst worst moment of my life mm. um, yeah and so she's been a she's been a rocky road ever since um, I think uh, the, 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 the biggest trouble I had was there's no handbook for that mm. situation there's nowhere that goes, this is how you handle this. Um, I mean, I, I, I did a fair amount of research and it is very polarized, mm. um, to say the least. Some are just given every single piece of information to do with it. Others were, um, tell them nothing, you know, it was, it, it was from one side to the other. Um, so I, like most of my parenting, I guess I have gone, well, I know this little person better than anyone else. So, um, and I have a, I guess, a, a, a view on how I want to bring this human up. Mm. And I guess my choice was to explain it in a way that I figured a child could understand um, and that was to say that mum had an illness uh, in her mind and that that illness is the reason she died. Um, and that sort of, I guess that worked well enough for a while. Um, and it's, you know, kind of, I guess, I don't know, I guess the word escapes me at the moment, but maybe fortuitous. Not, but but they're, they're doing this at the moment because we've recently had uh, like the full rundown with him. Um, and he sort of came out and was like, oh, "What happened? How did my die?" Um, and so uh, him now being uh, twelve years old, I've. It made my job easier. Um, I think that was sort of the harder thing at the start too, was like my inability to explain that concept to a child, mm. like suicide. Like how, like, you want to protect them. You don't want to say to a kid that that's an option. Like, uh, yeah, you don't want to have to explain that. So I think that's, in some ways, I, I felt like I sort of took an easy way, but it was also like 
yeah, just on me not having the ability to word that in a way that I, I guess, I felt he could comprehend fully. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just recently we've had the yarns and um and and went through it fully and and explained that she had um taken an overdose um, of her prescribed medication, um, which, yeah, opens up more feelings of how, how this stuff's dealt with. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess, um, yeah, I don't know, like, yeah, Grace, um, that, oh, this is, um, um, she, she's battled with mental illness uh, most of her life. Um, and I guess I, I was there for a lot of that journey. Um, like initially as just as, as her mate, um, and then as her partner. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's the thing that sort of drift, when we drifted apart was more that I became more of a carer than, than a partner, you know? Mm. Um, which is a, 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 a hard trap. It's very easy to fall into that. Um, yeah, I don't know, is that... I don't know. <laughs> Tough combo, <laughs> Give man. Give me questions. <laughs> um, thanks, for, thanks for bringing that in and being so open. Um, you know, like, have, how have you found given such a, it's such a unique situation like you were saying like there's no handbook for it um have you been able to to access the help that you need to to deal with you know because it's quite obviously quite a heavy heavy thing like i imagine that for years you've been thinking like having having that hypothetical conversation with otis about what you, what do you say like how do you talk about it oh man yeah i don't think there's a week that goes by Mm. previous to now um, that I didn't go oh, how's this going to go down like mm. you're constantly rewriting it you know it's like um, yeah I guess trying to write a novel or something you're, you're just you're drafting and, and redrafting and redrafting and, and going no no I can't say that can't do it like that oh, mm. can I do this maybe maybe this will work maybe this will like what what are the what's Without a better way to say it, what's what's going to fuck him up the least? Mm, <laughs> yeah. Um. Because that's I guess that's your instinct as a parent is you you, you don't be, you want to protect them as much as you can. But yeah, I get there comes a point where they they need the information. Yeah. For their own yeah um, absolutely well being you know yeah and you can't hide everything forever. No, and yeah, like you said, he's twelve now, was it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So starting to get to that point where, you know, he will be questioning more and more every day. And I know my parents used to hide some things from me. Um, my dad, <laughs> my dad was attacked yeah. once and had his bowel split open and he almost died. And and instead of telling me what happened, oh, they God. just they just lied about it and you know said he fell down some stairs. But I've always been yeah. like a little Sherlock Holmes with my little cap on. And even as a kid, I was like, nah, this is bull crap. Like, I know something, something else happened here. here. And, you know, kids kids can see through that. So, mm. you know, there's... there's... That's it. They're, they're, um, it's a, it's a, it seems to be an unfortunate thing that we we, we seem to lose their ability um, to be so intuitive. Mm. Like, yeah. they just pick up on things. Like... Yeah. Little sponges, man. Yeah. Guess we they just hear everything and get too carried away with up. everything else, and they're still living life and picking things up. Yeah, yeah. And that's that. That has, that has been a hard one for years. Going like keeping everybody quiet. Mm. <laughs> and yeah. I also like. I, I think the hardest thing for me was getting people to respect my feeling that that was my job. Yeah. Mm. That it was like, like this is this is a conversation that he and I have. Yeah. This is not for anybody else involved. Like mm -hmm. to, yeah. Which well, I don't know whether. Part of me feels like they're selfish and 
you know, like that I should let him choose who he wants to talk to about it. But for me, it was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that does this. Mm. This is, this is, this is my job. Whether the, 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 you know, I do have somewhat of a, a martyr syndrome. Here. <laughs> um, I'm like, oh no, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it for the team. It'll be all right. It's, uh, um, I can't imagine a tougher conversation. Um, oh, dude, yeah. it was shit house. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Should I be you can, smoking, swearing? You can swear <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing the best I can. It's a, it's about you know being open and honest, and swearing's a part of that journey. So you're all good. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, you know, so what would you say to somebody in your shoes? Say, if another guy hit you up at a pub and said out of the blue this is something i'm going through and you were like oh wow i've i've been going through this for the last you know how, how many years has it been five years uh yeah what seven to twelve yeah. yeah what what would you say to to someone in that situation uh, i guess yeah i just I, I think i would start with that look there is no I don't think that there is a right way yeah. or a wrong way. I think it comes down to you, like, as the, the parent, like, you know, in an ideal world, you should know them best and and know what they are able to comprehend. Um, but I think be very, very clear, very honest. Never, never lie. Mm. Like, so that was like, for me, that was the thing was like, I'm not going to lie. I'm just going to put it in, 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 a, in ways that they can understand it. Mm. So yeah, for me, it was like, you know, mum had, had a sickness in her mind and that's the reason she died. Yeah. So that's, it, it, it's not the whole truth, but it's also not in any way a lie. Mm. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what it is. Like a person doesn't commit suicide um, without having a, a, a like an, an, a mental illness of some description, you know, yeah. or, 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 mm. or be experiencing mental illness in some way. Um, I think, yeah, it's a it, it's a real hard one that I. I, I don't think I, I, I didn't really understand it fully until it happened. Mm. And, and, and and looking into it more, I I got quite, I, I think I'm quite a, um, pretty staunch in defending it now. Like when people do it, like not, that I think that it's like okay or, or, or like, Maybe it's acceptable or anything because it's it sucks like it's the worst. Please mm. never ever do it. Like there there is always a reason to stick around. But the thing that a lot of people, I think if there's a thing I've noticed doesn't get spoken about enough with it is that to do that thing is literally the hardest thing that a human can do to themselves. Mm. Because you are, you are fighting every single instinct. Like, your, your base instinct is to survive. Yeah. And you fight that. So in a way, it's the strongest thing you can do, like, in mm. a twisted way. And, and, and to do it, something is wrong. Something is really, really wrong. Um, and and, and I, I don't know another word other than, you know, like, I don't... I, I don't want to make it sound bad, you know, like broken and, and mm. all those sorts of words, but it, there's something seriously not working right mm. for you to be able to do that. Like, if, you, if that's the only option, um, yeah, like, you're in a real bad place. Mm. Um, but it's, yeah, I know, like, it's, it's this thing that there's a lot that people don't seem to get with it because you hear that like ah oh, it's 
coward's way out and mm. like you know oh, how could you do that to everybody and it's just like they literally are thinking that everyone is better off without them being a burden mm. like that's that's the, the like logic of it it's it's if i go yes it'll be hard but problem solved in the end yeah like, it's it's a um there's a, there has to be a logical thought process of some kind in there right yeah like like that, that, like that's i it was a thing a conversation that i had with grace like uh a few years before she passed um and she was talking about it because i was like i know because i had that mindset i was like how could you how could you possibly do that? Like, what a shitty, cowardly thing to do. And she sort of was the one that said, like, dude, like, if, like, if, if you're going to do it, you're doing it because you, you literally think that everything will be better mm. for everyone else. You're doing it. It's not a, like, it's not actually a selfish thing. It's not you going, oh, everything's so damn hard me it's like everybody will be better off i mean that's her obviously her personal view on it but she had attempted suicide multiple times yeah. um and you know up and up until the uh i guess success <laughs> um she'd luckily you know had, had, had failed you know mm. um had been caught by somebody or somebody had turned up at the right time or you know um or she on another occasion called an ambulance for herself because she second guessed it mm. um yeah um do you think it's, it's, um after the the conversation you've had with Otis recently that is there a bit of a little bit of relief for you now or do you think that it, it will continually resurface but just with a bit more detail or uh it was definitely i'm gonna say it was cathartic mm. for sure like going oh, is that thing that that freaking boulder mm. on my back it isn't there now yeah that thing that had been like, this is going to happen, it's coming, mm. at some point this is coming, and you don't know, and it's, it's that, like, we hate a lack of certainty as humans, you know? Yeah. Um, and it is, like, it's that most it's very uncertain thing. You have no idea how it's going to go down, and you can plan and plan and plan. But, um, yeah, I don't know, like... It's a funny thing, like, that came out of it. It was, like, of all the work that I put in to explain things in a certain way, he got caught on... We had a conversation about it, um, I think, a year or so after Grace had passed, and um, he was like, when can I know everything? Mm. And I said, I said I'm, not, I'm not really sure, mate. I don't... And I tried my best to explain that it was just like, it wasn't, it was a matter of I, partly that I felt incapable of explaining it clearly in yeah. a way that he would grasp. And, and we talked and I said, well, you know, it might be, you might be 13, you might be 16, you might be 18, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I, I just don't know mm. when I can, when I'll be, I guess, prepared enough to explain it and he was like oh okay yeah all right, all right. <laughs> oh, well, that's sweetheart cool cool <laughs> and then yeah he was um he sort of spat the dummy about it recently and was just like you said that i'm not going to know until i'm like 18 and i was like whoa whoa no 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 mm. no <laughs> that's not no nope and it, yeah i think i don't know if there's any like can be as careful as you can and there's that's they're going to hear what they want to hear yeah or they're going to hear what they hear you know mm. um so yeah he was he was t 
to be honest, was pissed at me, and he thought that I was just hiding this stuff and wasn't going to tell him until he was like a, a, a proper adult. Um, and then we sat down. I was like, "Look, the, no, okay, this is this is what I said. This is what that meant." Um, and then went, "Do you want to know everything right now? Do you think you need to know that now?" And he was like, "Yeah, I want to know. I want to know. I'm sick of not knowing." Mm. I hate that everybody knows and I don't. I was like, right, okay. And we sat in the kitchen and I spilled out everything I could and bawled my fucking eyes out a few times. Mm. And he did the same. And as my Lana I, um, will attest to, I am the world's worst crier. Because I am, I am hardcore Kiwi male, which is saying I work very hard not to be. But mm. there are certain parts that are still there, like why, fuck, why, blokes don't cry, mate. Mm. Like, just get on with your, get on with your shit. Um, but that's my own personal issue, and we can talk about that at another time if we need to. <laughs> we'll have a wine. <laughs> we'll have a wine and knock that one out. Oh, sounds <laughs> bloody beautiful. <laughs> Even a wine too. I like I like the wine. That's good because it's not blokey. Yeah, like <laughs> like a nice red yeah. wine. No, it's hey, nothing like a like a cheeky Central Otago Pinot, mate. <laughs> even a even a bad red wine's okay. Yeah, well, that's it. No. <laughs> I, I, I funnily enough, I had a very strange friend many years ago. He's a one armed man from uh, Paraparaumu, uh, and he. He had a saying that was, the wine brings out the beauty in the world, son. And I get it now. <laughs> it does. You have a couple of wines and things, but things can be beautiful, you know. Awesome, Let man. a bit of beauty in. Thank you so much for, you know, getting pretty deep and personal with us and, and sharing that. And I'm, I'm real glad that you've actually had a bit of a weight off your shoulders in the last last wee while yeah no it's um it's definitely a blessing yeah. it's um get, get get rid of that and then I can start working on my own sad days and whatnot. yeah it's a long time to carry that weight bro so you know yeah just yeah, yeah from yeah. everyone here thanks so much and do just keep being an awesome person you're an amazing guy so no oh, keep giving it a crack eh <laughs> You're gonna do the best with what you got. Yeah, and I'll touch base hey. after election. Let's let's go and have a cheeky red. Oh yes, please, sir. yes, please. <laughs> and bless you, man, for all the work you're doing, eh? It's, Always. Um, it's a beautiful, just beautiful to see, like somebody giving an actual shit, <laughs> not just talking the talk, you know. Yeah, we've got to walk the walk. Good. It's all about listening yeah. and talking. So, cheers, bro. Thanks heaps for taking part. Nah, nah. You're most welcome, brother. All the best. Send my love to Lana. I shall. All right. Kia ora, bro. And you. give Otis a high five for me. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> all right. Take care, buddy. See you later. You too. My Bye. love. Right. Real nice to have Ben on. He's such a good dude. Um and his partner Lana as well. Known for a while. Awesome people. Um, pretty pretty tough situation to go through, eh? So i um, pretty lucky to have them on to share that with us. Um, I'm just going to take a quick couple minutes just to um, let our next guests know that I'm just going to call them instead of putting them on Zoom. So I will just be with you in a tick, if you just bear with me.
Kia ora everybody, um, back again we have with us now uh, Jennifer Shields. So she is the, and correct me if I'm wrong Jennifer, the 2IC at Qtopia. That's the one. That's the one. So um, Jennifer's going to have a bit of a chat about her background and and what she does at Qtopia and, and her story. And so we're just going to do what we've done with everyone else today let Jennifer have a have a run with it and then we'll kind of jump in with questions at the end. So we've ditched out on Zoom. I know it's 2020 and Zoom is the, the in-trend thing to do, but it's been causing our computer grief. So we're just calling everybody on a phone. Um, so we've just got Jennifer on the speakerphone, so we don't get to see her, but um, glad to have her on board nonetheless. So Jennifer, feel free to take it away and, and give us a bit of a background on you. Ben, thank you so much for having me. Uh, hi, I'm Jennifer, my pronouns are she and her. I'm like, a, yeah, like Ben said, I'm 2IC at Utopia. Uh, we're a social support service for LGBTQIA plus young people. Uh, we're based down here in Otatahi Christchurch and service the wider Te Waipanamu and travel wherever we're needed. Um, we're kind of two halves of the work that we do. One is all about uh, kind of community and working with our young people in particular. We run four core social support groups, um, including a youth group that runs every Thursday night that 100 young people are coming along to every week, which is really fantastic. Um, and then the other half of the work that we do is all about using education to create positive change um, and really improve the health and well-being outcomes for our young people. Because we know in Aotearoa, uh, it's rainbow young people who have the worst health and well-being you know, outcomes across the youth sector. So we're doing everything that we can to to improve those outcomes and make those lives a little better. Um, for myself, I'm, I'm a trans woman, so when I was born, the whole world thought I was a boy and so did I for about 17 years. It took me a while to figure it out. Um, a lot of people, you know, we hear stories from folk who say they've always known since they were, since they were tiny, but I was a pretty typical you know, what we think is a pretty typical boy kid. I love to go out and bike and explore and build things and climb trees, and I was com completely allowed to, as, as what my parents thought was a boy. Um, and then it wasn't until I got into my teenage years that I started to have some inklings, and even then it took me a few, few more years to really figure it out. Um, so I came out when I was living in Auckland, just after high school, uh, my first year of university, and really when I was at school there we was just no opportunity you know for that and I think that's a big part of why it took me so long is you know the, like, yeah, the lack of possibility models out there in the world the only really trans person or trans story that I came across throughout my entire childhood was reading uh, quite a tragic story in my mother's that's life tabloid magazine when I was quite young um, so I think possibility was a huge reason why it you know, I couldn't come to this realisation about myself sooner. Um, but I came out at university and very quickly got involved in, you know, rainbow ac activism and advocacy. Um, I was a member of the Campus Feminist Collective and we ran an event during Women's Fest um, that gathered together some trans students and staff from both Auckland University and AUT for a panel. And we realised that there were these other people on campus just like us who had been kind of struggling in isolation for the last two or three years and had no idea each other existed. So that really enabled us to put together a kind of support network called Trans on Campus um, to really provide connection but also advocacy. Um, and in the years following, we were able to get the university to start helping out with you know some of the wellbeing issues that we were facing, like supporting trans students financially to change their name because the university's preferred name system wasn't up to scratch, uh, really mandating clear guidelines for what new buildings should have in terms of bathroom facilities and things like that. Um, so I have been involved in trans advocacy since as early as I could um, and then came down to move back home to Christchurch coming up on five years ago and in the last couple of years got really involved with QTRP as a volunteer and a board member and then at the start of the year, kind of got the opportunity to move into a staff position, which is really exciting. Um, and it's such a fantastic job and such fantastic work, you know, working with these young people and with a whole heap of people who really, really care and want to do everything they can to support them. 
Um, when it comes to my own story, I have had like very limited access to mental health support throughout my life. You know, um, was able to see a therapist for I think seven sessions as a teenager um, when I was experiencing some depression and, and anxiety. But unfortunately, as a bit of an angsty 16 year old, did not take well to being told to just think through my feelings. I was like, no, mm. my feelings are too big and powerful to think, think through them. That won't work. Um, so unfortunately, wasn't really able to take much away from that therapy at that time. Um, and then when it came to accessing support and care as a trans person after I came out, it was just so complicated and expensive and uncertain that for the longest time there was real no possibility. Mm -hmm. I saw a fantastic um, psych at Auckland Sexual Health when I kind of began my um, medical transition and started hormone therapy. Um, but that was one session to really gauge readiness for hormone therapy and he was fantastic. Um, but in the years following, found it almost impossible to either find a pathway through the public system or access a private um, provider and found it very difficult to find any information in terms of whether people were up to speed on gender mm -hmm. and rainbow issues, you know, and hearing so many stories from the community, particularly who had gone to someone in the private sector and paid hundreds of dollars per session only to talk about their gender when they were really there to talk about other things that were happening in their life. Yeah. Um, so in terms of their access, it was just so difficult and costly. Um, and it, that is just, you know, just my experience, but we know it's really reflective of experiences across the board in Aotearoa. Mm. Um, in the last couple of years, we had some really fantastic research published by the University of Waikato in the Counting Ourselves survey, which... Uh, spoke to over a thousand trans and gender diverse folks across the country about their experiences and in particular their health care needs and access to mental health support was one of the biggest areas in which there was a huge amount of unmet need. I think off the top of my head it's something about 40% of trans and gender diverse folks in Aotearoa want to access that kind of support but haven't been able to um, and the top reasons for not being able to access to that support is uh, money, so being prohibitively expensive and not knowing where to go and being worried that they'll be mistreated for who they are. Mm. Um, so one of the other things that I am very fortunate to do is I sit on um, the Canterbury DHB's Trans Health Working Group and something that we've secured this year, which I have taken advantage of myself personally, is a funded psychological package of care through the private healthcare system that is available to every trans and gender diverse person in Canterbury regardless and is not tied to gender. So you can go and talk about anything and it is provided through a list of mental health practitioners who know what they're up to. So I've been awesome. very fortunate to be able to finally, you know, six or seven years after I came out to access, you know, really fantastic and competent mental health care support where I'm not there to talk about my gender and just talk about the other stuff that's happening in my life. So yeah, I do fantastic. feel very, very fortunate to have that um, and, and telling everyone that I can about it, you know, especially mm. at, our, at our support groups, um, just trying to get as many people into that care as possible. Absolutely. One, I mean, one of the mental health problems across the board is um, not knowing how to access services or what's, uh, what's out there for people. But um, I think, like hearing hearing about you working in that working group on the board is really important because from from my perspective with with communities needing help and it's clear that the the lgbtqia plus community has been underserviced right uh, and uh -huh. and it's clear that to get true and honorable service it requires um the advice from people with lived experience right so uh, have you seen a, a shift towards um, lived experience being a primary aspect in those decisions? Yeah, in some aspects, for sure. Um, at Qtopia, we're lucky enough to be able to provide training to you know, a whole wide range of the healthcare sector. Um, just this week on Wednesday, we were at the Canterbury uh, 
is a regular social work day where they do professional development for half a day. So we were able to speak to, I think, just over 90 social workers um, from various services throughout Canterbury about the work that we do and kind of talking about rainbow identities and how they can do better in their own practices. So thinking about some practical tips that they can take away. Um, but what we're not seeing really is that really clear guidance from leadership, you know, all the way up from the mm. ministry, but also in, you know, your GP colleges and all the competencies that are really required for particularly mental health practitioners. Um, I know social workers are one of the few who have an explicit competency that they have to be competent around sexuality and gender mm. in terms of their practice. But if we're able to mandate that for, you know, psychologists and counsellors and everyone in the healthcare system, that would go a huge way to making a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well done for all that work. That's incredible. Oh, thank you. We're yeah. so happy to do it. You know, anything that we can do, we're so keen to. Yeah, I mean, that's that's like a really solid, tangible outcome for thousands of people, though, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we know, you know, what a difference some of these, you know, practically speaking, quite little changes can make. You know, everything from thinking about visibility in your practices, um, ways that you can kind of signal safety and make people feel safe and included, mm. um, and just being able to build a trust and trusting relationship and just being ready to be in that space with that person yeah. um, can make a huge difference. Why do you think we've been so bad at... Um at recognising the needs of your community for so long. For sure. Well, I think it goes so far back, you know. Mm. It's been so long um, being pathologised. So, so much of our community, you know, in terms of sexuality and gender has been viewed through a very, viewed through a very medical lens in which it was something wrong that needed to be corrected. Mm. So I think that kind of sets you off on a bad foot right from the start, you know, if you're thinking about our identities is something to be fixed rather than a part of ourselves. Um, but I think it has flowed on through, you know. I think only this year has have the LGBTQIA plus community been prioritised in some of the government plans, particularly around, you know, mental health. Mm. But we are still missing, you know. Yeah. We're not included as a priority population in the COVID response plan. Um, I know there's a rainbow wellbeing plan underway, but it's still missing. So I think a lot of it comes to really clear leadership from above mm. and moving beyond this pathologization. Um, and I think the other aspect of it is having really clear data around our community. You know, it's only in the last kind of five to 10 years that we've had clear data around like who we are and what our experiences are and what our health and wellbeing outcomes are. Yeah. Um, so I think, I'm excited to see us included in the next census and to see what that kind of population level data will do, you know, for our community and for our advocacy. Mm. Yeah, and, and and having strong leadership from, like, within, from in your community, like what you've achieved recently, um, can only yield positive outcomes, really. Um, super stoked to hear about that. That's actually really cool, because um, I wasn't aware of it. Um is there, for someone in Canterbury, uh, particularly a youth person who's um, maybe feeling a bit isolated and that people don't understand um, their, where they're at with um, their sexuality or anything, what would be the first step you would recommend for them? Um, I highly recommend reaching out to us at Utopia, you know, mm. like we know how much of a difference, like connection to community can make in terms of, you know, the experiences of our well-being and it being a protective factor. Um, and we have such a fantastic community coming together mm. every, every week. Um, and our young people are genuinely so inspiring in how they take such good care of each other and mm. how they you know, do not make assumptions about one another and they are so ready to listen and believe and not question each other's identities. So I think even just having access to that space once a week where everyone gets it and no one is, you know, telling you that what you experience isn't real and no one is making assumptions about your gender or your sexuality or the relationships oh, yeah. that you have. 
um, a space to just be together and, you know, hang, hang out and connect can be really beneficial. And then we can also um, provide so much further care to that young person as well, you know. Mm. We're able to support them with individual advocacy, we can connect them into healthcare services, we can help uh, with like family conferencing and help with their school. So I think we are really almost, the, you know, the one-stop shop for an entry point into the care that a rainbow young person might need. Awesome, and what's the best way for people to get involved? Are you still working out of Biz Dojo? What did it change us? Change yeah, so Biz Dojo is now called Salt Rex. We're we on 4 Ash Street in the central city. But the best way to get in touch with us is just through Facebook or Instagram or there's an email on our website, which is thecutopia.org.nz. Um, we're always happy to have a chat and a yarn or a cup of tea um, and happy to help wherever we can. Awesome. So incredible. Um, yeah, I. It, it's this thing where a lot of people try to find the best way that they can help smaller communities but really what we need to do is kind of take a back seat and and lead the charge of of this fight to those with lived experience right those who are who are living this because they're they're the ones who truly understand it mm, for sure yeah and there are so many ways to help as an ally you know mm. there's a donation page on our website if that's your kind of thing if you're keen to you know help out in any other ways feel free to get in touch or if you're keen for us to come and help you you know if you're working if somewhere you work or your school or anything in your life could benefit from some of the training that we provide or just the chat to talk through something we're so happy to help in any way that we can awesome thank you so much jennifer it's been an absolute pleasure having you on and to um and to hear from someone who's got in there and and made a really significant change for for those around you um awesome awesome co um i've known alice for for a while and uh got a lot of respect for her and what she's what she does in the community as well so to to both you wonderful ladies thank you so much um thank you yeah alice does really incredible work and we would not be where we are without her so i have to really thank her for that as well Awesome. So for anybody watching that um, feels they need to get in touch with Jennifer or Alice and the team at Qtopia, um, their website is, sorry, it was qtopia.org.nz. Awesome. And they're on Facebook and Instagram as well. So awesome yeah, support service here in Canterbury, um, doing lots of good stuff um, for those that need it. So kia ora, Jennifer. Thank you so much for coming on. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Sure to be. Thank you so much for having me. Thank Take you. care. Goodbye. Bye. Wow, that's really impressive. I love um I love hearing from people that have um taken things into their own hands and, and really made a difference for their communities. That's very, very cool. And a few things for me to research there, I wrote down some notes um around the counting ourselves survey and and it'll be good to see what the next census brings back. So um, for those of you watching that um, feel that that might, um, working in with Qtopia might benefit you. For those in Canterbury, do get in touch. If you'd like to help them, get in touch with them as well. So um, via their website or Facebook or Instagram. So I'm just going to take a couple quick minutes, as I do after each guest, just to um, touch base with the next guest and... Um, and just line up our phone calls since we don't have Zoom anymore. And that's how we'd plan to do it for everybody. So um, hold tight, everybody. I'll be back with you in just a couple.
Kia ora everybody. Cool, so just a quick um, sum up about where we're at um, and what we've got coming up. So today's live stream is 654 minute live stream for mental health. Today is the last day of Mental Health Awareness Week in 2020. In the last year, 654 people in Aotearoa took their life. So we're doing a live stream one minute for every person that passed um, to pay honour to that and to actually spend significant time listening to different people and hearing different perspectives um, from people within our communities. I find with mental health, a lot of the time people need to be heard and they need to be listened. Um, aside from those things like building community and ensuring we don't have gaps in funding criteria, this is one of those things that everybody can get involved with to, to help people. So I'm really proud to know a lot of the people that I know. Um, nearly everybody I've had on today, I've known in some personal capacity. Um, and it today has shown me that um, I am very privileged to to know so many people that are great people and and despite their backgrounds and what they've gone through they're still they're still out there fighting and i'm um, fighting the good fight so in the last couple of hours we had um we had andrew drop by who's a candidate for tauranga for the opportunities party and he is um was able to talk to us about his lived experience and around um his drug use and dealing with the issues that he he was facing after he lost his um his brother when he was only 15. Um, then we had my good friend Ben drop by who his um his child's mother took her life um five years ago when Otis was only seven um, and he was able to share a very personal insight into how he's managed to to go about things with with Otis um, talking about what happened and how he's kind of dealt with that uh, that weight I won't say burden but the, the weight of just carrying the fear of having that conversation and how that conversation might go um, super inspired to hear from Ben um, and he's such a good dude and he's got a big heart and loves everybody so big big love out to him and then we just had Jennifer in from Qtopia so Jennifer's the tour I see at Qtopia um, she comes from um, a background of lived experience. Jennifer is a trans woman who, um, you know, failed to get any real true mental health support um, because everyone just wanted to talk about gender and not really the issues, the real issues that Jennifer was facing in life. So she's now a very, very good advocate for her community and, and listening to her talk before, I'm really inspired by um, what she's been able to to do for her community um, is incredible. So I'm super grateful to have had that conversation with Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, if you're on, thank you so much. Incredible. Um, I can't wait to see the amazing work that you do in the future. So coming up, we've just got a few guests left now. We're basically into the last two and a half hours, um, just under that. Um, we've been going for almost eight and a half hours. So pretty, pretty incredible team. For those of you who have been on pretty much all day and I know there's a few of you you guys are champions um, so we've got coming up we've got my friend Jake who I'm going to call just a second um, who runs a men's group here in Ōtotahi and then we've got um, Jeff Simmons who's the leader of the Opportunities Party um, we've got my friend Stu who I ran Project 71 with and then we've got Joel who's um, the Opportunities Party candidate in Southland so Four more guests. I've lost track of how many we've had today. There's been a lot. It's been a lot of good chats though. Um, so hold fire for a second. I'm going to give Jake a call and we're going to get him on board with us. Kia ora, brother. How you doing? <laughs> that is, I'm doing pretty well too, man. Good to hear your vo voice again. All right, I'm going to chuck you on speaker and then we're just going to fire right into it. Um, so, one second. 
Here we go. Kia ora everybody. We've got my pal Jake here. Jake is, um, Jake's done so much for, for our community here in Odatahi that I don't even really know where to start. Um, <laughs> so Jake, I reckon if you just give us a, a real good, um, kurero about, kurero about, um, what you do and, and the, the reasonings behind it. Cause I think with you, there's a really, there's a really touching kind of spiritual underside about connection and, and holding oneself accountable. And I think that's a really good chat in there. So if you just want to talk about your background personally and, and what you do, and then we'll, we'll take it to questions afterwards. Oh, one second, Jake. Sorry, one second. Can you just talk up a bit? I don't think my phone's gone very loud. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Nice. Kia ora koutou katoa, um, ko Jay Tiano Skinner, Taka um, Wingwa. Yeah, just to give a little rundown about, uh, a little bit about myself, is that uh, I've, I'm a musician as well, as Ben, and uh, I've been in the, the heavy metal scene as well. And I uh, really started noticing uh, some of the patterns in which people were numbing themselves from some of the, the deeper work that was required. And uh, I guess one of the things I started to notice is that also within my own journey is noticing that I was using these substances to numb myself, essentially. And um, basically, it all, it all brought me to a point in which I noticed there was a gap in sort of relating with men in particular, is that we weren't really, uh, we weren't talking about the harder stuff. We sort of, um, there's a lot of shame to uncover with that stuff. So the reason why I got into what I'm doing now, which is I, I run two men's gatherings a week currently, and uh, next year we're going to be running more of sort of eight-week immersions. And I've also done a few men's retreats as well, which have been really fantastic as well. And the idea of it, um, that's really got me into this is a sense of connection to not only each other but also something higher so for us it seems to be a connection with nature and nature seems to give us such a, a beautiful uh, it's a beautiful setup of chaos essentially so we see the weather patterns are always changing and we can kind of uh, start to notice that our emotions are always changing too and that's okay. So it's kind of really cool to point to nature and ground ourselves in. And I've also been really reconnecting with my Māori roots. And that's been really powerful to really connect to the Atua and, um, you know, the sea, the mountains, the rivers and everything. And just trying to make sure that we notice that, you know, it's bigger. Like everything else is bigger than what, what is going on inside our head. So it's really important to connect to something that's higher. And I feel like as I've been going into that journey, it's been, um, oh, it's been incredible to see the ships and the brothers who come along. And, and also just in myself as a leader, like just noticing that, you know, even for a person to hold space, like you have to be consistently doing your own work as well. So I'm really, I'm really grateful for the opportunities that have come forward. And it's not easy work to do, like cutting through shame. You know, like cutting through disconnection, and but it's uh, it's important. It's it's one of the most important things that we need to be doing for mental health. Um, and I noticed that also that you have done a few videos on um, the fari top of fire as well. Mm. And I see that balance of the of the fari is so important. Um, as uh, I'll just I'll, I'll just express from my own point of view that um. Sometimes I can get a bit hen and all, you know, I can get really uh, wanting to acquire so much knowledge. I can go down the YouTube train and just wanting to um, watch video after video about trying to educate myself, but, but then also uh, reading as many books as possible and then noticing that I kind of get out of kilter and realizing that I actually need to, you know, bring in a bit more wairua, you know, bring in a bit more tinana, a bit more physical wellness, a little bit more spiritual connection. Um, and then also the concept of the relationships as well with whānau, which is massive, like really opening up the doors to those conversations um, and just being safe 
to express these ideas and I guess that's what the men's work is really about. It's about just feeling safe enough to be heard and not changed or fixed, but just making, allowing yourself to realise that you're not alone, that we all have these kind of, um, these thoughts that process and come through and, and, and filter through. And we're able to transmit it in those spaces. So I'm really grateful. Awesome. Kia ora, bro. That's fantastic. I've just received a message that our stream has stopped. So give me one second. So I hope that's not the case. That was some awesome chat. <laughs> um, one second. Zoom's a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, we're running through like OBS. Um, yep. So it looks like we're still live maybe on... Uh, we about cool, so we're still live on um, YouTube, but the Facebook one has crashed for some reason. I'll just quickly send a message to my guy who does all the tech stuff. Awesome. So, bro, in terms of what you were talking about um, there, just for everyone still on YouTube, um, what what do you think are significant barriers that men are facing to really dig deep into facing some some personal trauma and um, and issues that they have? I think it's a lack of safety. Um... It's not only a, a lack of safety of sharing one story, is that the, the fear of judgment. Mm. The fear of judgment is really rough in our society. Um, and I, I, I do truly believe that if, um, if we're going to express something that is of uh, a nature that is vulnerable, it's super important that we feel incredibly safe in that space. So. That's one of the main things I focus on is making sure that the, safe, the, the space is actually protected from any kind of crass humor. Because humor is another way that we can we can go back into our shell, hey. Mm. And I feel like um, I feel like uh, men are pretty good at humor. We're really good at sarcasm. Really good at these kinds of um, these these types of humor that kind of they don't connect us, but they disconnect us. It's like putting a big wall up. And then we can face re-traumatization because we are not actually getting hurt. So I feel those are the, I feel it's the communication aspects and the safety in which yeah. we have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so working, working with people um, in your men's groups, because I've noticed you've done a lot of like sound journey work as well. Is that something you incorporate in your men's groups? Yeah, I use I definitely use a lot of different instruments and so forth to like really help hold the space as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, the reason behind that is um, I feel like I feel like we need to anchor the mind a little bit. You know, give the give the mind a wee job, and. And I feel that music gives that perfect opportunity to, especially improvised or like flow state type music, it gives us a chance to kind of like let go, you mm. know, rather than trying to figure out a piece of music. It's like, it's just happening in the moment. And it really, it really hones in our attention. It, it, it kind of piques our ability to witness another person, but also ourselves. So yeah, that's the kind of, um, that's the reason why I use it. I definitely use Tonga Gordu quite a lot as well, which is um, traditional Māori instruments. And they of nature are very improvised kind of soundscapes, um, very much connected to nature. Mm. Yeah. Incredible, bro, incredible. Um, what, what was it that changed in your life to, to take on a leadership role? Because that there's doing work in community and then there's there's really taking a a role to to offer people those pathways and um and that assistance so what what changed for you that really put you in that driving seat i 
I had the feeling that it was the, the birth of my daughter, my baby daughter, mm. who's um, 20 months old now. And it, was, it would have been about six months into her um, yeah, birth side that I kind of noticed that, wow, like there's so much isolation. I already kind of felt the isolation beforehand. But then it was, um, wow, we actually have a serious problem here in this country of serious isolation <laughs> in which no one's really having the the important conversations, you know, the yeah. conversations to, yeah, about th- about these topics, you know. I guess because it's so, awkward, right? It's hard to, it's hard for a lot of people to front up to those real discussions when for so long we're used to numbing it or, um, yes. yeah. It, it's hard because um, you're really, you're really starting to uncover the truth you know, of some of the behavior patterns that you may have. And it takes radical responsibility. It takes um, it takes a lot of courage, bro. Yeah, absolutely. To really step into those realms. It's it, easy. It's a, it's a lot easier to kind of numb ourselves, for sure. Yeah. I mean, personally, myself, I found it easier to have those conversations for other people than to have that conversation with myself. Mm, absolutely. It's um, yep. almost a mechanism in itself, right? Mm-hmm. And it really does come down to that idea of, um, you know, we're dealing with a lot of shame here. We're dealing with like generations upon generations of shame of like, you know, it's not okay to cry. It's not okay to release. It's not okay to have these conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, I, if I'm perceived to be having these conversations, then I'm considered to be weak. And it's actually exactly the opposite. Mm. <laughs> so a, a person that takes ownership of their story is just so incredibly powerful. You know, like we, we're seeing this from um, the brother Matt Brown from my mm. father's barber. Yeah. You know, she. You know, she's not my rehab. It's, it's just a beautiful co-popper. Mm. There's just radical ownership of like brother. Mm. It's time to step up. It's time to to look at those shadows. It's time to. It's time to integrate them not only for our for our partners and our future generations, but also just the um, the reverberation of your energy in the community mm. and the way that you affect others. So yeah, it's just beautiful to see that work, you know, just coming to the surface. Absolutely, we're very very lucky here in um, Otatai to have people working on that and in multiple different ways. So I mean, you know. Totoko to to both you and Matt for for covering that space and to to all the other people out there as well who are having those tough conversations um Mm. because it really is tough to to even identify sometimes what it is underneath everything that's really Mm. at play you know so to to be able to pull that out in itself sometimes can be quite a challenge yeah and it's also um, a remapping that's going on so I know, I know for one is that uh, I, I grew up and um, as a teenager I was quite, quite numb because I, my father got sick when I was 12 and so I was kind of a, a, fatherless, a fatherless child through um, the teenage years and that's kind of like a really vital um, thing to have as a father to uh, initiate you, to mm-hmm. put you through the rites of passages and, and so forth. And, um, and I think our culture kind of lacks in that way anyway. But then when you don't have a father, it's kind of like you're really seeking that, that masculine role model. And um, yeah, I really feel that it's important that, yeah, that we go inwards and start healing those parts of the abandonment. You know, we start healing the shame of um, acting in certain ways with ex-partners. And, you know, we just really take ownership of those parts and, um, then we can just truly heal, you know, we can really move forward. But yeah, yeah take a lot of courage. <laughs> and you're bound to just repeat the same mistakes without being able to own own the errors of your ways. Mm, yeah, just realizing that, hey, a parent, because we'll go through a phase of where we blame our parent, mm. you know, like it's, oh, oh my dad got sick, so this is, this is the reason why I'm, I am the way I am. But you've got to move past that as well and go like, well, well, what happened to him and his children? Because mm. that's never talked about either. You know, like as we go through the whopper, we go back. We start noticing that, like, well, our 
parents had a really challenging time too. And then before that, even more challenging time. And then we've got World War Two, we've got World War One, we've got all this, you know, systemic trauma that we um, have been passed down. Mm. So yeah, the, the well goes deep. <laughs> yeah, and it just goes back and back and back, right? We've had this conversation in person before. Yeah, it just keeps going back, man. Mm. And we've just got to we've just got to um, bring it to the surface and uh, and start to. I, I like to see it as like a defragging of the mind. Hey, you know yeah. when your computer's yeah. starting to run really slow and it's real clunky mm. and it's like, oh, I just can't get out of bed. I just want to stay in my bed and close the curtains. And t- you know, turn the heat pump on and be like really chill and and not leave the house. You know that kind of mm. idea. But then it's like, hey, man, we really got to. Um, We've got to really start owning these parts of our stories and and starting to order those files, hey, like it really, um, so that we can operate on a higher level and really metabolize these emotions that are coming up. But I also feel that as a teenager, I never really learned anything about emotional intelligence, brother. Yeah. I learned Uh, nothing about mapping of emotions, bro. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about feelings. So it's kind of like, I think that needs to be in curriculum as well. You know, like, hey, let's like, learn about what grief feels like. What does anger feel like? What does abandonment feel like? You know? Absolutely. I mean, these are things that it took till my late 20s to even start to really kind of have any self-awareness and, and look inwards at at my behaviors and what they meant. Absolutely. Mm. And I just wish, I just, I just wish that um, as we start going down that path, um, it's never, it's never easy, but it's um, it's always super important that uh, we start mapping, and we, you know, we just start doing it for our future generations. Because I know my daughter's going to be affected by it if I don't start mapping yeah. those those things. Mm. And um, you know, we can kind of choose that we can um, we can reduce the load that they have to carry. You know. And I think that's an important thing to remember mm. when we're doing the work. Mm. Absolutely, bro. Absolutely. So how can people get involved in in your mahi, bro? How can they get how can they get involved in the men's group? Well, the first thing they can do is they can go to kianobrotherhood.co.nz. So that's K I A N O Brotherhood, one whole word, dot co dot N Z. And they can just check out kind of like the ground rules that we have to um, to really hold that sacred container, you know, to really help us feel safe while we're doing this work. And I've got a little introduction and everything in there. And then um, what people can do is actually, uh, you know, add me on Facebook and, and fire me a message. And I really mm-hmm. like to meet people face to face before they kind of come into the space, so they don't they don't feel like they're you know they're encroaching at, um, someone else's space. I want them to feel welcome, just like a piece of the family, you know? Mm, yeah, nice. So that's the best way. And we also have an um, email address as well, which is really, really good to contact, um, which is uh, brotherhood at kiano.co.nz. So it's K-I-A-N-O.co.nz. Choice, brother. Thank you so much for, for sharing your gift with us. Um, oh, cheers, brother. You've done a awesome thing in our community and it will continue to grow i am absolutely certain of um it's the kind of stuff we need right like we're all about trying to uh, you know because i see community groups community-led initiatives actually grassroots out there getting stuff done is always five years ahead of government you know we're 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 the innovators making the difference right so continue innovating and and um, helping people heal and connect it's a uh, beautiful bro oh thank you so much brother thank you so much for having me it's been a pleasure and um if you send me a message with your details i'll chuck them in the comments so people can um send you an email awesome man sounds great appreciate it cheers jake take care buddy yeah kakite all the best much love kakite nice how good um we've lost our stream to facebook um but we're still streaming to twitter i believe and um youtube so we're still cranking um hopefully those on facebook know where to find us now
um, but we are still running. Um, so that was Jake Keanu Skinner. Um, I'm going to put his contact details in the comments later on so you can come back and find them. Um, awesome dude. And similar to Matt this morning, like really working into those tough conversations that um, we need to have with ourselves and our peers and our whanau, um addressing those traumas and our behaviors. So um, like really looking at a bit of accountability um, for oneself. So um, very, very nice to have Jake along. And I would love it if people could contact him to meet with him if they, they're interested in, in those men's group. Um, because yeah, like you said, it, it is a it is a sacred and respected space, so it's something that is um, protected. So, kia ora, Jake. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, at six o'clock, so in around ten minutes, I'm going to give um, Jeff Simmons a call. He is the leader of the Opportunities Party. Um, awesome dude. He actually takes parts in um, men's group up in Wellington. Um, so I don't know if we'll talk about that much. I think we're going to talk about a bit of lived experience with Jeff. Um, but yeah, he's, a, he's an incredible guy um, and has a lot of respect from I know, myself and the rest of our caucus. So um, it'll be awesome to have him on board. I can't believe my voice is still working. We are um, bordering on nine hours deep. So eight, eight hours and 50 minutes so far. So hectic, long time. So we've pretty much got um, two hours left, two hours and four minutes. We're, we're coming to the end. Um, it's two hours and four minutes. We've got Jeff, we've got Stu, and we've got Joel. And um, and then it will be just a bit of a, a bit of a wrap up from me. So kia ora everybody who's stuck in here all day. It's getting pretty hot and sweaty in here. I need to have a bit of a stretch. So I'm going to have a stretch and a drink of water. And I'm going to be back in just a couple minutes. So kia ora, stay, stay with us.
Kia ora everybody, welcome back. Today we are doing a 654 minute live stream for mental health. Um, that is because last year 654 people in Aotearoa took their life. This week is Mental Health Awareness Week and today is the last day of that. So we're here to have some really good kōrero around different communities' perspectives. Um, we're talking about lived experience, we're getting chats in about... Um, People representing other communities. We've had a doctor. We've had a registered nurse. Um, we've had so many people today. It's crazy. Um, so in a couple of minutes, I'm going to call Jeff Simmons, who's the leader of the Opportunities Party. We're going to have a bit of a chat with him. Um, then after that, we just have two more guests. So we're we're down to the the wire here. We've got two hours left to go. So we've been running for just about nine hours. Um, it may seem crazy, but to be honest, I look at these here, and this is what these these people, that way, it's backwards, um, that's what they do for a job every day, is they actually have some really tough conversations with lots of people. So, um, you know, 11 hours ain't nothing. Cool, kia ora. All right, so I'm gonna give Jeff a call. Uh, I should probably save his number. He is the boss man. Kia ora, Jeff. It's Ben. How you doing? Yeah, good, good. We've um we've lost Zoom, so I've got you on the old school phone. So I haven't got you on speaker yet, but I'll chuck you on speaker. You might just need to to give it hell so everybody can hear you. Um, but yeah, I will. Um, well, it's just everybody's a bit quiet, so we just got to bump it up a bit. But I'm gonna put the phone right next to the the computer. So one one take. All right, how's that? Yeah, there we go. That's perfect. All right. Okay, all right. So, everybody, this is uh, Jeff Simmons. He's the leader of the Opportunities Party. He's a great guy. Um, Jeff actually uh, works or runs a uh, men's group up in Wellington. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, well, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say runs. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a men's group, yeah. I mean, yeah. and it's, it is definitely uh, a big part of of keeping uh keeping my my mental health uh you know maintenance if you like mm. it's a it's a, it's a it's a i feel pretty privileged to to share a circle with with eight other men and yeah it's uh it's it's fantastic nice i think at the moment we're we're in a bit of a a run of talking about men's mental health we've just had jake in who runs a men's group and now you and then Stu who ran project 71 with me so um yeah, good, good focus for the for the next hour. So, Jeff, do you want to just um, maybe give people a bit of a, a rundown who you are, your kind of history, and um, and your your battle with mental health? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I guess I'm um, you know I'm I'm an economist by background. Um, I've had a fairly uh, typical Kiwi male upbringing. You know, coming from a <laughs> From you know my uh, my my parents are from rural roots and and so you know uh, grew up in a in a family that didn't really talk about um, emotions very much and you know I I love my family dearly so I don't I don't mean that um, in a in a negative way it's just kind of our culture I guess and um, that was. That was kind of uh, built on, I guess, by becoming an, a, an economist, quite a quite a thinking occupation rather than a, a feeling occupation, and surrounded by a lot of people in a professional sense who are quite um, head heavy. And I guess, um, I mean, that all that that came to a head for me when I lived in England. Um, I lived in England for for five years, and 
particularly during the winters, I suffered from uh, from depression, and I guess because I I, I didn't uh, have uh, any preparation for that, I didn't even really know that I was depressed when it when it actually mm. happened to me. Um, it wasn't until afterwards, I guess, that I that I really realised what had you know what had gone on. Um, and yeah, it, it, it was uh, it, it was a it was a real difficult time. So I mean, I lost I lost a, a marriage as a result of that. Um, and um, you know that really. I guess brought to, brought to light for me the the importance of mental health and the importance of maintaining it. Uh, I, you know, I, I guess I'd never I'd never known until then that that mental health was something that needed to be uh, maintained. And yeah, so that was um, that was quite a big quite a big experience for me. And um, since then, that's that's really when my 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 journey began, in in terms of um, <laughs> getting in touch with my emotions and mm. and learning to learning to express them, and uh, that's led me to getting involved with with the men's work and to kind of I guess pay a, a, a bit more attention to to how I look after my mental health and and make sure that I that I maintain it. Mm. Yeah. Nice. So and I get I mean I mean and I guess the 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 big learning from from being in England, I mean what what kind of led to the the you know the depression I went into. I mean there's always lots of factors that that come together in these things, but the the really big um Things that played into it were, was I was living in London, so I wasn't getting to see a lot of nature, and I think nature is mm. really big for me. Um, it, it was definitely worse in winter time, so there is there, there was a you know there was a a seasonal affective disorder aspect to it as well, and um, and exercise. I I, I you know I, I know the import I, I knew the importance of exercise for my physical health, but I never really realised the importance for, for mental health as well mm. until until that that bout of depression because uh, effectively I'd gotten injured um, I, I got injured quite badly in rugby and so you know had this had this kind of double whammy of a of an English winter without the possibility of exercise mm. <laughs> and that and that, uh, that that led me down a very uh, dark hole of playing lots of Civilization, um, Civilization Three, I think it was back then, <laughs> and uh, and and uh, you know, effectively, um, my my marriage got neglected as a result. Mm. I read a, a report recently, it was a, a survey, sorry, that was talking about um, that the general it was like a significant amount of the general population won't trust fr- uh, sorry men won't trust other men in positions of power say um like a high profile um, professional job or as a politician or a teacher or something like that if they've disclosed that they've had a mental illness before or uh, deal with a mental illness currently um do, what do you think we can do to really change that viewpoint or that stigma that men have against other men about being unwell but being able to still be a really active and contributing member of society yeah it's 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 massive right i mean and i guess that comes back to the it, it was that is that new zealand specific or is that international or? that was international yeah mm. yeah i mean i imagine it's it's probably even worse here because of this kind of Harden up um, culture that we have in in New Zealand. Um, and look, I mean, I the, the only answer I can I can see to this is is for people to uh, for people in positions of power to to, to be vulnerable and, mm. and talk about these sorts of issues so that we can start to you know we can start to normalise it. Um, 
because, um, I mean, I, I think uh, what what comes up for people, um, you know, when, when they when they see people in positions of authority, um, I guess being, you know, uh, admitting this this kind of stuff. I guess it it kind of brings up people's own insecurities, and if, and and they wonder if they if they can't rely on this this um, figure in a position of power that they, that they may have related to, mm. then then um, it, it makes them feel even more insecure. Um, I, I guess the the paradigm shift that needs to happen is that is that we begin to understand that there is real power in vulnerability, mm. and that actually in in sharing things, sharing our our vulnerabilities, it actually gives us all strength. Um, because you know it's it's a bit like um, <laughs> I mean to get. Forgive me, I'm 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 an economist, but to use a, to kind of use an an economic analogy, you know, I think if we recognise our our weaknesses, so for example, New Zealand's dependence on housing, <laughs> if we were to if we were to recognise that sooner, it it would actually make us stronger in the in the long run by by um, you know starting to to reshape things, mm. but by by constantly pushing things down, which is what we tend to do with our emotions, tend, you know, by constantly I- ignoring the, the 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 warning signs, I just think that means that you're going to get something worse happen down the line, and that's yeah. that's certainly my experience of, of what happened to me when I was living in the UK. You know, um, the by, by not dealing with what was going on, uh, it eventually, you know, blew up far worse than it should have. Mm. Yeah, and I think we're seeing a gradual change around the world. Like, um, I'm a big basketball fan, and the NBA is generally quite a progressive league. Now, about five or six years ago, I think, there was a young player who came into the league, uh, Royce someone, or someone Royce, and, um, and he basically, like, couldn't play straight away, and that was because he was dealing with depression, and he came out with that and he was basically laughed at by the sporting world and by NBA fans and executives. None of the executives wanted him on their team because he had depression. And that's around the time I was dealing with my depression and I found that quite damaging to see that, oh, well, here's yeah. someone in a really... And, you know, I mean, he wasn't a big-name player. He was just a young rookie. But to to see someone in the NBA who's experiencing something that i'm experiencing that could have been a moment where they could have responded to that well and it could have been life-changing for many fans around the world but instead they saw that they had to keep hiding it because there were repercussions if they came public about it but um i think two years ago kevin love a uh, famous nba player came out with depression and everybody got behind him and so there, there has been in that short gap this movement towards being more accepting towards towards people and i think like you were saying it takes people in good and higher position or positions of authority perhaps to to be vulnerable and to lead by example which is really what our, our first speaker today was talking about just being able to be vulnerable so he's a small business owner um at a barbershop down here in christchurch and he uh, has meetings with the staff every Wednesday where they address these things and they actually get down to core traumas and and that starts with him being vulnerable at the top. Then his staff are able to be vulnerable together and then they can promote that culture to their clientele. So um, mm. yeah, actually having that top down approach is really good. Yeah, that's that's amazing. So good to hear. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's there is real real power in this stuff and I think it, it comes it, I, I think the real power will come the more people share when they are well because I think I mean you know if we if we look at politics for example 
the times when we see mental health issues at the forefront are when are when people are having a meltdown, you know, and mm. that's because they haven't dealt with these issues and they've built up and and they just explode, you know. Mm. So, I mean, obviously what happened with um, Jamie Lee Ross is a, is a pretty good example. Mm. I mean, he's very clearly unwell and unfortunately he's continuing on and, and that, and as a result, the sort of allegations of, of bullying and harassment are are continuing to pile up. Um, and I and I think if if we had more people in those sorts of positions sharing these sorts of issues when when they are when they're well, um, it, it will help normalise it. So it's so that we don't just see. Um, you know, we don't we don't just see the examples of when when really acute issues explode mm. in a very messy and public way. Because um, I think I think unfortunately that's what people tend to associate with mental health issues, um, rather than it being something that we all deal with and all need to have strategies to manage. Which is, that's the truth, right? Like, mm. I mean, the vast majority of people—I don't know if it's the majority, but a massive chunk of the population have, have mental health issues. I think we all have our the, our demons that we're yeah. that we're struggling with, and much more powerful to have an open conversation about that, and to, and to sort of to be able to share our strategies and techniques about how we deal with stuff, rather than um, waiting till they explode to talk about them. Yeah, absolutely. There's power in that vulnerability, um, especially in wellness. So being able to share is good. So thanks for, thanks for coming in and sharing, sharing your story as well, Jeff. Pleasure. Being, you know, being the leader of our party. So. (laughs) uh, Yeah. And, and it's been, it's been a real, it has been a real journey for me since, I mean, so since, since that, um, since that incident in the UK, it, it has been a real journey for me. I mean, we talked about the, the men's work, which I think is is fantastic. And I know a lot of people question um, why you know why men need to get together to to talk about mental health stuff. And um, and I mean, what I would say to people is that everyone should find spaces that they feel safe in to share. Mm-hmm. And and for some people, if if, that, if a men's group is is that space, then it's then that's a, a, a good thing. Um, but of course, you know, exercise, nature, uh, all that sort of stuff is is really important uh, to to maintaining mental health. I mean, and and I find actually the two the two drugs that are, that cause the most problems for me are the legal ones, which is alcohol and sugar. Mm. <laughs> in terms of in terms of mental health, yeah. I mean, my partner often talks about like you know I'm 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 off sugar at the moment because we've got an election campaign, but sometimes when I when I go on a, a bit of a when I get back on the sugar, she will she will comment about my mood swings. Yeah, know? it's uh, yeah. it's quite remarkable. Uh, so there's there's lots of things, and everyone's got to find their own their own answer to this mm. stuff, eh? Yeah, because I mean, mental illness affects everybody differently. Even if you look exclusively at one thing, like depression, it it presents differently in in most people, or whether it's borderline personality disorder or psychosis like everybody's got a unique um, presentation i see that all the time through work so clearly of course most people will have a unique and individualized response that's required for them to find their way of maintaining wellness Mm. yeah there's been some real good chats today about that about um how we access community support um, on a regular basis instead of just a crisis which is kind of our current model really we we wait till shit yeah. gets out of hand and then we call up crisis and crisis can't help us so we go to the doctor but the doctor doesn't recognize that we're in crisis so you know being able to access and look at maintaining wellness um is really good and can i acknowledge i mean this has been a it's, i mean you, i know you've been at this all day Ben. just what just what an amazing um you know what? What an amazing show of leadership you're doing by by having this 
this conversation and I know it's not it's not your first radio in terms of this sort of um, you know this this sort of concept but it show it does show an incredible commitment to the to the cause um, highlighting the issue of of uh, suicide and and just encouraging people to to talk uh, and and leading by example it's it's fantastic mate so well done thanks Jeff it's all about hearing different perspectives right and um, we can throw money at things but I decided I didn't want people to donate to a cause today I didn't want to see people throw money at things I wanted to see people throw time um, yeah because time is a tangible thing that can help with mental health um, so actually being there to take stock and listen with people and give them time is that's that's the real takeaway today is different perspectives and giving time so are you asking people to sort of check in with someone and and you know offer offer that that ear well if if they need it yeah i mean for me personally my inbox is always open um i couldn't tell you how many people message me on a daily basis for advice or support um and that's that's something that's kind of gone on for a long time um and something that i'm quite happy to continue doing um obviously i'm no clinician so the first thing i usually do is kind of say here's some places you could kind of check out um and and point people in the right in, in the rough direction is what i would say um but i do have a lot of resources on me from work that i've done previously from the mental health foundation and um over the past week, we've been dropping them in letterboxes for people that need them. So if anybody wants that, that's something we just do whilst I'm out campaigning. Um, it's an easy thing for me to just drop something off in your letterbox. Nice. That's, that's great. What's your What's your view on advice, Ben? Because, I mean, it's... Uh, and I guess I'm coming at this more from a, um, from a, a male perspective again. It's a, it's a difficult thing um you know offering offering it well I, I just just thinking about it i'm sure i'm sure um it, it's probably difficult for for a woman to to get advice too uh, you know men i i know men in particular do do struggle with with um whether giving advice is a is a is a good idea when mm. people are are in a in a difficult situation uh, and i know giving advice or, you know that comes from a good place it's a desire to desire to fix things mm. um and and but but it, it is a it's, a it's a tricky one i think yeah uh, i think what, like your attitude towards that it's it's almost like an inherently masculine trait to want to fix things um and i've been guilty of that um hi babe I've been guilty. Um, sorry, Jeff, that's not to you. The Millie just got home. <laughs> um, you know, I've been guilty of that in the past where I, I've focused instead with my, because I've got a very problem solver brain. So I've focused instead on what's the direct thing I can do right now to fix this person's situation. And in doing that, I've already checked out and I'm not listening. When really what that person needs usually at that time is someone to listen. Um, so now when, when I am approached by those conversations, the first thing I do is listen and I try not to think about advice or a solve. I like to just sit on it for a bit first. And that's because I want to actually honor that I am listening rather than just trying to come in with a solution. And then I just ask typically what the person is looking for. Like, are they hoping to connect with a service? Are they looking for a friend to talk to? You know, because... If someone comes to me and says, hey, Ben, um, at the moment, I'm really struggling with um, being bullied at work and it's making me feel really depressed. Um, and then I go, oh, hey, mate, here's, here's the service you can call in a way that's problem solving, but it's almost dismissive. So yeah. um, actually just taking the time to find out what they're looking for and listening and then seeing what you can do. Um, but yeah, it, it is an inherently male thing to do um and you know actually a friend said to me years ago uh don't set yourself on fire to keep somebody else warm and i that's the one piece of advice that stuck with me my whole life because well my whole life since then and that's because i used to go above and beyond 
to give people just a subtle comfort um, at, at the sacrifice of myself often. So I always make sure that mm. I myself, number one, am, am okay to be to be helping somebody. And then to make sure that that help is A, tangible, but B, not um, sacrificial to my own well-being. Mm. Kia ora, kia ora. Um, I mean, what, what that kind of brings up, brings up for me, I guess, uh, is the, probably the, one of the biggest insights I've had since I started this journey. So like I said to you, I started this journey about 10 years ago when I, when I kind of came out of, of, of that, um, depression, that, that time in the, in the UK, um, the biggest insight I guess I've had and this <laughs> it probably sounds dead obvious but but um, from for a chap that for a chap that sort of come from quite a head heavy background I'm just amazed that at when when I can actually say how I feel when I can express how I feel and and have that be heard um, you know, and that's that's partly a matter of me finding the the, the right words as well as as well as um, you know, have, you know, having the experience of being heard. Mm. But when I can actually do that accurately at, and and express myself, probably eighty percent of the time, that's enough. Like there actually yeah. isn't any more mm. to solve than just expressing it. Yeah, and Absolutely. and. I, and like that's that's been mind blowing for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because because I, I I you know start starting on this journey whenever any time a feeling came up I assumed there was something there to be fixed. Mm. Yeah, actually, that's something we found when we ran Project Seventy One. Um, was that a lot of the guys would sit there, and then afterwards they go, "Oh, that's the first time I've been listened to." ever in my whole life you know no one ever yeah. listens to me and you know some of those conversations were quite intense um and there was no experience we could offer them especially prior to me you know getting into the work i do now um so there was no fix i could offer so it was truly just listening and that's what those guys really appreciated um so yeah i mean the power of listening i think is very under undervalued Awesome. Well, hey, Jeff, I'm going to let you go and I'm going to get our next guest sorted to come in. But thanks so much for um, dropping by. I know myself how, how crazy busy I am. So I know also how busy you are, um, if not busier. So thank you for dropping in. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's um, and thank you really for good chat. I hope, I hope you sleep well tonight. I because will. You've really earned it today. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, man. Appreciate your chats. Kakite. Kakite. Awesome. So that was Jeff. He's the leader of the Opportunities Party. Um, great guy and awesome to, for him to be an example of what we've been talking a lot about today. And that's um, role modeling your vulnerability, um, especially in a, in a leadership role. So um, awesome to have Jeff there to do that. So next... Um, Next person in is um, Stu. So Stu's one of my best mates. I've known Stu for years, uh, 15 years, something like that. Uh, we play in a death metal band together called Blindfolded and Led to the Woods. Um, lots of people crack up at that because it sounds quite nefarious, but really we're all um, quite nice people, I swear. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna give him a call in a couple minutes and get him on board. He's our second to last guest tonight. So in the meantime, I'm just going to flick him a message and I'm going to flick Joel a message, who's our last one in, um, just to make sure everybody's ready to go. So thanks to everyone that's stuck in. We're almost at nine and a half hours, so pretty much an hour and a half to go from here. Been a massive slog. We've had some really, really good conversations today. Afterwards, I will repost this with the schedule. So if people want to... Um, check in for individual chats they can do so so 
I'm just going to take a minute to say hello to my fiance who's just arrived home and send these messages and then I'll be back with you. Cheers. Kia ora everybody, we're back for our 654 minutes uh, live stream for mental health. So we're doing 654 minutes today because it's the last day of Mental Health Awareness Week and um, also this last year the provisional figures are 654 deaths um, 
by suicide in New Zealand. So we're doing one minute for every person we lost um, to honour that and to spend time learning about different people's perspectives and some work that's been happening out in the community. So next we've got my pal Stu. We play in a death metal band together called Blindfold and Led to the Woods. Um, I've known Stu for around 15 years. Um, we have got into much trouble together. Um, but last year in February, we launched Project 71. We threw it together in like two and a half weeks where we spent 71 hours talking to men in the Cathedral Square um, about their mental health. So, um, Stu, are you in there? Yeah, man. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear. Kia ora. So if you just want to... Um, give a real quick background about um you you know like if you want to talk about you know where you grew up or what your interests are just a little bit about you and then um give us a rundown on what project 71 was about yeah cool man um so yeah like i said uh my name's Stu. um yeah we've known each other for a really really long time half my life you know um uh i I raced, I raced drag cars and play metal music mostly, you know, that's, that's pretty much me, that's who I am. Um, my, my journey with mental health kind of began uh, with the Christchurch earthquakes, I guess, and I, I, I feel like that was an experience that actually made me come online in a way. Um, it was a real discovery of, um, you know, what loss actually was. Um, Losing our one of our best friends, uh, uh, Matty McKeegan, um, that there was a, a total life changing experience, and and I lived an incredible life. My childhood was amazing, um, so that was a real turning point for me. And and seeing how that trauma affects the people around me, um, and you know, since that moment, uh, I, I had several people in my life take their own lives and watch the impact that has on their friends and family, uh, the community, um, and also just watched a lot of people go down the path of, um, you know, not necessarily taking their own lives, but letting the mental health uh, reach that breaking or crisis point. Um, and, you know, it can be incredibly hard to come back from that point once it's uh, once you've gone kind of that far, I guess. Um, so Project 71, when, uh, you know, you came up with the idea, it was at a perfect time for me because I, you know, had just recently had a really messy um, loss of employment and I, you know, I was ready to sink my teeth into something that I could really help people with and, and that was some, that's always been something that I've wanted to do is, is help people however I can. Um, I'm, I'm not a professional in any way, you know, much like yourself, but, you know, what, what we did there was really show that you didn't have to be a professional to offer people, um, you know, an, an ear or, or a way to help. Uh, and, and there were really incredible people all along the way of Project 71. Yeah, so we spent um, 71 hours in the square in Christchurch and uh, we did, did all kinds of crazy activities but um, you know the main focus was uh, men's mental health and, and allowing men to have a space to be listened to um, and we had a lot of resources as well um, I also kind of just want to acknowledge um, the females that helped us out with that as well and, and the females that did come down and even though it was kind of directed at men um, you know it, it was for everybody as well um, and we had some great some yeah, some some great chicks come down and uh, do some uh, you know, great talks and we did yoga and all kinds of stuff you know it, it was really really a, an amazing experience and um, yeah man it's amazing what you can pack into a day, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. We, we lose, loosely based on the five ways to well-being. So, like, each day had a bit of a theme. So, I think, was it the Tuesday that was be active? Um, and that was punishing. Um, boxing, <laughs> some crazy gym stuff with reset, recreate, yoga. Um, yeah, dead. I was dead after that day. Yeah, it's not until... Uh, 
you have someone like Reese come along. Who's, <laughs> he's an amazing guy, but uh, you know he pushed me to my limit. <laughs> and it's not until someone does that you really realize how unfit you actually are. Yeah, I think um, he pushed me well <laughs> beyond any limits I previously had. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, yeah. So an important part of it was building space, right? Like having having a a safe space for people to come and hang out what do you reckon was the most important thing about the space that we had uh for me it really was the people um it, it was the the people in the community um you know i i met so many incredible people through that time that had such uh harrowing stories mm -hmm. of, of their lives and um things that really have stuck with me that I still think about to this day. Um, and, you know, they're, they're living life. They're, you know, they're, they've, they've overcome some amazing and, you know, sometimes horrible things. And that was such an inspiration to, um, I'm sure, everyone who was there. And um, people actually being able to express that, um, I mean, it, it was truly amazing. I I thought, um, yeah, and, what, what about you? Man? Well, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know exactly what it was, but I think everything about it together just made it such an inviting space. Cause we had people that would come down on the first day and then they just came down every day. Um, <laughs> and there were, there were like friends we made out of that, that were just people that came down and were like, man, this is cool. I love this. I'm going to stay. And people would yeah. like, people would come down like nine o'clock in the morning and literally hang with us until nine o'clock at night when we're still trying to pack up and kick everybody out. Yeah, I think that, you know, some of those people, um, that, that was kind of eye-opening to me as well with, um, you know, actually building a relationship with someone that, that was essentially a stranger. Mm. But some of those people took a few days before they were able to share their story. Mm. And I think that's, you know, something that's probably important to talk about as well is that... Um, you might not be able to just get everything off your chest straight away. Mm -hmm. And that's to totally okay as well. Um, you know, building a relationship with someone, um, whether it be a professional or, or even just a friend, to be able to talk about the stuff that's going on, um, you know, that's something that should be acknowledged as well, I guess. Mm. People have different trust levels with different people as well. Like, sometimes I'll be having a conversation with someone and they'll just get real deep. And now afterwards I'll be like, man, I don't even know why the hell I just told you that. Like that just came out of nowhere. But then yeah. sometimes I'll have conversations with people and I can see that there's something they want to talk about, um, about how they're feeling. And I'll try and ask those questions to like, get it out and, and to provide them like that space, not in a physical sense, but in a, in a metaphorical sense. And, and they just don't feel comfortable enough, you know? So everybody has their their kind of vibe that they work with. And, you know, my vibe for some people is not suitable for them to talk about how they're feeling. Um, and I said that a lot with some of my some of my friends. Like, I might know that they're going through some stuff and I'll try and talk to them, but they're not super great with talking to me. And sometimes that's just because they're a guy and I'm a guy and I know that they're better at talking to, to um, females and you know that's fine like everybody has their own way that they can communicate those things um but having this chat about project 71 is actually quite funny because when we ran it it was so intense like because it was 13 hours a day that at the end at the end of every day you were just like whoa man so many intense conversations and you're trying to just piece all those together in your mind because you'd go from one conversation to another and not really have time to um, break it down. Um, so at the end of the day, you're desperately trying to make sense of everything. And at the end of the week on the Saturday, I was sure in my uh, birthday party because we share the same birthday. And, and we actually like made a rule with our friends. Don't talk to us about Project 71 tonight because it's still all a bit fresh and intense and, and we hadn't unpacked it yet. And we haven't even really unpacked it yet, so here we are unpacking it, uh, like a year, a year and a half later. Um, 
But yeah, super cool. Actually, we t- I touched base with a university group. They were on earlier today, Lads Without Labels, and they ran Project 72 this week. Um, yeah, how how that, good? That's, that's so amazing, man. That's mm. so amazing to see. Um, you know, we, we made that model to be able to be taken anywhere by anyone. Mm. And uh, it's just... It's pretty amazing to see some dudes um, pick it up and kind of run with it, you know. And that was always the goal, you know. Mm. I, I, I guess we never really had the goal to be those guys that took it around the country, although a lot of people kind of yeah. uh, would, would have loved to have seen that. But like, it's such a massive undertaking, and, and um, you know, the, the strongest of mind, I don't think would. Yeah. Would, uh, be able to handle it it's it's so much and like you said there's so much to unpack after every mm-hmm. day but I, I wish those guys all the best like honestly from from knowing what they're what they'll you know what they're going through and and, and uh, experiencing um big 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 ups to them it's so yeah, sick absolutely <laughs> and the, the model was made so it could be copied right like we mm-hmm. we run it as a zero dollar campaign so it didn't actually cost us any money um everything was donated by the community everything we used um the only thing it cost us was time um and so if if there was say if we were to take that around the country that would require us getting paid to do that as a full-time job or require a lot of money just for transport alone so we kind of set the model up that it could be implemented by different groups throughout the whole country right just seeing yeah seeing other people like just take it and run with it so we've seen one group do that and hopefully we get to see some more that would be really cool um yeah definitely man definitely what was what was the the highlight of the week and what was the toughest part of the week without getting into like any personal stories obviously we respect Mm. um people's um, privacy from what we had chats about yeah 100 percent um like you said you know respecting that is incredibly important but you know we had that that one fellow um won't mention any names or anything but um you know he it's not really a highlight or a low light it was kind of just one of those things that was mind-blowing and solidified how important it is um and and he said that uh you know that was the week he was planning on taking his own life and Mm. he had he had a planned out what was going to happen how he was going to do it and um the fact we were there and we happened to be there on on, during that week um changed his mind Mm -hmm. and uh he's he's you know still around because of that and that's something i'll never forget it's it's not even really something i can explain (laughs) um i've seen him walk in the streets he looks happy yeah yeah dude (laughs) Um, and yeah, that, that was probably one of the toughest moments as well, because it's one of those conversations that, um, until you're actually having it, uh, you know, uh, I, I think you mentioned, um, recently about having those kind of shower conversations that we have in our head and, and how easy it is <laughs> to, to think about what you, what you can say or what you could have said, um, until you're actually having those conversations in, in person, you know, it, it's, a completely different thing um and yeah that 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 was amazing yeah and i mean he came in on the monday morning quite confrontational Mm. um and was very intense but um he found community there not just with us but with with everybody that was coming along um you know he came every single day every single day and sat and made new friends and met other people um so it's one of the, the greatest takeaways from Project 71 for me would be recognizing how you can build community. And because in our, in our social lives, right, we tend to hang out with people like us, you know, they like the same music or, or, you know, play in the same rugby team or have some shared interests. But it's, it's interesting building a community where the shared interest is like grief or trauma and seeing how those people can interact together Mm. yeah and um you know someone like uh ah god God, his name escapes me uh with the with the ute Um, oh yeah wata yeah um having him him come up and share his stories of Mm. you know that kind of same thing um you know his 
whole life is traveling around the country and and talking to communities about grief mm. and and allowing that space for people to come together and have those conversations and it's I, I don't know like is it is it the kind of thing it's like it's a tough job but someone's got to do it you know it's it's it shouldn't be it shouldn't be like that you know? mm. um, we shouldn't have to have someone in our country that that drives around and and has that kind of job um mm. and, and he was an amazing guy like uh to give people some background he travels around new zealand and uh, talks to people who are uh, families of people who've uh, taken their own lives and they uh, each sign is ute and and it's i mean it's just covered in signatures and messages and yeah it's it's quite something um yeah when you see it in person it's a real um a real gut punch just seeing you know that reading the names and just seeing the the messages and how how many different families have been affected by it yeah and and i remember we we had two friends who were Mm. were from our, our music community who were on that truck and um you know, I, I remember actually just being completely speechless and, and had to take a moment because it was such an intense, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain, but mm. yeah, super intense, eh? Um, but what an amazing dude for getting out there and, and doing that. And, um, you know, yeah, I, I, yeah, where do we go from here, bro? You know, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one, eh? It's, um, seeing seeing just how much benefit providing space for people to talk has um it it surprises me that there hasn't you know there been a big shift towards that nationwide um you know and um that's not for me to take up i've had my days of running things i'm quite happy um being the minion um <laughs> like you said uh earlier with uh Jeff, um, throwing throwing money at things is not a fix, and I think we kind of showed that with that. And and you know, it it is amazing to see more funding for mental health and things like that. But um, you know, is the money being spent in the right places? Is the money yeah? Um, you know, do, does it need to? You know, we we showed that, <laughs> that you don't necessarily need money um it's sometimes about more than that and mm. i mean something like that could operate on a shoestring budget and what we really want to see is like community hubs where you have access to things like that all the mm. time a barrierless thing you know like the, the mental health system can be very difficult for some people to navigate so being able to walk into a community hub and know that there's so many different things or services there that you could engage with without any criteria that you have to fit um yeah yeah, and and it's not like we have many uh men's groups around even just around in christchurch Mm. you know that 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 we know about but (laughs) having those groups around doesn't necessarily mean um people are going to go to them you know it's a huge step to to head off to one of those and it's you know just just to be comfortable enough Mm. to go and do that for a start is is a massive step and i i totally um take my hat off to everyone that is doing that Mm. but you know there are a lot of people who who won't and you know and and for the most part can't um just dive into that kind of that kind of thing yeah there's a lot of barriers people face eh? definitely and um i see it a lot at a lot of um ngo work you know if there's specific funding criteria people fall through the gaps you know people want help but they uh, put off by the barriers that are in front of them you know and they they struggle to engage because of that yeah absolutely yeah 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 cool bro well thanks for dropping by to have a bit of a chat about project 71 we finally unpacked it <laughs> <laughs> yeah man um uh honestly bro like thank you so much for doing this and and putting yourself out there again for again an enormous amount of time <laughs> <laughs> i think i think that that 
fish. Uh, you know, there's something to take away from that. You know, a lot, a lot of a lot of stuff can be uh, healed with time, and and time is such an important thing. It's kind of at the end of the day, all we got. You know, mm. is time. And and I, I'm real proud of you, bro. I'm real proud of you for doing this again and, and everything that you've been doing. I know that you're pushing massive, massive days and weeks and um but i know that you thrive off that and it's, it's it's so sick and i just want you to know that everyone uh is supporting you and, and you know and, and i hope that uh please take the time for yourself after today. <laughs> i will i'll have a relaxing evening with millie maybe we'll yeah. watch some hannibal or something <laughs> yeah. awesome thanks bro really appreciate the kind words and thanks so much for dropping in I'll see you. Oh, we don't have practice this week, so I'll see you next week. (laughs) Yeah, bro. (laughs) All right, take care. Nice to hear from you. Sweet, bro. See ya. See ya. Awesome. So we're down to the last speaker now. Our last speaker is Joel. I'm going to give him a call in about 10 minutes or so um, for a chat with him. So hear my voice is going. It's finally giving out. Uh, it's somewhere we're almost um we're almost at 10 hours we're actually two minutes off 10 hours so but everybody that stuck with us um well done epic slog um we lost our facebook stream a while ago i'm not sure if that's come back up but we're on youtube so for those people that missed us on facebook i will post the youtube link to um my candidate page afterwards so people can drop by and i'll post it there with the schedule so people can skip through to what they want to listen to. And I'll also post through a few links to different organizations that we have had chats with today. One hour to go. We're almost there. Cool. Okay, so I'm just going to take a quick minute, as I do just before every guest, um, just to line things up and get things ready. And I'll touch back very shortly.
Kia ora everybody. We're back just getting ready for our final guest, um, Joel Rollins. He's the candidate for Southland for the Opportunities Party. Um, I asked Joel to come on board for this because um, he shared a story the other day um, on Facebook about his mum. So um, we just wanted to get him in to, to see if he would share that with everybody um, as, our, as our last chat for the evening. And then um, once we've finished talking with Joel, I'm going to be uh, riding through to the end. So we're just under an hour to go. So I will be um, talking through all the guests we've had today, um, some of the key key things we've talked about, um, and and yeah, maybe um, some tangible steps moving forward. Um, yeah, so there's been lots of good questions today. We lost our Facebook stream, so not an easy access to questions now, but we're still running on YouTube for those here and on Twitter, I believe. Um, it's been an awesome day. Thanks everyone for, for checking in. I've learned heaps. I've learned so much today. Um, and we've got to hear from a wide group of people, which is something I really wanted today to be about. Um, and everyone's got to spend some significant time with my cat, Craig, who is um, here with me still, <laughs> as Craig does. Cool. So I'm going to give Joel a call now and get him sussed out. Calling someone, it feels so uh, 2019. Kia ora, brother. How you doing? Yeah, about the same, eh? It's been it's been a long one, <laughs> but we're, we're almost there. So I um, I'm gonna put you on speakerphone, and I'll move you uh, move my phone closer to the computer so everyone can hear you. Um, we're doing it a bit retro now with the phone since Zoom won't play ball, uh, but the stream's still running, so we're running it to YouTube and stuff. So yeah, um, I will put you on speaker and I'll introduce you to everyone. Yeah, shop. Yeah, doing awesome, man. Having a great time. Learned so much today and had some, you know, we've had some tough conversations. We've had some, some really um, inspiring conversations as well. So it's been very, very cool. I've quite enjoyed myself. You have to, you have to though, you know, with a, with a long day like such. Cool. All right. One second and I will pop you on speaker. Kia ora. do you want to just do a, do a line check? Test, test, one, two, test, test, oh. and meeting, are you present? <laughs> That's the spirit, that should work. Um, cool, so kia ora everybody, this is um, my friend Joel Rollins, he's the, um, the Opportunities Party candidate for Southland. Um, he's an absolute trooper, and, um, and I got to meet Joel... The day after I found out I was going to be a candidate, um, I found out like 10 p.m. the night before, went to a training the next day, uh, got to meet um, Joel and Dr. Ben Peters. Um, so yeah, it was um, really, really choice to get to know Joel. And now we're obviously working together closely um, in top and we're, we're South Island brothers. So 
Joel's going to come in and he's going to give us a bit of a background about who he is and um, and Joel's going to um, share with us a personal story that um, he sh shared on his Facebook the other day which I thought was really beautiful and, um, and quite touching so Joel do you want to do you want to take us away pal yeah sure bro um, to pick up a bit of the snack just a quick introduction about who I am I um, grew up in the Hibiscus Coast. I played a lot of rugby. I was really into skateboarding um, and music. I left school at the age of 15 and uh, got a car painting apprenticeship up, up in Walkwood. Um, I became a qualified car painter by the age of 21. A lot of people that I were hanging around with up there sort of started to dabble with uh, methamphetamine and um, I decided that it wasn't really for me and jumped in my car and moved down to Queenstown and came for a two-week snowboarding holiday and have never left. Um, as soon as I got here, I started car painting again, but then quickly became uh, enamored with uh, tourism and started working for a local t skydiving drop zone um, with a bunch of really, really awesome people. So, for example, I've literally, literally come from an event for our very, very good friend, Stuart Rogers, who five years ago um, basically fell, um, well, he jumped out of a plane, he was a cameraman, he had a malfunction, his parachute didn't work, he uh, tried to cut away and it didn't cut away properly, and then he um, opened up another chute. I'm not sure if this is 100% uh, correct, because it's been uh, a long time ago. He's probably, there's probably another person saying out there, oh, he had a line over and his parachute was flipping around and he was out of control. So there's lots of speculation about what actually happened. But the guy ended up falling about 140 feet, hit the ground and um, pretty much broke every bone in his body and part of his stomach had been taken out of his stomach and his intestines were everywhere and they put him in hospital and he's been recovering for about two and a half, three years. And today was the five year anniversary for that day. So we all got together and um, organized an event at the local pub and he came in and we all had lunch and dinner and had a, had a few beers and shared stories about what was happening. Um, so yeah, we had the big split anniversary today. And <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I have basically come home, jumped into a regional coordinator meeting with all the awesome people from top who work really, really hard behind the scenes. Um, shout out to all of you, you know who you are. And my parents and Laura are here, and we've just ordered some pizza and some burgers, and the kids are all happy, and oh, now I'm sitting down talking with all of you. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. How's your friend doing? Is he feeling all right? Yeah, he's he was um, really surprised to see us all there, basically. So his partner had sort of messaged us all and it was a big surprise party. And um, he turned up and everyone said, whoa, and he was just uh, pretty blown away by the whole thing. And yeah, it was just an awesome opportunity to um, get together and just celebrate how resilient and amazing human beings are, eh? I mean, like, mm. this guy literally could have died, and uh, through the grace of science, fuck yeah, science, <laughs> this man was saved. Incredible. Incredible, bro. So, um, tell us, tell us about, um, Tell us about how your mum inspired you, man, because that was that was something when I read your post the other day that um, was incredible. You know how she's your drive to to do what you do. Mm. Okay, so my mum was a pretty incredible woman. She um, had her first son when she was fifteen years old. Um, so he's eight years older than me. His name's Zane. Um, we don't have the same father. Uh, he was uh, quite an influence on me growing up, uh, to say the least. Uh, very into rotaries and things like that, motorbikes. Um, so I had a pretty good upbringing around sort of um, 
have you some cool things to muck around with? Uh, Mum was a really successful real estate agent and she was just generally interested in helping people. So um, she was a natural sort of people person in the community. She used to drive around with a number plate onto it. Um, yeah, just a real character. She did lots of skydiving, um, which is what got me into skydiving. So, for example, this drop zone that I'm just talking about, um, it's had, about, I think it's probably up to about 30 years of operation. Um, there's a family called uh, the Williams who started it. And I remember when I was about 10 years old, my mum went for a skydive there, and there was just a little uh, shed and a little runway with a, a small plane. And then, yeah, years on, I ended up, you know, working at the same drop zone. Which is just incredible. Wow. But, um, long story short, mum and dad uh, went over to Dubai to chase the uh, real estate market. Um, so we'd all left home and we were doing our own thing. So they sold everything up and moved over to Dubai to be real estate agents over there. The market crashed. And then my dad ended up getting a job being the CEO of one of the biggest property maintenance managed and companies in the world. So they started off with eight buildings, now they've got about 38. But the uh, thing is, like, these really oil wealthy Arab people um, employ people like my father that have the qualifications to, like, own and run these building, buildings on their behalf. So he's pretty much just stuck over there working really hard. And then mum was um, sort of just, couldn't really find anything to do because obviously in a Muslim culture, women are sort of not as well, um, they don't have as many rights as women do in Western cultures. Uh, so she ended up sort of just mucking around at home and going shopping a lot and drinking too much. And then um, my father and her ended up uh, getting a divorce. So she moved back over here and then she moved to Queenstown and uh, at the time I was very heavily involved with uh, music. My little brother was uh, working in the building industry and my older brother was in Australia and uh, we tried to sort of um, look after her and help her out and re-assimilate her into New Zealand after being over in Dubai for 10 years. Um, she got pretty used to living the high life um, and she just basically just started to um, self-destruct uh, with alcohol. Uh, after a few bad episodes, she checked herself into a Moana house in um, Otago and then came out and then became heavily involved with the Salvation Army in Queenstown. Uh, she rented a house in town and then started looking after young people with uh, mental health issues and um, abandonment issues and uh, addiction problems. Um, she pretty much just set it, set it home up to be a safe haven for people that were basically just not doing so well. Mm. Um, high school dropout. So, for example, you know, me and my mum had an argument when I was a kid. I was 15, I wanted to smoke some cannabis. She was like, not under my house. I was a stubborn kid. I was like, right, I'll leave home, I'll get a job and I'll do my own thing. But she already had experience on what that was like. Mm. Um, so basically there was a lot of people in town that were going through the same thing and she was just helping them reconnect back to their families. So just giving them a spot, you know, if a 15 year old kid wants to, I'm gonna move out of home for, two or three weeks or whatever, instead of them actually having to take that step to do that and commit to it, she wanted to inspire them to, that their family still cares, and although that there was a moment where that blew up, it's okay for the kid to go back. Mm. That's one thing that she really was um, hammering home to me in the last few years about what she would have liked to see different. But then, in other respects, if I didn't leave so young, um, 
some things you just can't learn from your parents. So, I mean, I'm, I can't mm. speak for everyone, but yeah. um, it was probably good for me to do that and be thrown out into the deep end because I wouldn't be who I am if, if that didn't happen. Yeah, I hear you, man. I'm very similar in that respect. Carving your own path, right? Mm. Yeah. There's just some, there's just certain things that you just can't learn from your parents when you're that young. But mm. then when you come back to it, I mean, mum used to always say to me, oh, mate, you'll never understand what um, your parents do for you until you have a kid of your own. Mm. And now that I've got kids, it's just so true. Yeah. You just, man, mum, you are right about everything. Mm. And I think that's just maturity. And, um, and you know, parents want the best for their children, and that's basically what it boils down to. So, you know, to any young people out there who are thinking, oh, mum's not letting me do this, or dad's not letting me do that, or, um, you know, just, just realise that at the end of the day, these people love you more than you can ever comprehend. And um, they're not the bad guys, and, yeah, don't... Don't push your family away. So how long did your mum do that work um, through the Sallies and, and kind of like running a halfway house? Uh, probably about two and a half, three years. But, I mean, before that, they were um, Christian missionaries in India. Um, I was heavily brought up with the church until I was 15. I ended up leaving the church as well. Um, my parents left the church when we were around 10. So they've always been into social work they've always been into helping people you know so mm. it's just something that I suppose just ended up rubbing off onto me and um yeah you know how it is it just feels good like getting results yeah making empowering yeah, right. people le leveling them up so everyone's stuck on this level it's like fuck I've been on that level I'll, I'll give you the cheat code and, and you can come up to this new level with me you know what I mean <laughs> Absolutely, man. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, so do you know many of those guys still that, that she, she was working with back then? Yeah. So obviously I know my brother. Yeah. Um, he's in, in, in the cargo prison at the moment. Yeah. We had some, uh, issues with, um, a Brazilian girl that had met and uh, my nephew's been deported to Brazil and mum passed away and then my brother's been dealing with all of that and then he kind of went off the rails a little bit. He was in Brazil, he came back to New Zealand about a week before COVID actually hit. So he didn't really understand the, gravitate, well, mm. the gravity of the situation and long story short, he sort of ended up uh, leading the police on some sort of wild goose chase of trying to find them all over the country and when they finally tracked them down they uh, ended up charging him and arresting him for breaching COVID lockdown rules oh, wow. and uh, he's been put in prison for 13 months so he's been in there since March and he's probably got six and a half months to serve wow. uh, so there's, that's my little brother yeah um how do you yeah. cope with that, man? That's a that's a unique one. Yeah, I mean, it really hurts that your little brother's just hurting and mm. going through pain. And you know, as an older brother, all you want to do is protect them. But there becomes a point where once you have your own children as well, um, you just have to start to think about letting go, even though that's impossible to do. I never. I'll never give up on my little brother, mm. ever. Um, and so all I can do is, you know, encourage all his people, all his friends and family to write him letters and just know that we're all still here. Um, also, prisoners can vote now, so <laughs> I'm plugging that angle. Yeah, fair enough, too. <laughs> and, um, yeah, man, just, just doing my best. Uh, success stories around... Uh, what happened through mum's experience um, there was definitely a few especially she was really good with younger women who were going through mm. what she had been going through so obviously me and my mum were a lot 
very similar in regards to leaving home at a young age. She had her first son when she was 15 years old and left her nest and made her did her own thing. I did the same thing. So she, there was multiple women, I'm not going to um, name their names mm-hmm. out of respect, but um, mum really, really thrived around helping younger girls um, figure out how how to just uh, basically respect themselves, mm. you know, um, was her her main, like, woman of very, very powerful and magical and amazing people, creatures, whatever you want. <laughs> They're just lovely, aren't they? <laughs> I've got to say yes, because Millie's in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that was pretty much where she really shined. And then I kind of, um, ended up living in the garage for a while and we had we recorded an album there the Two Buck Titty album actually was recorded in Mum's Lounge awesome. 500 bucks cool. Just, uh, that's, that's a good price band. we played it live um, it's on SoundCloud for free it will be for free for everyone forever but that was one thing as well Mum gave us a space to sort of do that mm. so there's some cool stuff that happened out of that um and look at how it's changed yeah, you now, so right? I'm kind of just rambling. It's been such a busy... I'm sure you you're, have been, had a way busier day than me, but... Uh, I've had a day of listening. That's all right. Yeah, and that's, that's the best skill to have, bro. You've, um, you've taken on your mum's spirit, though, and really done some awesome things with it lately, bro. Like, I know I know some of the stuff you've done to help people out in your, in your town, and... Um, people at the the campsite and stuff so you know you're taking taking those lessons and you're <clears throat> really coming into your own in that respect eh? yeah well i mean um we ended up getting a new job out of all of this so someone noticed the hard work nice i uh, be working as the migrants at Port Kaimahi for queenstown and just uh, helping migrants um assimilate into new zealand culture and figure out their visas have run out or they've lost their jobs how to encourage them to find new work Mm. or um, maybe move to a region where there's another job that they can pick up or um, if they want to stay you know figure out how they can stay and uh, the hardest part of it is going to be figuring out if um, people need tickets or flights to go home which is something you know I'm not going to have uh, that much sway in the decision making but I think there's a for example we've gone from 2.4% unemployment to 25% unemployment in Queenstown 10,500 wow. people have lost their jobs 10,500 10, yeah there's a lot of people here who are just really really struggling like this is mental health um the hub of it at the moment people mm-hmm. are just they just don't know which way is up or down they've moved over here they've spent all their savings to set themselves up and try to get visas and jobs and they want a better life in New Zealand and um, now through all this COVID stuff it, everything's just up in the air uh, no one's renewing visas no one's giving mm-hmm. out new jobs that were sort of uh, available before, and then you've got a whole bunch of. I think there's around 850,000 Kiwis wanting to move home too, mm. and um, all these government agencies are just spread too thin. They don't have enough people on the ground that are actually experienced in what's actually happening, um, and the situation is just it's just dire, man. It's so bad down here. People do not actually realise how screwed tourism is for Queenstown at the moment. Mm. I, I see a very tiny aspect of that here in my lecture with Akaroa um, being a tourist town, um, a small one, but seeing those issues there and, and hearing about what's going on in Queenstown is, is hard, man, because like, something we've talked about a lot today is, you know, because a lot of people think that depression in particular is a solely genetic thing but achieve mental illness is often uh, more often than not due to social determinants like 
you know, things like your living situation or um, being in poverty, um, you know, dealing with family abuse or sexual abuse, domestic violence, um, you know, all of these things can trigger or contribute to mental unwellness. So seeing a massive increase in, in unemployment and really no, no end in sight to that in, in Queenstown uh, must be absolutely crippling for the people down there. And it's not just Queenstown. It's Wanaka, it's Chalano, it's Matara, it's Catlins, it's, you know, Bluff. It's all these amazing, beautiful places. If, if people want to come down and explore South Island, it's not just Queenstown, honestly. Mm. Get out of Queenstown, get out of the bubble. There's way cooler places to go. So it's not just about Queenstown either. If, if, if you are coming down here, which I am seeing, you know, on my Facebook feed, a lot of people that I've gone to school with up north, who are coming down for holidays, everyone wants to come to Queenstown. It's not just Queenstown. Queenstown's not the one, guys. There's some really, really cool stuff further around. And um, I really urge you to uh, get out there and explore your own country because this is a great time to do it. Um, I'm not sure if, if we're going off into some sort of weird tourism uh, <laughs> ad, ad angle, but yeah, um, come down to the South Island and, and to see, see, what, see what, what we've got to offer, eh? It's a pretty cool place, eh, bro? I'll tell you what, I've been uh, actually dying to go to uh, the glaciers. I've never been. Um, and the Catlins. Those are pretty much two spots I really need to get my butt to. Um, I've actually done a lot of traveling around the North Island. I've done a lot around the top of the South. That's actually where I'm from. Um, so really familiar there. But when it comes down to um, both bottom ends of the South Island, there's still areas I'm yet to really experience. Awesome, bro. Well, thanks for dropping in. I'll let you go so you can enjoy your evening and I'll spend my last half an hour wrapping up the day. Um, it's been awesome touching base with you. Are you going to um, Wellington on election day? Yeah, I'll see you there, mate. Choice, man. I'll see you there. I'm looking forward to it and uh, looking forward to having a beer. It's been a while for me, so... Yeah, well, um... I can... I'll see you right there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Have a good night with the fam. All right. Take care. Take care, Joel. See you, mate. Kakite. It's my man Joel. He's um the opportunities candidate for Southland. He's he's fighting a good fight. Um he's done heaps of community work um for his community recently. Um cool. So we are literally at twenty eight minutes to go. Um I think the bags on the bags of my eyes are starting to show. Like triple bags. Thanks for sticking in uh, with me for those that have. Um, before getting involved in politics, um, well, actually, even once I got involved, doing a live stream was really challenging for like half an hour. I was like, how do I talk for half an hour? Um, so I'm very thankful to have had so many amazing guests today um, to fill that out. Um, because, yeah, it's, we're, we're at like 10 and a half hours now. So that's um, a crazy length of time. Cool. So. Breath. We're almost there. So. I just want to start at the start of the day. And actually just kind of run through some of the, the speakers we had. And um, maybe some of their core points. Um, if I can um, correctly honor them, of course. So. Um, we had a bit of an intro chat for the first half an hour today, and then at 9.30 we had uh, Matt Brown. So Matt and his wife Sierra run um, My Father's Barber, which is a barber shop here in Rickerton in Autotahi Christchurch. Um, it's a really cool place. Um, I'm actually bald, so the, I've only been there a few times, so when I go there I just get them to do my beard. Um, but I go there because it's relaxing, and they treat you good, and they treat you well, and... Um, and I get a slick beard do-over as well. Um, they also run She Is Not Your Rehab. So the core things about those, the barbershop and She Is Not Your Rehab is they're really like digging into expressing vulnerability, um, especially for Matt from a leadership position to 
encourage his workers and the people that attend their their groups and shares not your rehab to to open up and to address their their traumas in their life and the, the struggles they've been through in order to be able to heal not just for themselves but for their families as well so she is not your rehab if you um excuse me didn't pick up by the name is is paying is really highlighting that um some men use the relationships in their lives to cover the gaps and and do the healing for them um but really what they're trying to do is get men to support each other um, and be honest with themselves to to help themselves grow um and create better intergenerational relationships between their kids and their kids kids and so on and so forth so really digging in to try and make some massive change um really behind all the work they do matt's an incredible guy um i worked under him briefly uh at the hackley school after the terrorist attack um the muslim community would spend the days there um together supporting uh, all the visitors coming in and matt was basically running this whole ship just trying to get everybody um everything they needed and i just helped in the kitchen for a few days but seeing matt and sarah just like take charge and just make stuff happen was incredible you know they were getting donations from the community they were taxiing people to and from the airport they were making sure people were fed looked after all their needs were met so incredible people in our community um and super lucky to have them step in this morning so super thankful for that um after that we had uh, my friend Raffaella. so raf is a small business entrepreneur she is uh, a juggler of many things like me in a sense where she's always got another project on the go um she likes to keep really busy she um she talked to us about the trauma that she suffers being uh, migrating here from the philippines when she was younger and um how she didn't realize the impact of that at first but then later trying to deal with that um in a, in a way that really worked for her so she mentioned how she often keeps busy to run from things and uh, mentioned dreaming lots about running and now she tries to find this kind of balance and she does something that i do as well which is try to when i know i've got what i call i call it bum time for me is when it's perfectly okay for me to just lay on the couch and watch um what's it called babe uh master Sh master chef yeah yeah so i can just lay on the couch and watch master chef um or whatever and and just relax and scroll my phone and just do nothing and just enjoy doing nothing and actually be present in doing nothing um so yeah i like i like to book my time to do that and that's something that raf does as well um for small business owners she was talking about how it can be really challenging to um take a sick day like you know if you're the only person in your enterprise you work for yourself it's just you no one else and if you're having a real crap day but you absolutely reliant on that money you've got to go you know but she also talked about being in those situations where if you're feeling real depressed for a while and you can just put stuff off that there's nothing stopping you from doing that as well so she taught paid homage to kind of both of those things after ref we had amanda amanda hassan so amanda um was from christchurch originally she now lives up in the waikato um amanda talked about her experience with mis misdiagnosis um and the trauma she had faced and then the re-traumatizing herself by working um in the sex industry so she was able to give us really good insight about her mental illness and and she understands when she's like she said this morning she knows when she's getting hypomanic which is when she's about to enter a manic phase i'm um, sorry she's bipolar type 2 i think and so amanda's got really good insight and can notice those changes happening um, and she talked about how for so long it was misdiagnosed because you know when she's manic she was just achieving so much and and getting stuff done and then she would just have these dives where she would just her personality would change so much and people didn't quite understand 
uh, why. Um, she's been involved with Narcotics Anonymous for a long time um, and was misdiagnosed and, and given um, ant abuse, which is something that you take if you're um, dealing with alcoholism, because if, if you drink on ant abuse, you will be very, 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 very sick. Um, it's something I see a lot with my work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I've worked with people that take ant abuse. Um, so thanks heaps to Amanda for coming in and she was really open and honest and showed a real um, vulnerability which I think is one of the key themes of today it's about listening vulnerability and hearing from different people's perspectives um, after Amanda we had a bit of a, a break we we missed our next person so we actually um, just took questions to the floor for about an hour and a half and there were some really good questions there um, lots just about what we can ask of the DHB, what we can ask of government, what we can ask of NGOs, what what are the solutions like? And so I talked I talked a lot about our community hub. Obviously now we're nearing the end of the day, so I can't I can't really unpack that again now in sufficient timing, but uh, really even just as top as a political party and myself as a mental health spokesperson, we really back community led initiatives. Community led initiatives are generally the the first things that are actually acknowledging the issues in community and society and dealing with them and government's always the one um, you know stuck behind red tape trying desperately to catch up um, which is why government is often the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff but community is the preventative measure that we really need so we want to see community hubs where there's no there's no barriers to access where people can walk in before crisis and build community and a sense of belonging and identity with things that they need and um, that are going to help them. Then we had Sam in. Sam's from, he's on the exec for Lads Without Labels. They are a University of Canterbury, Canterbury group that's their first year running. Um, awesome young dudes. I met with them just coming out of lockdown. I was a guest speaker at... Um, at one of their events and we just kind of sat down and had a chat for a couple of hours about how you can help your friends when you're concerned about how they're feeling and what kind of conversations you can have things you can do to help them understanding that mental illness isn't just depression and anxiety there are other mental illnesses out there and recognizing when someone just needs to be listened to or they need um they need help to access specialist services um so sam was able to give us a bit of insight about his story and, and also the journey that Lads Without Labels have taken and some of the unique pressures that uni students face, um, which is good to get yet another perspective. And after talking with them earlier this week, you know, I realized that a lot of people slag off university students like, ah, oh, they don't know how tough the real world is yet. Wait till you get a job, you know, and, and kind of that really dismissive behavior which doesn't really help anybody except the person who says that feel better about themselves, you know? So it was good to like hear some of their unique experiences and the struggles that university students face. And I mean, we have had in, in Canterbury University, students jump out of the library windows or the roof, you know, and commit suicide and kill themselves, you know? Sorry, I don't like saying commit suicide. They have taken their lives at the university um so yeah it's a, it's a real issue like if people are doing that on campus you know it's something that definitely needs time and attention so it was really cool to, to see what those lads are doing um they ran project 72 this week which is like a sequel to uh something i ran with Stuart last year called project 71 which was about providing space for men to talk about their mental health and well-being um so super good to have sam on board i think we're going to have a uh good relationship bit of a um it's been a bit of a coach mentor thing at the moment but i'm really happy to see them take on some work we've done and and see where they can take that and grow their grow their club um after that we had a little bit of a break we talked about how housing is um it's quite a challenge for a lot of people with significant mental health issues um so looking at affordability but also um how tight the rental market is and some of those struggles that people have um, just getting into a property um, 
things are very challenging at the moment. That's what I do for a job on my day-to-day -day mental health and addiction support worker. And I support people into long-term sustainable housing. So that's either social housing or private rentals. The private rental market in Canterbury is dead, pretty much. It's, um, I hate to sound defeatist, but it's quite challenging at present. Um, it's really expensive. A lot of landlords don't, uh, they're, sorry, a lot of landlords are discriminating against people with mental health and addiction, um, especially with the change in the RTA. So that, that's presenting a lot of barriers in its own right. Uh, next, we had Tatiana. Um, Tatiana talked a lot, to, um, talked to us a lot about um, women's mental health for Wahine and Aotearoa. Um, she talked about the, the horrible statistics of domestic violence and sexual abuse that women face in New Zealand and the significant barriers to mental health um, services because of that. So she mentioned that um, you can get sensitive claims counselling through ACC, which is good for some people that need it. Um, I know some people have had challenges with ACC and I witness that in my day to day, but um, for those who can access it perhaps with an advocate um, that could hopefully work for them. We also talked briefly about Mates and Dates, which is an ACC funded uh, program in high schools about um, healthy relationships. Um, really happy to see that happening. It was something that I considered getting into until I saw Mates and Dates were already doing it and I thought, great, someone else is doing it. Awesome. Um, it's good to teach these kind of things to people at a young age. Um, in my mahi day to day, I see a lot of people coming out of some pretty horrible relationships and not realizing that that's not a normality. I mean, it's a normality for them in that situation, but it shouldn't be. So if we can teach younger people how to recognize healthy relationships and spot unhealthy relationships, then that's a little more preventative work because that's what we really want to see is less ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, more building supports at the top. We talked about that when we talked about... Um, you know, the river with the two villages on it and there's the village downstream that is really good at pulling people out of the water. You know, they don't catch everyone, but they catch most people. They pull them out, take off their clothes, dry them up, put them, put them with a warm blanket, give them a cup of soup, look after them, do all of that. You know, that's psychotherapy at the moment. That's the doctors and the specialist mental health service who are there really just helping people at crisis and at, at this point. But really what we need to do is kind of go up the stream and see why people are falling into the stream in the first place. Are people getting pushed in the stream? Are they falling off the bank into the stream because there's not adequate fencing? Has the bridge broken and people were stuck on the bridge and now they're falling into the stream, you know? So we actually just need to go up and look at all these core reasons because if you address those reasons, there'll be less people coming down the stream, you know? So it actually stops such an influx of our psych psychotherapy services and specialist mental health services that we don't have to just year on year fund fund extra money into those emergency services and we can put more into preventative community services so they can work in tandem with each other you know, and create a whole, a better holistic support network. After Tatiana, we talked to James Brody, who was um, probably one of my favorite chats of the day. Um, James is a musician and a bit of a writer and um, a young guy who's getting into mental health support. James has, um, neuro uh, he has neurological disorders, um, he has autism and ADHD. So James was really honest and open about his life and how those have affected him, especially in regards to his mental health and well-being. Um, he was charming and, and funny as he always is. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to have James on board. Um, it's, it's tough not knowing as a neurotypical person how hard some of those challenges must be in accessing services. You know, when you would typically be lumped into one box or the other, you know, like, do you need autism support or do you need mental health support? But when you're facing both, how do those interact and how do you really seek that? So James has just had a bit of a, um, a period recently where his mental health has been unwell and he was able to um, go through some work with his counsellor and do a bit of um, 
intensive work um, that he was talking about to, to get him back back on the right foot and he kept talking about just building his foundation and, and taking the rest of the year easy to to focus on making sure his house is in order and that's that's how he puts it so massive massive thanks to james for coming in that was a, a great chat um, and really brave to tell your story and uh, really important for for us neurotypical people to hear from that perspective as well the, the two things I wanted today to be about was being vulnerable and hearing other people's perspectives. So to be able to hear James' perspective, um, it's not one I've really heard often uh, in regards to mental health. So um, important for me and I'm sure important to a lot of people who were listening at that time. After James, we had a chat with Becca. So uh, I used to work with Becca a long, long time ago. Like I said earlier, I'm really blessed to pretty much know all of these people in my personal life somehow. Um, Becca is a registered nurse uh, and she works in inpatient mental health for over 65s. She really opened my eyes a lot actually listening to, to Becca talk about some of the issues that um, elderly people face. Um, you know, I knew like they, they get lonely and face some isolation issues, but the feeling of being a burden and, and something I didn't really even, and it seems silly that I didn't think about it, but just that they have so much time on their hands so they're more likely to to dwell on things and to get caught up in memories and and not be able to be in the present so um, it was really nice to to hear from someone who works in that um, area about some of the issues that that our elderly community face um, she suggested we just be more engaging with elderly people our elderly neighbors elderly people we see on the street um you know it's it's a good thing to to help build community as well so thanks to becca for coming in um then we had jono who's the board member for the opportunities party uh he's a gp and he runs his own practice in south auckland sadly we didn't get too long a chat with jono uh that is basically the time where we lost zoom um we thought in 2020 we were we were fine with zoom but zoom was crashing my computer um so we lost out on our chat with jono um but we got a little bit in there and he was talking about how um when when someone goes when a client goes to the, the gp a lot of the time they're, they're looking at the individualized response for that person so we were actually just getting into a good nugget about how people are referred into specialist mental health services and then we lost them um, so we spent a good 20 minutes to half an hour or so trying to save our stream after that. Um, and we came back with Andrew Kai. So Andrew Kai is the Opportunities Party candidate for Tauranga. So he talked about his um, experience growing up in his mental health journey. Um, there was a lot of similarities actually between Andrew's story and mine and I look forward to talking about those further with Andrew when we hang out in Wellington on election day. Um, Andrew lost his brother in a car crash when Andrew was 15 um, and that kind of sent Andrew on a bit of a downward spiral um, you know using cannabis quite heavily um, and the impacts that that had and um, suffering from climate anxiety as well um, recently so we talked a bit about Andrew's journey and we talked a bit about um, how we help young people with with experiences like climate anxiety or you know for for young people in Canterbury being through a lot with um, obviously the earthquakes and then the Kaikoura earthquake earthquake as well and the Port Hills fires and the mosque shooting and now our COVID lockdown and you know climate anxiety there's a whole lot of things going on for young people so yeah really talking about how we can get people young people engaged and um and feeling good uh we were then in, uh blessed to have the first of our phone calls we just popped on speakerphone we we took it back a year um it's my friend ben claridge so i've known ben maybe 13 14 years i'm not really too sure from back in the jet set days we used to play in metal bands together down there um Ben recently had a discussion with his 12-year-old son, Otis, um, about Otis's mum taking her own life um, five years ago. So 
um, Ben's ex-partner and um, and Otis's mum was also a friend of mine. Um, and so we got to hear from Ben about how he dealt with those really tough conversations that he had with his son, both when when he was seven, when his mum passed away, but then also again um, just recently, really actually now at an age and that that Ben felt right to really talk about this stuff with him. So we talked about that and the, the, the weight of actually just carrying those hypothetical conversations over and over in your head, knowing that at some point you're going to have that conversation with your son. So um, massive thanks to Ben for having quite a personal conversation with us. It was um, really touching and, um, and I look forward to, to catching up with him and Lana for a wine. Um, after that, we had Jennifer Shields. Jennifer Shields is the 2IC for Qtopia, which is a youth support service for LGBTQIA plus community here in Otutahi. Um, Jennifer is also a trans woman, so she was able to um, give us a real um, good insight into her background and the struggles that she's faced, and, and about now how herself and Qtopia support the community here in Christchurch and she's done a lot of incredible advocacy work on working groups um, to support um, counselling support through the DHB for for her community and, and because she had talked about how previously any time there was kind of any support about that stuff it was always kind of focused on the issue of gender and not the issues of what was actually causing mental distress or mental unwellness so um big ups to jennifer what an incredible win for her um, and her community and what an asset she is so i'll be linking their details as well later on for for those who wish to um, get involved with Qtopia in any ways whether um, you are in the rainbow community and you need that support or whether you would like to donate to them then um yep yeah, i'll put their details up for everybody Next, we have my friend Jake Skinner. He runs men's groups here in Christchurch where people can get involved. Um, you know, he it's quite a safe space. So really to get involved, you need to get in contact with Jake and, and get to know him first and then you get invited into the space as a peer. Um, Jake does a lot of sound healing as well and really looks at addressing some some deep traumas and, and a bit of like group and personal accountability. Um, so he's done a lot of awesome work here over the last year or two. I've um, got a lot of respect for Jake, so I'll put his details in there as well. After Jake, we touch base with Jeff Simmons, who's the Opportunities Party leader. Um, Jeff told us about his experiences with mental health, which was really good to hear because it's nice to have a role model and a leader um, show vulnerability because I think that's how we can really encourage people to talk about how they feel and to provide those spaces is by showing vulnerability in, by, by role models and people in power, so to speak, you know? So it was really nice to have that chat from Jeff and to talk, talk a little bit about how men like to fix things and, and, you know, how you can genuinely help people and 